translator's preface of a vital question or what is to be done this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by expatriate in bangor maine a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others translator's preface in the present translation the american public has an opportunity of studying what the paternal russian government regards as revolutionary literature in the russian cities it is possible by offering guarantees by depositing fifteen or twenty roubles and by paying fifteen or twenty kopecks a day to borrow Chernyshevsky's novel from the libraries it is dangerous property however and the person caught with it in his possession may make unpleasant acquaintance with the police it was published first in the columns of the sovremennik contemporary it was written with all the enthusiasm which an ardent soul could feel at the first breath of liberty blowing on a land long ground down under the heel of oppression it made an immense sensation throughout russia it is said that hundreds of young girls living in disagreeable circumstances started to follow vera pavlovna's example and hundreds of young men to live honourable lofty philosophical lives in the fashion of the types represented by lopukhov and kirsanov the tendency of the story was quite too liberal and it was hardly brought out in book form before it was ruthlessly suppressed even now however it works like a leaven and though it is dead it lives it is not a novel in the strict sense of the word the characters are all drawn from life kirsanov is understood to be a picture of the distinguished professor shevich of st petersburg and vera pavlovna still lives the extraordinary man so singularly introduced in the third part is regarded in russia as an ideal picture of the famous karakasov in the present unsettled state of the labour question this novel of the crushed russian reformer has a most vital interest it ought to come to every poor working girl like a breath from heaven like an inspiration there is no reason why vera pavlovna's industrial experiment which is no chimerical dream should not be put into practice in every town where the english language is spoken are not the signs as certain as fate that cooperation is to be the great system of the future and how reasonably it is presented in a vital question then there will be no more strikes for eight hours of work no more quarrels between employers and the employed for the employed will be themselves their own employers as regards the still more vital question upon which the book touches it is evident what the author teaches and with what a master hand the present marriage system is in many instances a failure witness the proportion of divorces to marriages in every state not only in this country but in countries where divorce is allowed and the immorality everywhere how is it to be stopped not by free love but by education and the joining of those who were meant to be joined marriage is a fact and how is it to be purified and made sacred chernyshevsky offers his theory of its practical solution not in the philosophically absurd and weak conduct of lopukhov which perhaps was unavoidable in a country like russia but in the suggestions of rakhmatov which however are only to be realized when people have attained a higher state of morality and education than is to be found except among a very few in whom the animal nature is absolutely tamed cases have been known where man and wife growing apart by natural development have again established love through what we call christian grace how many such cases are there it takes a miracle to mix oil and water this is a question which forces itself home to every man and woman what is to be done about it whatever may be thought about chernyshevsky's solution whatever may be thought about the morality of the business agreement theory whatever may be thought of the conduct of lopukhov there can be no doubt of the intense moral purpose of the author he may be mistaken but his virtue is spartan it is as heroic as though it were ideally christian such is the motif of the story but even more important than this special motif is the general theory of the equality of women the development of which makes the real greatness of the book 
such an ideal of womanhood is offered as can scarcely be found anywhere else in literature even those who possibly misunderstanding what chernyshevsky really proposes think his ideas in respect to freedom of divorce unsound and immoral cannot fail to recognize the magnificence of the prospect which he opens before the softer sex in vera pavlovna's fourth vision it ought to be read and taken to heart by every woman in the world it lies with the women themselves to determine their treatment by men and the terrible social state from which now so many unfortunate creatures both married and single are suffering might be cured as malaria is cured by the wind of the sea if this theory were only brought into practice a vital question should especially be grateful to the women of this land which is popularly supposed to be the land of freedom a few words about the author himself may be interesting nikolai gavrilovitch chernyshevsky was born in eighteen twenty nine in the city of saratov his father a man of remarkable intellect and character was an archpriest of the cathedral who was revered and loved by all who knew him the young nikolai was placed in the theological school at saratov where he devoted himself with remarkable assiduity to the study of the ancient languages and particularly of the bible at this time he was an unquestioning believer but as his mind developed he found that the atmosphere of the greek church suffocated him his old father made no opposition and sent him to the university of petersburg where he entered the philological faculty and devoted himself to the mastery of the ancient languages and especially the slavonic he was an indefatigable reader and having been introduced to the study of sociology he locked himself in his room and read everything that he could find in russian french and german on the subject and the training he had received in the seminary quickly enabled him to become a master of it after his graduation in eighteen fifty he was engaged as instructor of literature in the school of cadets but at the end of a year at the request of his mother who was very dear to him he gave up the pleasant circle of acquaintances and the delightful life in petersburg and became a teacher in the gymnasium of his native town it was a particularly trying position for a man of his liberal views but he had the satisfaction of exerting an immense influence in the circle in which he moved it is said that through his silent example and personal popularity many of the petty officials who hitherto had wasted their time and energies became interested in self-culture and what was more for russian chinovniks refused to accept bribes nikolai met a young girl belonging to this circle and fell in love with her his mother died in eighteen fifty three and shortly after with his father's blessing he married and moved to petersburg where he earned a precarious existence by various literary work finding that english translations were becoming fashionable he learned english in two months and translated a novel meantime he was working for his degree of magister his dissertation on the aesthetic relation of art to reality was so radical in its ideas that it caused his rejection he got into difficulty with the director of the corps of cadets and resigned his position as teacher and thenceforth devoted himself to literature his dissertation gave him a place in the office of the sovremenik as critical and political writer after the accession of alexander the second while the emperor was still enjoying his prestige as tsar liberator chernyshevsky through the journal energetically devoted himself to the instruction of the people in the science of political economy that involved him in a controversy with the conservative political economists of russia he was charged with revolutionary sentiments at first the government tried to buy him off by offering him the office of editor of certain government publications he accepted the position of editor of the military magazine under certain conditions but he could not hold the position from this time began a systematic effort to ruin him anonymous articles and pamphlets were attributed to him and finally he was arrested though nothing was really found against him he was kept in prison for two years a spy was introduced into his cell but the worst that he could be charged with was that he said now is the time not to think but to act but there were rumours of a polish insurrection and of risings among the serfs and such a man was dangerous therefore he was tried and condemned on forged documents the reading of the sentence took place on the morning of the twenty fifth of june eighteen sixty four 
two years and two months after his incarceration a great throng gathered in spite of the rain and just as the sentence was finished and the sabre was broken according to the custom when a well-born person is condemned and while the executioner was fastening chernyshevsky's hands to the rings on the scaffold a great bouquet fell at his feet footnote the disgraceful post as it is called stands upon the scaffold provided with rings and chains the convict's hands are thrust through the rings and he is fastened so that he cannot move chernyshevsky was sent to the mines at this time there were upwards of three thousand people imprisoned in central russia alone two years later occurred the attempt of karakozov on the emperor's life it happened on the fourth of april old style and by a singular coincidence chernyshevsky's novel was dated april fourth eighteen sixty three it was proposed to bring him back to trial as an accomplice this absurdity was not carried out but after chernyshevsky had served seven years count shuvalov the head of the police had him accepted from the usual respite afterwards he was sent to yakutsk and imprisoned under the close guard of two gendarmes and two cossacks in the words of the historian thus nikolai gavrilovich chernyshevsky was cut off from society and science the story of chernyshevsky's imprisonment is heartrending even before he was sentenced he was allowed to see his sick wife only after he had starved himself almost to death and even then only in the presence of others afterwards he was allowed to write her once a year but this privilege was taken away from him when some spies reported that there was a plot to have him rescued he was not allowed to have books or writing material and in sheer desperation he punctured a vein in his arm and wrote in letters of blood on the wall of his cell it was not strange that his mind one of the brightest minds that russia ever produced was broken by such tortures chernyshevsky at last accounts was still living under police supervision in astrakhan a reporter of an english daily interviewed him a year or two ago and found him still intelligent but a mental wreck such action is worthy of the austrian government towards dangerous silvio pellicos but is it not incredible that a country in the nineteenth century should employ such means to deprive itself of a man who would have reflected more glory on the realm of its emperors than the emperors themselves the present translation has been made with great care and it is hoped that it may be forgiven even by that school of critics which lays down the commandment thou shalt not commit translations one single change has been made which it is right to mention for the sake of those who believe that a ready-made coat must be worn without alteration even if it does not fit in one single scene kirsanov's character has been slightly mended better to suit the american ideal of man a very few russian words have been retained in cases where there was nothing corresponding to them in english such are sufficiently explained in the text chernyshevsky's style is often exceedingly awkward he sometimes strove after originality at the expense of wisdom but it cannot fail to be recognized that a vital question deserves a high rank among modern novels those who begin it will not be likely to lay it down unfinished nathan haskell dole s s skidelsky philadelphia june fourth eighteen eighty six end of translator's preface recording by expatriate in bangor maine introduction part one of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine introduction part one a fool on the morning of the twenty third of july eighteen fifty six the servants of one of the largest hotels of petersburg near the moscow railroad station were in perplexity and even partly in fear on the previous evening about nine o'clock a gentleman arrived with a valise took a room gave his passport to be registered asked for tea in a small cutlet gave orders that they should not disturb him during the evening because he was tired and wanted to sleep but that they should wake him without fail at eight o'clock in the morning because he had important business 
then he locked the door and after rattling his knife and fork and jingling the tea-things for a time nothing more was heard of him he was apparently asleep morning came at eight o'clock a servant knocked at the stranger's door the stranger did not answer the servant knocked louder very loud still the stranger did not reply apparently he was very tired the servant waited a quarter of an hour again tried to arouse him again was unsuccessful he consulted with the other servants with the butler can anything have happened to him we must break in the door no that won't do if we break in the door we must have a policeman it was decided to try once more still louder if it failed this time to send for the police they made their last endeavour they could not arouse him they sent for the police and now they are waiting to see what the result will be about ten o'clock a policeman came he himself knocked at the door ordered the servants to knock result the same as before there is nothing to be done burst in the door children they broke open the door the room was empty look under the bed but there was no one under the bed the policeman went to the table on the table lay a sheet of paper and written in large letters were these words i shall go away at eleven o'clock this evening and i shall not return you will hear of me on the litanaya bridge between two and three o'clock to-night let no one be suspected now i see the matter is plain nobody could make anything out of it said the policeman what do you mean ivan afanasyevitch asked the butler give me some tea i will tell you the policeman's narration long served as a subject for lively discussions and arguments in the hotel the story was of this sort at half-past three last night the night was cloudy dark on the centre of the litanaya bridge a fire flashed and the report of a pistol was heard the guards rushed to the spot a few people quickly collected not a person or a thing was to be seen where the pistol shot was fired it was evidently not a murder but a suicide volunteers wanted to dive in a few moments boat hooks were brought a fishing net was brought they dived they grappled they dragged the river they brought up about fifty large chips but they could neither catch nor discover the body yes and how could it be found the night was dark in those two hours the body was already far down towards the sea go find it there therefore advanced thinkers arose discrediting the former supposition maybe there was no corpse whatsoever maybe some drunken man or simply some mischievous fellow played a joke fired off a pistol and ran or perhaps the very fellow is standing here among the excited crowd yes and laughing at the trouble which he has made but the majority as is usual when a case is argued reasonably proved to be conservative and defended the former supposition what kind of a joke is that of course he put a bullet into his brain and that is the end of it the progressive party were outruled but the victorious party as usual having won the victory was itself immediately divided let us suppose that he committed suicide but what did he do it for he was drunk was the opinion of some of the conservatives a ruined spendthrift asserted others only a fool said someone and this expression only a fool was accepted by all even by those who discredited the fact of a suicide indeed whether it was a drunkard or a spendthrift committed suicide or whether some mischievous fellow did not commit suicide at all but simply played a trick at all events it was an absurd trick of a fool and this put an end to the matter that night on the bridge in the morning at the hotel of the moscow railroad it was decided that the fool did not play a joke but committed suicide but there still remained after all this story an element in regard to which even the vanquished party were in agreement it was this if it was not a trick but a case of suicide nevertheless it was a fool this conclusion so satisfactory to all parties was particularly strong from the very fact that the conservatives were victorious if he had only played a trick by firing his pistol on the bridge it would have been really doubtful whether he were a fool or a mischievous fellow but he shot himself on the bridge who shot himself on the bridge how on the bridge why on the bridge ridiculous to do it on the bridge and therefore he was doubtless a fool again a doubt arose among some of them he shot himself on the bridge but people don't go to a bridge to shoot themselves consequently he did not commit suicide 
towards evening however the servants of the hotel were summoned to the station to identify a cap pierced with a bullet hole which had been taken out of the water all recognized that it was the very same cap that the stranger had worn thus indubitably he must have shot himself and the spirit of denial and progress was entirely defeated all were agreed that it was a fool and suddenly all began to chatter on the bridge a clever dodge it was done evidently so as to save suffering for if the shot did not kill he reasoned wisely no matter how slight the wound was he would jump into the water and so drown before he knew what had happened yes on the bridge wisely done at this stage it was utterly impossible to come to any decision both a fool and wise end of introduction part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine introduction part two of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine introduction part two the first consequences of the fool's deed on that very same morning about twelve o'clock a young woman was sitting in one of the three rooms of a small dacha on the kamenov ostrov stone island she was sewing and singing in an undertone a little french song full of spirit and courage we are poor said the song but we are working people we have strong hands we are obscure but we are not dull and we want light let us learn knowledge will give us freedom let us be industrious industry will give us wealth this will go on if we live we shall see it sa ira qui vivra vera we are wrong but from our roughness tis only we ourselves who are the losers we are full of prejudices but we ourselves suffer from them this we feel let us look for happiness let us find humanity we shall be good this will go on if we live we shall see it industry without knowledge is fruitless our own happiness is impossible without the happiness of others as soon as we become enlightened we shall become rich we shall be happy we shall form one brotherhood and sisterhood this will go on if we live we shall see it let us learn and be industrious let us sing and love we shall have a heaven on earth let us be happy while we live this will go on it will soon come to pass we shall all see it donc vivons sa bien vite ira sa viendra nous tous le verrons courageous spirited was the song and its melody was joyous there were two or three melancholy notes in it but they were concealed by the generally light character of the motif they vanished in the refrain they vanished in the conclusion of the couplet at least they ought to have vanished and to have been concealed and they would have vanished had the lady been in a different frame of mind but now these few melancholy notes are made more prominent than the others she almost trembles as she perceives it she lowers her voice as she sings them and tries to sing the joyful notes louder but again her mind is drawn away from her song by her own thoughts and then again the melancholy notes become prominent evidently the young woman does not like to give in to melancholy and it is no less evident that the melancholy is loath to leave her no matter how hard she tries to drive it away but whether melancholy or joyful whether or no it becomes joyful in the spirit of the song the young woman sews very industriously she is a good seamstress a young servant girl comes into the room do you see masha how i am sewing i have almost finished the cuffs which i am getting ready to wear at your wedding ah there is much less work in them than in those which you made for me that's of no matter a bride ought to be dressed better than anybody else at her own wedding and i have brought you a letter viera pavlovna viera pavlovna's face expressed perplexity as she began to break open the letter the envelope bore the city postmark how is this isn't he in moscow she hastily unfolded the letter and grew pale her hand holding the letter fell to her side no it is not so i have scarcely had a chance to read the letter there is nothing in it at all and again she lifted her hand with the letter all this took place in two seconds 
but at the second reading her eyes looked long and immovably at the few lines of the letter and the brightness of their expression grew dimmer and dimmer the sheet fell from her nerveless hands to the work-table she hid her face in her hands she began to weep what have i done what have i done and again sobs virotchka little vera what is the matter with you are you so fond of weeping how often does this happen what is the matter with you a young man came into the room with quick but gentle careful steps read it it is on the table she was now no longer weeping but was sitting motionless scarcely breathing the young man took the letter he also grew pale and his hands trembled and long he looked at the letter short though it was not more than a score of words all told i have disturbed your peace of mind i leave these scenes don't grieve i love you both so much that i am very happy at my decision farewell the young man stood long rubbing his forehead then he began to twirl his moustache then he looked at the sleeve of his coat finally he collected his thoughts he made a step forward towards the young woman who was still sitting motionless hardly breathing as if in a lethargy he took her hand Virochka but as his hand touched hers she jumped up with a cry of terror as though she had been roused by an electric shock impetuously drew off from the young man convulsively pushed him from her go away don't touch me you are stained with blood his blood is on you i cannot bear to see you i shall go away from you i am going away leave me and she kept pushing pushing the empty air motioning him away and suddenly she tottered fell into the armchair and covered her face with her hands on me too is his blood on me thou art not to blame i alone i alone what have i done her sobs choked her Verochka said he gently and timidly my friend she drew a painful sigh and with a restrained and still trembling voice said though it was hard to say my love leave me alone for now come again in an hour then i shall be calm give me a drink of water and go he obeyed her silently he went to his room sat down at his writing-table where he had been sitting so calm so content but a quarter of an hour before he took his pen again at such moments one should have perfect control over himself i have a will and all will be well will be well and his pen without his control all the time went on writing some article or other can it be born it is horrible happiness is over my love i am ready let us talk was heard from the adjoining room the young woman's voice was low but firm my love we must part i have decided it is hard but it would be still harder for us to see each other i am his murderer i killed him for thy sake vierotchka why art thou to blame don't say a word do not justify me else i shall despise thee i i am to blame for all forgive me my love for coming to a decision which will be very hard for thee and for me my love also but i cannot do otherwise thou thyself wilt shortly see that it was best to do so this is unalterable my friend only listen i shall leave petersburg it will be easier at a distance from the places which would remind me of the past i shall sell my things on the money i get i shall be able to live some time where in tver in nizhny novgorod i don't know it is all the same i shall try to give singing lessons in all probability i shall find pupils because i shall settle in some large city if i don't find them i shall go out as governess i think that i shall not come to want but if i should i will let you know at any rate be sure to have some money ready for me you know very well that i have a good many necessities heavy expenses stingy though i am i cannot help it dost thou hear i do not refuse thy help let this be a proof to thee that thou art still dear to me and now let us part for ever go back to town right away right away it will be easier for me when i am alone to-morrow i shall not be here then come back i shall leave for moscow there i will see i will find out in which of the provincial cities i can easiest find singing pupils i forbid you coming to the station to see me off good-bye my friend give me thy hand in token of farewell i shall press it for the last time he wanted to kiss her she stopped his motion 
no it must not be it is impossible this would be an insult to him give me thy hand i press it thou seest how warmly but forgive me he did not let go her hand that is enough go she withdrew her hand he did not dare to resist forgive me she looked at him so tenderly and with firm steps she went to her room and not once did she look at him as she went it was long before he could find his hat though half a dozen times he took it into his hand he did not see that he had it he was like a drunken man at last he realized that what he was looking for was the hat in his hand he went to the entry put on his overcoat and now he is near the gate who is running after me surely masha surely something bad has happened to her he turned around vira pavlovna threw herself on his neck embraced him kissed him passionately no i could not endure it my love farewell forever she hurried back threw herself on the bed and let the tears flow which she had so long restrained end of introduction part two recording by expatriate in bangor maine introduction part three of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine introduction part three preface the motif of this story is love the principal character is a woman so far so good although the story itself may be poor enough says my lady reader this is true say i the man who reads is not limited to such weak conclusions apparently a man's thinking faculties are naturally stronger and better developed than a woman's he says very likely however woman also thinks the same thing but does not deem it necessary to say it and therefore i have no cause to argue with her the man who reads says i know that the gentleman who fired the pistol did not commit suicide i catch that word no and say you do not know it because you have not yet been told and all you know is that which is told you you don't know anything you do not even know that by the way in which i began this story i insulted i humiliated you you did not know that did you well then let me tell you yes the first pages of this story show that i have a very low opinion of the public i have used the ordinary shrewdness of novelists i began my story with effective scenes clipped out from the middle or the end of it i covered them with a fog thou o public art clever very clever and therefore thou hast neither discernment nor wit thou canst not depend upon thyself to tell by the first pages whether the story is worth reading through thy sense of smell is wretched it needs aid and there are two ways of giving aid either the name of the author or effectiveness of style i am going to relate to thee my first story thou hast not acquired a critical faculty so as to judge whether or no the author is endowed with an artistic talent yet thou hast so many writers to whom thou hast attributed an artistic talent but my name has not yet attracted thee and i am compelled to throw a hook to thee baited with an attraction of effectiveness condemn me not for it thou thyself art to blame thy simple-minded innocence compels me to lower myself to such trivial business but now thou art caught in my hands and i can prolong my story according to my own judgment without any tricks henceforth there shall be no mysteries thou shalt always be able to look forward twenty pages at a time and see the result of every situation and now at the very beginning i will tell thee the conclusion of my story the thing will end joyfully with wine cups with song there will be no theatrical effects nor embellishments the author does not like embellishments gentle public because he always thinks what a chaos there is in thy head how many many needless sufferings are caused inflicted upon every man by the wild confusion of thy ideas it is to me both pitiful and ridiculous to look at thee thou art so helpless and so piqued at the superabundant amount of absurdities in thy head i am vexed with thee because thou art so spiteful to people and yet thou thyself art the people 
why art thou so spiteful to thyself that is the reason that i am scolding thee but thou art spiteful on account of thy mental helplessness and therefore while i am scolding thee i am compelled to help thee what shall be the first step toward helping thee by touching upon the very thing that now thou art thinking about what sort of an author is this who speaks so impudently to me i will tell thee what kind of an author i am i do not possess the slightest sign of an artistic talent my skill in using good language is small but that is not of the least consequence read my dear public not without profit shalt thou read truth is a good thing truth compensates for the faults of that author who serves her and therefore i will tell thee that if i had not warned thee thou wouldst probably have the idea my story was written artistically that the author possessed a great poetic talent but i have warned thee that i have no talent and thou shalt now know that all the good qualities of this story lie in its truthfulness in the first place my kind public as i am hitting thee under the ribs i must speak out to the end although thou art fond of guessing thou hast no skill to unriddle what has been begun and now ended when i say that i have not a sign of an artistic talent and that my story has very little style don't make up thy mind that i am very much worse than all thy novelists whom thou callest great and that my novel is worse than theirs i do not say that i say that my story has less style than the works of other people who are endowed with talent but as far as merit goes thou canst boldly place my story in the same rank as the famous writings of thy favourite authors thou wilt not be mistaken if thou place it still higher there is more art in it than in theirs thou mayest rest assured of it thank me now thou art obsequious to those who despise thee bow also to me but there is in thee o public a certain class of people and at the present time a considerable number whom i esteem to thee as a whole to the majority i am impertinent and it is only about the majority that i have been speaking as regards those whom i have just mentioned i should have spoken humbly to them even with some fear but i had no need of making explanations to them i prize their opinions but i know beforehand that they are on my side the good and the strong the honest the wise ye have begun to arise among us ye are not few in number and ye are growing more and more if ye were the public i should not have to write any more if ye did not exist it would be impossible for me to write but ye are not yet the public but ye are a part of the public therefore i must and i can write end of introduction recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one section one a of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part first the life of Vera pavlovna in her parents family section one a Vera pavlovna's training was very ordinary her life up to the time when she made the acquaintance of the medical student lopukov was rather remarkable although it was not singular but in her actions even then could be seen something singular Vera pavlovna grew up in a many-storied house on gorokovaya street between sadovia street and the semyonovsky bridge at the present day this house is marked with its appropriate number but in eighteen fifty two when as yet the streets were not numbered it bore the inscription the house of the actual state councillor ivan zakharovitch storeshnikov such was the inscription but ivan zakharovitch storeshnikov had died as long ago as eighteen thirty seven and since that time the proprietor of the house was his son mikhail ivanovitch thus said the documents but the tenants knew that mikhail ivanovitch was merely the son of his father and that the real proprietor was anna petrovna the house was at that time just as it is now large with two gates and four entrances on the streets and with three yards in the rear at the principal entrance on the street there were living in eighteen fifty two just the same as at the present time eighteen sixty the kozhidika and her son 
anna petrovna is now and she was then a lady of distinction mikhail ivanovitch is now an army officer of distinction as he was then a distinguished and handsome officer i do not know who is now living on the fourth floor apartment on the right hand as you enter from one of the innumerable dirty back entrances of the first floor but in eighteen fifty two there were living there the manager of the house pavel kostyanovitch rozalsky a hardy and representative man his wife marya alexievna a lean strong tall woman with their daughter a grown-up girl the very same vira pavlovna and their little nine-year-old son fyodor pavel kostantinovitch besides having the management of the house held the office of assistant in a government department his office gave him no salary but at home he had a small income any one else would have had much more but pavel kostantinovitch as he himself said had a conscience consequently the kozidika of the house was very well satisfied with him and during the fourteen years of his management he had accumulated a capital of about ten thousand roubles of this money only three thousand and no more came out of the kozidika's pocket the balance was gained by being turned over and over and not to the detriment of the kozidika pavel kostantinovitch was in the habit of loaning money on pawn of personal property marya alexievna had also a little capital as she told her gossipy friends but in reality she had more the foundation of this capital had been laid about fifteen years before by the sale of a raccoon skin shuba a little dress and some furniture which had been left marya alexievna by her brother a chinovnik having thus obtained about one hundred and fifty roubles she also began to turn them over and over by loaning on personal security she took greater risks than her husband did and many times she got caught on the hooks some rogue borrowed five roubles from her on the security of a passport the passport happened to be a stolen one and it cost marya alexievna about fifteen roubles more to free herself from the entanglement another rascal pawned to her a gold watch for twenty roubles the watch proved to have been taken from a murdered man and marya alexievna was compelled to spend a good round sum to get out of this entanglement but if she suffered losses which her husband by his careful scrutiny of securities avoided still her capital grew with greater rapidity singular instances of her way of money-getting were detected once upon a time vira pavlovna was then small if her daughter had been older marya alexievna would not have done it but at that time why not do it the child does not understand and indeed vierotchka by herself would not have understood it but she did learn of it thanks to the cook who explained it to her with very great detail yes and the cook would not have spoken of it because the child ought not to have known about it but it happened so that her soul was impatient after marya alexievna had given her one of her tremendous thrashings because she had taken a walk with her lover by the way matryona's eye was always black and blue not because of marya alexievna's fist but her lover's and this had its good side since a cook with discoloured eyes did not get such high wages but as i started to say once upon a time there came to marya alexievna a lady of her acquaintance whom she had not seen for a long time well-dressed magnificent handsome she came and made quite a visit she stayed quietly for a week but all the time a certain civilian came to see her a handsome man who gave yurochka candy and presented her with beautiful dolls and gave her also two little books both had pictures but in one of the books were pretty little pictures animals in cities but the other little book marya alexievna took away from vierotchka after the gentleman had left so that she saw the pictures only once and that was while he was there he himself showed them to her about a week this lady stayed with them and everything was quiet in the house marya alexievna all the week did not once go to the cupboard where a decanter of vodka was standing the key of which she always kept in her own possession she did not beat matryona did not beat vierotchka and she did not scold as loud as usual then one night vierotchka was constantly disturbed by their guests terrible shrieks by the coming and going and the uproar in the house in the morning marya alexievna went to the cupboard and stood in front of it longer than usual and kept saying glory to god all went well glory to god she even called matryona to the cupboard and said to your health matryonushka you too worked hard 
but instead of doubling her fist as she used to do in old times after visiting the cupboard she kissed vierotchka and took a nap after this the house was quiet for about a week and the guest did not shriek any more but she never left the room until she went away altogether two days after she left a civilian came not the one who had been there before but another civilian who brought with him the police and gave marya alexievna a round berating but marya alexievna did not yield to him but kept asseverating i know nothing whatsoever of your business you can find out by the register who has been staying with me mrs savastyanova the wife of a merchant of Pskov, and a friend of mine has been here and that's all there is of it finally after using his whole battery of words the civilian departed and never appeared again Vierotchka witnessed this when she was eight years old and when she was nine years old matryona explained to her what the occurrence really was however such an occurrence happened only once there were various others but nothing like this when Vierotchka was a little girl of ten years old as she was going one day with her mother to the tolkuchi or pushing market and was turning from gorokovaya or bean street to sadovaya garden street she received an unexpected slap on the head with the words what are you looking at the church for you fool without crossing yourself what don't you see that all good people make the sign of the cross when vierotchka was twelve years old she began to go to school and a piano teacher came to give her lessons a german who was a drunkard but was otherwise a very good man and an excellent musician owing to his habits his turns were very low when she was fourteen years old she used to sew for the whole family the family however was not large when vierotchka was going on to her sixteenth year her mother began to scold her in this way wash your face tis like a gypsy's you could not get it clean if you tried you're such a scarecrow i'd like to know whose child you are anyhow she was always ridiculed on account of the tawny complexion of her face and she got accustomed to look upon herself as extremely ugly hitherto her mother had dressed her almost in rags but now she began to give her fine clothes and vierotchka used to go to church in her fine clothes with her mother and say to herself these fine clothes would suit somebody else but no matter how i'm dressed i'm always a gypsy a scarecrow i might as well be in calico as in silk but it is good to be pretty how i should like to be pretty when vierotchka had completed her sixteenth year she stopped taking piano lessons and no longer went to school but began to teach in the very same school afterwards her mother got other teaching for her at the end of six months her mother ceased calling her gypsy and scarecrow and dressed her even more elegantly than before and matryona this was the third matryona since the one whose eye had been black and blue but she had oftentimes a scratched cheek but not always matryona told vierotchka that her father's nochalnik was going to pay her his addresses and that still another nochalnik of great importance with an order around his neck had the same intention and in fact the little chinovniks of the department gossiped among themselves that the nechalnik of pavel konstantinovitch's office was getting very affable to the latter and the office nechalnik began to confide to his cronies that he must have a beautiful wife even though she had no dowry and he would add that pavel konstantinovitch was an excellent chinovitch how this would have ended cannot be conjectured but the nachalnik of the office deliberated a long time and while he was taking his own time another opportunity arose the koziaika's son came to the manager to say that his motoshka wanted pavel konstantinovitch to get specimens of wallpapers because she was going to repaper the rooms in which she was living hitherto all such orders had been given through the janitor certainly such a case as this could be comprehended even by people who were not as shrewd as marya alexievna and her husband the landlady's son sat for more than half an hour and did them the honour of drinking tea with them it was flower tea marya alexievna on the very next day gave her daughter a necklace which had been taken as a pledge and had never been redeemed and ordered for her daughter two new and very fine dresses one of a material costing forty roubles and the other fifty-two with rutchings and ribbons and everything in style these two garments cost one hundred and seventy-four roubles at least so marya alexievna said to her husband but vierotchka knew that the real cost was less than one hundred roubles for the purchases were made in her presence and for one hundred roubles two very fine dresses could be made 
Yerochka was delighted with the dresses was delighted with the necklace and was still more delighted because her mother at last consented to buy her shoes for her at korolyov's because the shoes that one gets at the pushing market are shapeless while those sold by korolyov fit the feet so beautifully the dresses were not bought in vain the kozyaika's son got into the habit of coming to the manager's rooms and naturally used to talk with the daughter more than with the manager or the manager's wife and naturally enough they gave him every opportunity new the mother gave her daughter plenty of advice which need not be repeated as its tenor can be easily imagined one day after dinner the mother said vierotchka put on your dress your best dress i have got up a surprise for you we are going to the opera i have got tickets for the second tier where all the general's wives go this is all for your sake little goose this is the last money that i am going to waste on you your father has spent so much on you that it has gone to his stomach how much did it cost to send you to school and to give you piano lessons you don't appreciate it in the least you ungrateful hussy no you haven't any soul in you you unfeeling minx that was all that marya alexievna said she no longer scolded her daughter and that could scarcely be called a scolding marya alexievna now only spoke to vierotchka and had never really scolded her or beaten her since the rumour about the office Nachanik had been spread abroad. End of Part 1 Section 1A Recording by Expatria in Bangor, Maine Part 1 Section 1B Of A Vital Question or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one the life of viera pavlovna in her parents family section one b they went to the opera after the first act the kozyaika's son came into their box with two of his friends one was a civilian thin and rather elegant the other was an army man fat and freer from affectation they took seats and sat down and they whispered among themselves for a time the kozyaika's son and the civilian said a good deal the officer said less marya alexievna tried to listen and though she distinguished almost every word she understood very little because they spoke in french she caught some half a dozen words in their conversation belle charmant amour bonheur but what good was it to know so few words belle charmant marya alexievna knew long ago that her gypsy was belle and charmant amour marya alexievna could see that he was over head and ears in love and when there is amour of course there must be bonheur what good did these words do the main question is will he offer himself before long Vierotchka, you ungrateful thing whispers marya alexievna to her daughter why do you turn your head away from them do you feel offended because they came in they do you honour you fool what is the french for wedding mariage eh vierotchka and what is bridegroom and bride what is to get married vierotchka told her no i did not hear any such words viera are you sure that you told me right you be careful no no you will never hear any such words from them let us go home i cannot remain here any longer what's that you say you nasty thing marya alexievna's eyes grew bloodshot let us go home do with me as you please afterwards but i will not stay here i will tell you why when we go mamenka this word was said loud enough for all to hear i have a very bad headache i cannot remain here i beg of you vierotchka stood up the young men were confused it will pass away vierotchka said marya alexievna sternly but decorously just take a walk through the corridor with mikhail ivanovitch and your headache will go off no it will not go off i feel very bad quick mamenka the gentlemen opened the door each wanted to offer vierotchka his arm but the detestable young girl refused they handed the ladies the cloaks they escorted them down to the carriage marya alexievna looked haughtily at the waiters look you serfs what cavaliers these are and this one here is going to be my son-in-law i myself will have such serfs 
and you put on airs put on airs if you dare you nasty thing you i will put them on for you but wait wait the son-in-law is saying something to her ugly but proud little girl while he is putting her into the carriage sante that must mean health savoir that's i know visite the same as in russian permettez i beg your pardon Maria alexievna's anger was not less diminished by these words but she had to take them into consideration the carriage drove away what did he say to you when he put you in he said that he would call to-morrow morning to learn about my health ain't you lying do you mean to-morrow vierotchka was silent you are a lucky girl Maria alexievna could not resist pulling her daughter's hair only once and not violently nu i will not lay my finger on you if you will only behave to-morrow sleep to-night you fool don't you dare to weep look out if i see to-morrow morning that you are pale or that your eyes are red with crying i have let things go so far i shall not stand it any longer i shall not take pity on your pretty little face if you lose this chance i will teach you how to act i ceased to weep long long ago you know it that is all right but try to be a little more sociable with him yes i will speak with him to-morrow that's all right it's time you came to your senses fear god and have pity on your mother you shameless thing ten minutes passed vierotchka don't be angry with me i scold you because i love you i want to be good to you you have no idea how dear children are to their mothers i brought you forth with pain vierotchka be grateful be obedient you yourself will see that it is for your own good behave as i tell you to-morrow he will offer himself mamenka you are mistaken he has no thought of offering himself mamenka if you had heard what they said i know if they were not talking about a wedding then it was about something else da let them try it they'll find they've got the wrong ones to deal with we'll bend him into a ram's horn i'll bring him into church in a bag i'll drag him around the chancel by the whiskers and he will be glad of it nu but i have said enough a young girl should not know about these things it's the mother's business but a young girl must be obedient she don't know anything yet now will you speak with him as i tell you yes i will speak with him and you pavel konstantinovitch what are you sitting up for like a stump tell her yourself that you as her father command her to obey her mother and that her mother will certainly teach her no evil maria alexievna you are a clever woman but this is rather a dangerous step if you don't look out you will carry things too far fool that's nice kind of talk and in vierotchka's presence too i am sorry that i let you speak the proverb tells the truth don't touch filth if you don't want to smell perfect nonsense don't argue but answer must a daughter obey her mother or not of course she must what's the use of speaking maria alexievna nu give her your orders then since you are her father vierotchka obey your mother in everything your mother is a clever woman a woman of experience she will tell you nothing bad i command you as your father the carriage stopped at the gate that's enough mamenka i told you that i would speak with him i am very tired i must rest go to bed get some sleep i shall not disturb you you must be fresh for to-morrow sleep well in fact all the time that they were climbing the stairs marya alexievna held her peace and it was a great effort for her and what an effort it was for her to be pleasant when vierotchka went directly to her room saying that she did not care for tea and what an effort it was for her to say in a pleasant voice vierotchka come to me the daughter obeyed i want to give you my blessing before you go to sleep vierotchka bend your little head the daughter bent her head may god bless you vierotchka as i bless you she repeated the blessing thrice and gave her her hand to kiss no mamenka i told you long ago that i would not kiss your hand and now let me go i tell you the truth i feel very bad ah how angry grew marya alexievna's eyes once again but she controlled herself and said gently go on go to bed it took vierotchka a long time to undress because she was lost in thought first she took off her bracelet and sat long with it in her hand then she removed her earrings and forgot herself again at last she remembered that she was very tired she could not even stand before the looking-glass but threw herself into the chair in utter weariness 
she sat there some time before it came over her that she must undress as quickly as possible but she had hardly taken off her dress and laid down before marya alexievna came into the room with a waiter whereon stood her father's great cup and a pile of toasted bread take some vierotchka here take some for health's sake i myself have brought it to you you see your mother looks out for you i was sitting and thinking how is it that vierotchka went to bed without tea while i was drinking i was full of thought and here i have brought it take it my dear daughter her mother's voice sounded strange to vierotchka but in reality it was soft and kind it had never been so before she looked at her mother with amazement marya alexievna's cheeks were fiery red and her eyes were unsteady take it i'll sit down and look at you when you have finished this cup i will bring you another the tea which was half filled with delicious thick cream awakened vierotchka's appetite she lifted herself on her elbow and began to drink how delicious tea is when it is fresh and strong and when it has lots of sugar and cream perfectly delicious it is not like tea that has been drawn once and is made with one little mean bit of sugar and tastes like medicine when i have money of my own i shall always drink such tea as this is thank you mamenka don't go to sleep yet i will bring you another one she came back with a second cup of the same excellent tea drink it and i will stay with you she said nothing for a moment and then suddenly she began to speak in a strange way sometimes so fast that her words could not be understood and the next minute drawling now vierotchka you have thanked me it's a long time since i have had any thanks from you you think that i am cross yes i am cross but it is impossible not to be cross but i am weak vierotchka after three punches of course i feel weak and think how old i am da and you have shaken my nerves vierotchka you pain me greatly and so i felt weak and my life is a hard one vierotchka i don't want you to live such a life be a rich woman think of the suffering that i have gone through vierotchka and just think of it you cannot remember how me and your father used to live before he was manager poor and oh how poor and then i was honest vierotchka now i am not honest no i shall not take a sin on my soul i will not tell you a lie i will not say that i am honest now but what's the use that time is all past vierotchka you are educated and i am not educated but i know everything that is wrote in your books there it is wrote that one ought not to treat anybody as i was treated you they say are dishonest now here's your father for example he's your father but he was not nadinka's father yet he dared then to pick my eyes to reproach me nu no, then the ill temper got the best of me and i say that judged by your standard i ain't a good woman but then i be as i be nadinka was born nu no, what of that supposing she was born who taught me to do such things how did your father get his place my sin was much less than his and they took her away from me and they put her into the foundling house and it was impossible to find out what became of her and so i never saw her and i don't know whether she is among the living or not faith how could she be alive nu no, at the present time i should not have cared so much but then it wa'n't so easy and my temper got the best of me no and so i became cross and since then everything has gone all right who got the situation for your father fool that he is i got it for him and who got him promoted to be a manager i did and so we began to live comfortably and why because i lost my temper and my good name this i know it's written in your books vierotchka and it's only the wicked and ill-tempered who get along in this world and that is gospel truth vierotchka now your father has lots of money vierotchka and it was through me that he got it and i too have money and probably more than he has all through my exertions i shall have bread enough for my last years and your father fool that he is has begun to respect me and he has to toe the line i scold him well but before he used to treat me mean and why was it i didn't deserve it then it must have been because i wasn't ill-tempered and it's written in your books vierotchka that such a life is bad and don't you suppose i know it yes and it is written in your books too that to live otherwise one must reform things but according to the present way of the world one can't live as the books say but why don't they reform the world eh vierotchka you think that i don't know what kind of rules are in your books 
i know they are fine but we shan't live to see em you and me folks is too stupid how can you make reforms with such folks let's live in the old way you too had better live in the old way what are the old rules in your books it is written the old rule bids you to rob and cheat it is true Vierotchka. well then since there is no new order live in the old way steal and cheat i give you my advice because i love you Maria alexievna was snoring she was fast asleep end of part one section one recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter two of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter two marya alexievna knew what was spoken at the theatre but she did not yet know what followed that conversation at the very time that she was getting more and more angry with her daughter and in consequence of having put too much rum in her punch was snoring in her daughter's room mikhail ivanovitch storeshnikov was taking supper in a certain fashionable restaurant with the other young gentleman who had accompanied him to the box there was still a fourth person in the company a french girl who came with the officer the supper was almost ended monsieur storeshnik storeshnikov felt greatly set up the french girl addressed him for the third time during the supper monsieur storeshnik allow me to address you so it sounds better and is much easier to speak i did not think that i was going to be the only lady in your company i hope to see adele here that would have been charming i see her so seldom adele unfortunately has quarrelled with me the officer wanted to say something but he did not speak don't believe him mademoiselle julie said the civilian he does not dare to tell you the truth he thinks that you will not like it when you find out that he has given up a french girl for a russian i don't know why it was we came here said the officer why yes serge it was because jean asked us and it has been very pleasant for me to get acquainted with monsieur storeshnikov no monsieur storeshnikov what bad taste you show i should never have said anything if you had deserted adele for that circassian beauty in whose box you were sitting but to give up a french girl for a russian i imagine her colourless eyes colourless thin hair a vacant colourless face i beg pardon not colourless but as you call it blood with cream and by that you mean a dish which only your eskimo can take into their mouths jean let that sinner against grace have the ash-tray let him scatter ashes on his wicked head you have spoken so much nonsense julie that it ought to be your head not his that should be sown with ashes said the officer it happens that the very girl whom you call the circassian was the russian you are making sport of me a genuine russian said the officer impossible you are quite wrong my dear julie if you think that our nation has only got one type of beauty like your own you have a great many blondes but we julie are a mixture of nations we have the white-haired like the finns yes yes the finns said the french girl and those with black hair who are even darker than italians tartars and mongolians yes yes tartars and mongolians i know about them said the french girl again and all of them have given us a share of their blood we have blondes whom you may despise but they are only a local type a very common type to be sure but not predominating that's strange but she is lovely why doesn't she go on the stage by the way gentlemen i only speak of what i have seen there remains a very important question her foot your great poet karasen i have been told said that in all russia there could not be found five pair of small straight little feet julie it was not karasen who said that and you had better call him karamzin karamzin was a historian and he wasn't a russian but a tartar now here's a new proof of the variety of our types it was pushkin who spoke about the little feet his poetry was very good in its day but now it has lost a large part of its value by the way the eskimo live in america and our savages who drink the blood of elans are called samoyeds thank you serge 
karamzin historian pushkin i know eskimo in america the russians are samoyeds yes samoyeds that is such a lovely word now i shall remember it now gentlemen i shall ask serge to tell me all this again when we are alone it is a very profitable subject for conversation besides science is my hobby i was born to be a madame stael gentleman but this is an episode entirely out of the track let us return to the question her foot if you will allow me to call upon you to-morrow mademoiselle julie i shall have the honour of bringing you her shoe bring it i will try it on that appeals to my curiosity storeshnikov was enraptured why because he had got into jean's wake and jean was in serge's wake and julie she was one of the most prominent of the french ladies among all the french ladies of serge's society it was an honour a great honour i don't care anything about her foot said jean but i as a practical man am interested in something beside her foot i want to see if she has a pretty figure her figure is very pretty said storeshnikov who was encouraged by the praise given his taste and who thought at the same time that he could give julie a compliment he had not dared to do so before her figure is charming although to praise another woman's figure here is certainly blasphemy ha ha this gentleman wants to make a compliment on my figure i am neither a hypocrite nor a liar monsieur storeshnik and i don't praise myself nor can i endure that others should flatter what is bad in me thank god i have something for which i can honestly be praised but my figure ha <laughs> ha jean you can tell him whether my figure is worth praising jean why don't you speak your hand monsieur storeshnik she seized his hand see here now you will know that i am not all that i seem i have to wear a padded dress just as i wear a petticoat not because i like it no in my opinion it would be better without such hypocrisy but because it is the fashion but a woman who has lived as i have and how have i lived monsieur storeshnik i am a saint now compared to what i have been such a woman cannot preserve her beauty and suddenly she burst into tears my beauty my beauty my lost innocence oh god why was i born you lie gentlemen she cried jumping up and pounding with her fist on the table you are slanderers you are low fellows she is not his mistress he is trying to buy her i saw how she turned away from him how she burned with indignation and with scorn it was contemptible yes said the civilian lazily stretching himself you have boasted a little prematurely storeshnikov you have not caught your fish yet and yet you said that she was yours and that you had broken with adele so as to deceive us the better yes you gave us a very good description but you described to us what you had not seen yet however it's no matter a week sooner or later makes no difference you must not be discouraged about drawing on your imagination for stories you will get on even better than you thought i have been there you will be satisfied storeshnikov was beside himself with anger no mademoiselle julie you are mistaken i venture to assure you that you are mistaken in your conclusion forgive me for daring to contradict you but she is my mistress that was an ordinary lover's quarrel because she was jealous she saw that i was sitting in mademoiselle mathilde's box during the first act that's all that's a lie my dear that's a lie said jean yawning i don't tell lies i don't tell lies prove it i am a positive man and i don't believe anything without proofs what proofs can i bring you now here you are backing out and you as good as confess that you lie what proofs as if it would be hard to show them now then here's for you to-morrow we will meet here again at supper mademoiselle julie will be good enough to bring her serge i shall bring my dear little berthe you bring her if you bring her i am the loser the supper shall be at my expense if you don't bring her you should be driven out from our circle in disgrace jean touch the bell the servant appeared simon be good enough to get supper for six people to-morrow one just like the one that i had when berthe and i were married at your house do you remember before christmas and have it in this very room how could i ever forget such a supper monsieur it shall be done the servant went out you contemptible miserable men two years i lived as a bad woman in a house with prostitutes and thieves and never once did i meet three such low people as you are mon dieu what sort of people do i have to live with in society why must i suffer such disgrace o oh god she fell on her knees o oh god i am a feeble woman 
i could bear hunger but in paris the winters were so cold the cold was so bitter and the temptations were so overpowering i wanted to live i wanted to love oh god that was no sin why art thou punishing me so deliver me from this band lift me out of this mire give me strength to become even a bad woman again in paris i ask of thee nothing else i deserve nothing else only deliver me from these men from these contemptible men she jumped up and ran to the officer serge are you too like the men no you are better better repeated the officer phlegmatically isn't this thing contemptible it is julie and you don't protest you allow it you agree to it you share in it sit on my knee my dear julie he began to caress her and she grew calmer how i love you at such moments you are a glorious woman now why don't you consent to go through the marriage ceremony with me how many times have i asked you to give your consent marriage the bridal conventionality never i have forbidden you to mention such absurdities don't get me angry but serge dear serge forbid him he is afraid of you save her julie be calmer this is impossible if not he then somebody else what difference does it make just look here jean is already thinking of getting her away from him and there are thousands of such jeans as you know well it is impossible to save the daughter when her mother is anxious to sell her you can't knock down a wall with your forehead we russians say we are a clever people julie you see how calmly i live accepting this russian principle of ours never you are a slave the french woman is free the french woman struggles may fall but still she struggles i will not allow this who is she where does she live do you know i know let us go to her i am going to warn her what at one o'clock at night no let us go home au revoir jean au revoir storeshnikov of course you will not expect julie and me at your supper to-morrow you see how excited she is and i also to tell you the truth don't like this business at all of course my opinion has nothing to do with you au revoir what a crazy frenchwoman said the civilian stretching himself and yawning as the officer and julia left a very piquant woman but this is too much it is very pleasant to see a nice little woman get warmed up but i would not live with her four hours let alone four years of course storeshnikov our supper will not be destroyed by her caprice i shall bring paul and mathilde in their place and now it's time to go home i have got to call on bert and then i would go and see the little lutchen who is mighty pretty end of part one chapter two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter three of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter three nu viera all right your eyes showed you haven't cried evidently you saw that your mother tells the truth you always used to be an off horse vierotchka made an impatient gesture nu it's all right i shan't say anything more don't get stirred up and last night i fell asleep in your room perhaps i talked too long last night i was not myself don't heed what i said when i was a little tipsy do you hear don't heed it vierotchka once more saw the ordinary marya alexievna the evening before it seemed to her that underneath her animal outside she saw the features of a human being but now she seemed to be a mere animal and nothing else vierotchka made an effort to overcome her repugnance but she could not hitherto she had only despised her mother yesterday evening it seemed to her that she was ceasing to despise her and beginning to feel only pity for her but now again she felt the old repugnance but there remained also the pity for her dress yourself Yurochka. he'll likely get here before long she very carefully examined her daughter's wardrobe if you only behave yourself i will make you a present of a pair of earrings with large emeralds they are old-fashioned but if they are made over they'll make a handsome little brooch they were left in pawn for one hundred and fifty roubles making with interest two hundred and fifty but they are worth more than four hundred do you hear i am going to give them to you storeshnikov appeared 
last evening he was quite at a loss to know how to accomplish the task which he had undertaken he walked from the restaurant to his house thinking all the time but when he reached home he was calm he made up his mind as he walked and now he was satisfied with himself he asked about vira pavlovna's health i am well he said that he was very glad and the conversation turned on the necessity of making the most of health of course it is necessary and according to marya alexievna's opinion one ought to make the most of youth also he perfectly agreed with that sentiment and thought that it would be well to take advantage of the fine weather to enjoy a ride out of town it is a frosty day and the road is elegant with whom do you intend to go only three of us you marya alexievna vira pavlovna and myself in this case marya alexievna is perfectly agreed but now she is going to prepare some coffee and lunch and vierotchka will sing something vierotchka will you sing something she adds in a tone that leaves no room for refusal i will sing vierotchka sat down at the piano and sang a song called troika the three span for at this time pushkin's poem was set to music to marya alexievna listening at the door this song was very good the young girl was looking at the officer that little vierka if she only wants can be pretty shrewd the minx soon vierotchka stopped this was right marya alexievna had advised her sing a little while and then begin to talk now vierotchka is speaking but to marya alexievna's mortification she is speaking in french what a fool i was i forgot to tell her to speak in russian but viera is speaking calmly she is smiling nu evidently everything is going well only what made him open his eyes so wide but then he is a fool a genuine fool and all that he can do is to blink his eyes but this is just the kind we want now she is giving him her hand Vierka is smart i praise her monsieur storeshnikov i must speak seriously with you last night you took a box so that you might represent me to your friends as your mistress i am not going to tell you that it was dishonourable if you had been capable of comprehending it you would not have done it but i warn you if you ever dare to speak to me in the theatre or on the street or anywhere else i shall slap your face my mother will torture me here vierotchka smiled let come what may it is all the same this evening you receive a note from my mother to the effect that our sleigh ride is given up because i am not well he stood up and blinked his eyes just as marya alexievna had noticed i speak to you as to a man who has not a spark of honour in him but maybe you are not absolutely ruined if it is so i beg of you cease calling upon us then i will forgive your slander if you consent give me your hand she offered him her hand he took it hardly knowing what he was doing i thank you now go say that you must hurry to get the horses ready for the drive again he blinked his eyes she turned to the notes and began to finish singing the troika it was a pity that there were no good judges of singing there it was charming to hear her indeed it was rare that one heard so much expression put into music really there was too much feeling it was not artistic in a moment marya alexievna came in and the cook followed her with a waiter containing coffee and lunch mikhail ivanovitch instead of taking the lunch retreated to the door where are you going mikhail ivanovitch i am in a hurry marya alexievna to give orders about the horses da you have ample time mikhail ivanovitch but mikhail ivanovitch was already behind the door marya alexievna dashed from the reception room into the parlour with uplifted fists what have you done you confounded vierka ha but the confounded vierka was no longer in the parlour her mother hastened after her to her room but the door of yurochka's room was locked the mother pressed with all the strength of her body to break open the door but the door did not yield and vierka said if you try to break open the door i shall open the window and call for help i will not give myself into your hands alive marya alexievna's anger lasted long but she did not break open the door finally she got tired of shouting then vierotchka said mamenka hitherto i simply have not loved you but since last night i pity you you have had much sorrow and that has made you what you are hitherto i have not talked with you but now i want to talk but only when you have got over being angry we will talk kindly as we never have before 
of course marya alexyevna did not take these words much to heart but weary nerves demand rest and marya alexyevna began to reason whether it would not be better to compromise with her daughter before she the miserable creature gets entirely out of her hands besides without her nothing can be done we can't marry her to mishka the fool unless she's here to marry him can we besides i don't know yet what she has told him they squeezed each other's hands what does that signify and thus the weary marya alexyevna was reasoning between ferocity and cunningness when suddenly the bell rang it was julie and serge end of part one chapter three recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter four of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one the life of vira pavlovna in her parents family chapter four serge does her mother speak french were julie's first words when she awoke i don't know so you have not put that idea out of your head yet no i have not and after taking into consideration all that they had seen in the theatre they decided that in all probability this young girl's mother did not speak french so julie took serge along with her as interpreter at all events such was his fate and he would have had to go even if Yerochka's mother had been the cardinal mezzofanti and he did not complain of his fate but went everywhere with julie as though he were made of honour to some heroine julie got up late but on the way she stopped at wickman's and then though it was not on her way she went to four other stores because she needed certain articles it was in this way that mikhail ivanovitch had ample time to explain himself marya alexyevna had ample time to get enraged and to get calmed down before julie and serge came from the litanaya bridge to the gorokovaya street but what excuse have we for coming here fie what miserable stairs i never saw such even in paris it's all the same make up an excuse her mother keeps a sort of a pawn shop take off your brooch hold on here's a better one she gives piano lessons let's say that you have a niece matriona for the first time in her life was ashamed of her smashed cheekbone when she saw serge's uniform and especially julie's magnificence she had never before met face to face with a woman of such importance marya alexyevna was in such a state of wonder and indescribable surprise when matriona announced that colonel n n with his spouse had done themselves the honour of calling especially those words with his spouse the gossip that permeated into the circle where marya alexyevna moved affected exclusively the class of civilians but the gossip about genuine aristocrats died away in the air before it reached halfway down to marya alexyevna therefore she accepted in the full legal interpretation of the thought the words husband and wife as serge and julie called each other in accordance with the parisian fashion marya alexyevna quickly composed herself and hastened down to meet them serge said that he was very glad of the chance that he had had the evening before etc that his wife had a niece etc that his wife did not speak russian and therefore he was interpreter yes i may be grateful to my creator said marya alexyevna Yerochka has a great talent for teaching the piano and i should count it a great piece of luck if she were to visit such a house as yours only my little teacher is not very well just now marya alexyevna spoke particularly loud so that vierotchka might hear and understand the approaching truce she herself in her admiration as it were devoured her visitors with her eyes i don't know whether she's got the strength to come out and give you a proof of her skill on the piano vierotchka my love can you come out or not only some strangers there won't be a scene why won't you come out vierotchka opened the door glanced at serge and turned crimson with shame and anger even unobservant eyes could not have failed to take notice of this and julie's eyes were sharper if that were possible than even marya alexyevna's the frenchwoman began without beating around the bush my dear child 
you are surprised and indignant to see a man in whose presence you were so much offended last night and who probably himself gave you some reason for offence my husband is thoughtless but for all that he is far better than the rest of the lazy young fellows please forgive him for my sake i came to you with good intentions the lessons for my niece was only a pretence but it is necessary to keep it up for a while please play us something something quite short then you and i will go to your room and will talk the matter over listen to me my child can this be the same julie who is so well known among the aristocratic young bloods of petersburg can this be the same julie who plays such tricks as make even devil-may-care young fellows blush no it is a princess to whose ears a rough word never came vierotchka sat down to show her skill on the piano julie stood behind her serge engaged himself in conversation with marya alexievna with the view of finding out what the relationship was between her and storeshnikov in the course of a few minutes julie stopped vierotchka put her arm around her waist walked with her up and down the parlor then went with her to her room serge explained that his wife was satisfied with vierotchka's playing but wanted to speak with her because it was necessary also to know the teacher's character etc and he continued to talk with marya alexievna about storeshnikov all this was excellent but marya alexievna found reason for greater suspicion and vigilance my dear child said julie as she entered vierotchka's room your mother is a very bad woman but in order that i may know what to say to you i beg of you to tell me how and why you went to the theatre last night i know all about it already from my husband but from your story i shall learn your character don't be afraid of me and when she had heard vierotchka's account she continued yes one can speak plainly with you you have character and in very careful delicate terms she told the story of the wager that had been made the evening before whereupon vierotchka told her about the invitation to go to ride now do you suppose he wanted to deceive your mother or were they both in a conspiracy against you vierotchka began to aver with much warmth that her mother was not such a bad woman as to be in a conspiracy it won't take me long to find out said julie you stay here you are not needed there julie returned to the parlor serge he has invited this woman and her daughter to take a ride this evening tell her about last night's supper your daughter is agreeable to my wife now it is necessary to see about her terms in all probability we shall not have any trouble on that score but allow me to finish our talk about our mutual friend you give him very high praise but are you aware of the way that he talks about his relationship to your family for example do you know why he invited us last evening to your box in marya alexievna's eyes there gleamed instead of a look of anxious inquiry the thought then it is so i am not a gossip she replied with dissatisfaction i myself do not carry tattle around and i don't listen much to the tattle of others this was said not without sarcasm in spite of all her admiration of her visitor there are always a good many little things that young people talk about among themselves there is no need of bothering with them very good well then do you call this also gossip he began to tell the story of the supper marya alexievna did not let him finish as soon as he said the first word about the wager she leaped to her feet and cried out in wrath entirely forgetting the importance of her guests now what sort of tricks are these ah the villain ah the murderer now i see why he invited us to go a-driving he wanted to get me out of the way so as to ruin a defenceless young girl ah the beastly man and so she went on then she began to thank her guests for salvation of her life and her daughter's honour and so that was what you were driving at batyushka i suspicioned it at the very first that you did not come without some good reason lessons is lessons but i saw that you had some other game but i did not think that was the reason i thought that you had some other bride for him that you wanted to take him away from us i have been unjust to you poor sinner that i am be generous and forgive me you have done me such a great favour that i shall never forget it as long as i live and thus she went on pouring out curses blessings excuses in a disorderly torrent julie did not listen long to this endless speech the meaning of which was plain to her from the tone of her voice and from her gestures while marya alexievna was speaking the very first words the frenchwoman got up and returned to vierotchka's room 
no your mother was not his accomplice and now she is very indignant with him but i know such people as your mother very well they can't long hold out in their dislike of people who have money she will soon be on the lookout for a husband for you again and what will be the end of it all god knows at all events it will be very hard for you at first she will leave you in peace but i tell you it will not last long what are you going to do now have you any relatives in petersburg no that is too bad have you a lover vierotchka did not know how to answer this she only opened her eyes in wonder forgive me forgive me i might have known that but so much the worse of course then you have no one to protect you what can be done now listen i am not what i seem to you at first i am not his wife we only live together i am known in all petersburg as a very bad woman but i am an honest woman to visit me would cost you your reputation it is sufficiently risky for you that i have called at your rooms only once and to call upon you a second time would be sure ruin meantime it is necessary for me to see you again and probably more than once that is if you have any confidence in me yes then what time can i see you to-morrow about twelve o'clock said vierotchka this was rather too early for julie but all right she would give orders to be called at that time and she would meet vierotchka at the gostinui dvor opposite the nevsky prospect this place is not so much frequented as the others it will be easier to find each other and no one knows julie there yes and here is another lucky thought give me a piece of paper i'll write a note to that contemptible fellow and so get him into my power julie wrote monsieur storeshnikov you are now in all probability in great embarrassment if you wish to get out of it come to my house at seven o'clock monsieur letellier now good-bye julie offered her hand but vierotchka threw herself on her neck kissed her wept and kissed her again and julie was still less able to bear it she shed tears still more abundantly than vierotchka the feeling that she was doing a noble deed gave her such happiness and pride that it was very touching she went into ecstasies she kept on speaking always with tears and kisses and finally she ended with an exclamation my friend my dear child may god spare you from knowing what i am feeling now when for the first time in many years pure lips touch mine die but don't give a kiss without love end of part one chapter four recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter five of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one the life of vera pavlovna in her parents family chapter five doreshnikov's plan was not so murderous as marya alexyevna supposed she in her own style put it in a too brutal form but the spirit of the thing she interpreted aright Storeshnikov's idea was to bring the two ladies a little later in the evening to the restaurant where the supper was going to be of course they would be hungry and cold and it would be necessary for them to get warm and have a cup of tea he would have a little opium put into marya alexyevna's teacup or wine glass vierotchka would be frightened to see her mother lose consciousness he would take vierotchka into the room where the supper was going on and then his bet would be won what the final result would be he would leave to chance maybe vierotchka in her perplexity would not understand the matter and would agree to remain in the strange company but even if she remained but a little while it would not make any difference it would be excused because she had only just entered upon that adventurous course of life and naturally felt a bit of awkwardness at first then afterwards he would buy marya alexyevna off with a little money after which he would have nothing more to do with her but now what was he to do he cursed his boastfulness before his friends his faint-heartedness when met by vierotchka's unexpected and abrupt resistance he wished that the earth would open and swallow him now what was he to do while his mind was in such disorder and despair a letter from julie brought healing balm to his wound a ray of hope shone into the impenetrable darkness a solid road opened through the quagmire under the feet of the sinking man oh she can 
She is the cleverest woman. She can bring anything about. She is the noblest of women. At ten minutes before seven, he was standing before her door. She is waiting for you and gave orders to have you admitted. How majestically she is sitting. How stern she looks. She scarcely bends her head in reply to his bow. I am very glad to see you. Take a seat. Not a muscle moved in her face. It will be a good scolding, I suppose. No matter, scold away. Only save me. Monsieur Storeshnik, she began in a cold, slow way, you know my opinion of the matter in regard to which we have come together now, and which, of course, I see no need of characterizing again. I have seen that young lady whom you were talking about last night. I have heard about your visit to them today. Consequently, I know all about everything, and I am very glad, because it saves me from asking you any questions. Your position is perfectly clear, not only to you, but to me. Lord, I'd rather she would scold, thought the victim. It seems to me, she went on, that you cannot get out of it without somebody's help, and that you cannot expect anybody to help you successfully but me. If you have anything to say in your defense, I will listen. And so, after a pause, you, as well as I suppose, that no one else is able to help you. Just listen to what I am able and willing to do for you. If my supposititious help is going to be of any use to you, I will tell you the terms on which I agree to accomplish it. And in the long, long style of an official explanation, she told him that she could send a letter to Jean in which she would say that after last night's caprice, she had thought things over, that she wanted to take part in the supper, but that she was engaged for this evening, and therefore she asked Jean to persuade Storeshnikov to postpone the supper till some time that should be agreed upon with Jean. She read the letter over. The letter expressed a conviction that Storeshnikov would win the wager, and that it would be disagreeable to him to put off his triumph. Would this letter be sufficient? Indeed it would. In such a case, continued Julie, in the very same style of official notes, she would send off the letter on two conditions. You can accept them or not. If you accept them, I will send off the letter. If you refuse them, I shall burn the letter. And all this was said in the everlasting manner that seemed to draw out the soul of the rescued man at last came the conditions there were two first that you cease persecuting the young person of whom we were speaking second that you cease mentioning her name in your conversations is that all the rescued man wonders i thought she would ask the deuce knows what and i should have been willing to grant anything he agrees and his face shows a triumph at the easiness of her conditions but julie is not in the least softened and she keeps on with her explanations the first is necessary for her sake the second also for her sake but still more for yours i shall postpone the supper for a week and then for another week and then the thing will be forgotten but you must understand that the others will forget about it only unless you do not any longer say a single word about the young lady among whom etc and at the same time she keeps on explaining and assuring him that the letter will be received by jean in ample time i have made inquiries and he will dine with bert etc he will call on you as soon as he has finished his cigar etc and this too was said as before then she said and so the letter will be sent and i am very glad please read it over i have no confidence in others and i do not expect others to have confidence in me you have read it over please seal it yourself here is an envelope i will ring the bell pauline have the goodness to post this letter etc pauline i have not seen monsieur storeshnikov to-day do you understand he has not been here this tormenting salvation lasted about an hour finally the letter was sent off and the rescued man breathes more freely but the perspiration runs down his face and julie continues in a quarter of an hour you must hurry home so that jean may find you there but this quarter of an hour is still at your disposal and i am going to avail myself of it to say a few words to you you will follow or you will not follow the advice which they contain but you will at least think it over seriously i shall not say a word about the obligations that an honourable man feels toward a young girl whose good name he has compromised i know too well our aristocratic young men to expect any advantage from going over this side of the question but i find that if you should marry the young person about whom we have been speaking it would be a good thing for you as a straightforward woman i shall lay down before you explicitly the foundations of my belief though some of them may be ticklish in your ears 
however your least word will be sufficient for me to stop you are a man of weak character and you run the risk of falling into the hands of some bad woman who will torment you and make you her mere plaything but she is kind and noble and therefore she would not treat you shabbily to marry her notwithstanding the lowness of her birth compared to yours notwithstanding her poverty would help you along in your career she when once introduced into the great world with all the money that you have with all her beauty good sense and strength of character would occupy a brilliant place the advantage of this can be understood by every husband but aside from these advantages which every other husband would receive from such a wife you through the peculiarities of your nature more than any one else need an assistant i will speak still plainer you need someone to lead you every word that i have spoken has been weighed every word has been based on my observation of her i do not ask you to believe me but i recommend that you think over my advice i doubt very much whether she would accept your offer but if she should accept it it would be a good thing for you i shall not detain you any longer now you must hurry home end of part one chapter five recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter six of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one the life of vira pavlovna in her parents family chapter six Maria alexievna of course did not even complain of yeroshka's refusal of the sleigh ride after she found out that that mishka durak was not at all such a durak as she thought and that he had almost got ahead of her yeroshka was left in peace and on the next morning without meeting with any hindrance she started for the gostinui dvor it is freezing here i do not like cold weather said julie we must go somewhere else but where wait i'll be right back from this shop she bought a thick veil for vierotchka put it on then you can go with me without any fear but don't lift your veil until we are alone pauline is very modest but i don't want that even she should see you i am too careful of you my child in fact she herself wore her maid's cloak and bonnet and a thick veil when julie got warm she listened to all the news that vierotchka had to tell her then she told her in turn about her interview with storeshnikov now my dear child there is no doubt that he will make you an offer these young men are always getting over ears in love when their flirting meets no response do you know my dear child that you have treated him quite like an experienced coquette coquetry i am speaking about genuine coquetry not about foolish stupid imitations of it for they are disgusting like any other imitation of a good thing coquetry i say means sense and tact in the way that a woman treats a man therefore absolutely innocent girls act without meaning it exactly like experienced coquettes if only they have sense and tact maybe my motives will partly influence him but the main thing is your resistance however he will make you an offer and i advise you to accept it you who told me only yesterday that it was better to die than give a kiss without love my dear child that was said in excitement in moments of excitement it is true and good but life is prose and calculation no never never he is contemptible this is abominable i shall not lower myself let him devour me i'd sooner jump out of the window sooner go out and beg for bread but to give my hand to a contemptible low man no it is better to die julie began to explain the advantages you will get rid of your mother's persecutions you stand in danger of being sold he is not bad but only a little off a narrow man who is not bad is better than any other husband for a woman of strong character you would be mistress of the house she depicted the position of actresses dancers who do not love their husbands but reign over them this is the freest situation in the world for a woman except that situation of independence and power which society might grant to a legally married woman that is it might give her as much independence as an actress has towards the admirer of an actress she spoke much vierotchka spoke much they both got excited vierotchka finally became pathetic 
you call me fanciful you ask me what i want from life i want neither to reign nor to be subjected i do not want to deceive or to make pretence i do not want to regard the opinions of others to strive for what other people recommend to me without i feel the need of it i am not used to riches for myself they are not necessary why then should i seek them only because others think that they are pleasant for all people and consequently must be pleasant for me i have never gone into society i have not known what it was to shine and as yet i have no desire to do so why then should i sacrifice anything for a brilliant situation only because according to the ideas of others it is pleasant for what i do not feel the slightest need of i am not going to sacrifice i do not say myself but even my slightest caprice i want to be independent and live in my own way i am prepared for whatever is needful for myself whatever is not needful i do not want what will be necessary for me i do not know you say i am young and inexperienced that i shall change as time goes on well so be it when the time comes i shall change but now i do not want do not want do not want anything that i do not want but what do i want now you ask well i am sure i do not know do i want to love a man i do not know it was only yesterday morning i did not know when i got up that i was going to want to love you and several hours before i began to love you i did not know that i could love any one and i did not know how i should feel when i felt love for you and so now i do not know how i should feel to love a man i only know that i do not want to be anybody's slave i want to be free i do not want to be under obligations to any one so that any one should dare to say to me you must do something for me i want to do only what i have it in my heart to do and let others do the same i do not want to ask anything of anybody i do not want to curtail anybody's freedom i want to be free myself julie listened and was lost in thought and her face grew red but then she could not help her face growing red when she sat near a fire she leaped to her feet and said in a broken voice well well my child i myself should have felt that way if i had not been ruined but i am not corrupted by those deeds that are generally thought to ruin a woman not by what happened to me in the past what i endured and suffered not because of those things was my body given over to insult but because i was used to idleness to luxury because i am not strong enough to live by myself because i need other people because i try to please therefore i am doing what i do not like to do and this is wretchedness don't listen to what i said my child i have been trying to ruin you this is torment i cannot teach the pure without polluting it avoid me my child i am a bad woman don't think about society they are all bad there worse than i am where idleness is there is abomination where grandeur is there is abomination run run end of part one chapter six recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter seven of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one the life of vera pavlovna in her parents family chapter seven doreshnikov kept thinking more and more frequently well now suppose i should take and marry her what happened to him was a very common thing not only with people of weak character of his stamp but also not seldom with people of more independent character in the histories of the nations such cases as his fill the volumes of hume and gibbon ranke and thierry men crowd only to one side simply because they do not hear the words now strive brethren to take the other side and if by chance they hear and turn to the other side of the circle then they go to crowding just as bad on the other side storeshnikov had heard and seen that rich young men were in the habit of taking poor and pretty young girls as mistresses well and so he tried to make vierotchka his mistress no other word had entered his head he heard the other word you might marry her well now he begins to think about the word wife just as before he thought about the word mistress this is a universal characteristic and storeshnikov illustrates very clearly in his own case nine-tenths of the motives in the history of the human race but historians and psychologists say that in every special fact 
the universal cause is individualized according to their expression by local temporary national and personal elements although they that is these elements are important for example all spoons albeit they are spoons yet whoever gobbles soup or she with the spoon in his hand must examine that special spoon therefore let us examine storeshnikov the principal thing that julie had said as though she had been reading all the russian novels that treat of such things was this resistance strengthens desire the thought about vierotchka took possession of storeshnikov after the theatre with more power than ever before after exhibiting to his friends the mistress of his fancy it seemed to him that she was much more beautiful than he had imagined beauty just like intellect or any other valuable thing is treasured by the majority of people exactly according as it is reckoned by the general opinion everybody sees that a handsome face is handsome but to what degree it is handsome how can that be expressed unless its rank takes a diploma Birochka, sitting in the gallery or in the back row of the theatre would not have been noticed but when she appeared in a box in the second tier a good many opera glasses were directed towards her and how many encomiums of her beauty did not storeshnikov hear when after seeing her to her carriage he returned to the foyer and serge oh what a refined taste he has and julie well when such good fortune is hatched there is no need of making a choice as to the way of possessing it his self-love was stirred at the same time as his passion but it was touched also on the other side it is hardly likely that she will accept you what not accept him with such a uniform and such an estate no you are mistaken frenchwoman she will take it of course she will she will there was still another reason of the same stamp storeshnikov's mother of course would oppose his choice his mother is a representative of the world and storeshnikov hitherto has stood in awe of his mother and of course he has been burdened by his dependence on her for people who have no strength of character it is very charming to think i am not afraid i have a strong character of course there was also a desire to advance in his worldly career through his wife and to all this there was added the fact that storeshnikov did not dare to show himself to vierotchka in his former role and meantime he could not resist looking at her in a word storeshnikov each day thought more seriously of getting married and at the end of a week when marya alexyevna after returning from a late service was sitting down and thinking how she might catch him he himself appeared and made an offer of marriage vierotchka did not come out of her room and so he could only speak with marya alexyevna marya alexyevna of course said that she on her part looked upon it as a great honour but as a loving mother she must know her daughter's mind and asked him to call for his answer on the next morning nu no, she's a trump my girl viera said marya alexyevna to her husband surprised at such an abrupt turning of the case just see how she has got the young lad under her thumb and i was thinking and thinking and did not know how to put my wits to work i was thinking how much bother it would cost me to catch him again i was thinking how the whole affair was ruined while she my golubushka my darling literally little pigeon did not spoil it at all but brought it round all right she knew how it was necessary to act no she is cunning it's no use talking the lord inspires infants with wisdom said pavel konstantinovitch he seldom played any part in domestic life but marya alexyevna was a stern observer of the good old traditions and on such a solemn occasion as the telling her daughter about the offer she allowed her husband to take the role of honour which by right belongs to the head and ruler of the family pavel konstantinovitch and marya alexyevna seated themselves on the sofa as on the most solemn place and sent matryona to ask the baryushna to come to them viera pavel konstantinovitch began mikhail ivanovitch has done us the honour of asking your hand we answered like loving parents that we would not compel you but we said that on our side we were glad you as a good and dutiful daughter such as you have always appeared to be will depend on our experience that we have not dared to ask god for such a husband for you do you agree viera no said vierotchka what is that you say viera cried pavel konstantinovitch the thing was so plain that even he could cry out not asking his wife how to act have you lost your senses you fool repeat that if you dare you disobedient thing cried marya alexyevna 
doubling her fists against her daughter forgive me mamenka said vira rising if you touch me i will leave the house if you lock me up i will jump out of the window i knew how you would take my refusal and i have resolved how to act take a seat and sit down or i shall go marya alexyevna sat down again what a piece of stupidity that front door is not under lock and key she would push away the bolt in a second we could not catch her she would run away she is crazy i shall not marry him without my consent they can't marry me vera you are losing your senses said marya alexyevna in a choking voice how can that be what answer can we give him to-morrow exclaimed her father you are not to blame towards him but i will not consent the scene lasted about two hours marya alexyevna was in a stew twenty times she began to cry out and clench her fists but vierotchka said don't get up or i shall leave they kept beating about the bush but they could not do anything it ended when matryona came in to ask whether they would put on the dinner the pirog or pie was overdone think till evening vera come to your senses you fool said marya alexyevna and whispered something to matryona mamenka you are going to do something to me to take out the key from my bedroom or something else don't you do it or it will be worse marya alexyevna said to the cook no matter what a beast she is this vierka if it were not that he wanted her on account of her face i would beat her till she bled but now how can i touch her she will disfigure herself the confounded fool they went in to dinner they dined quietly after dinner vierotchka went to her room pavel konstantinovitch lay down as he usually did to take a nap but this time the nap was a failure as soon as he closed his eyes matryona came in and said that the kozydaika's manservant was there that the landlady asked pavel konstantinovitch to call upon her immediately matryona was trembling like an aspen leaf why should she tremble end of part one chapter seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter eight of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one the life of vira pavlovna in her parents family chapter eight how could matryona help trembling when the whole trouble arose through her as soon as she called vierotchka to her papenka and mamenka she immediately ran off to tell the wife of the kozydaika's cook how your barin is courting our bariushna they called the youngest of her kozydaika's chambermaids and began to blame her for her unfriendliness in not having told them anything about it before the youngest chambermaid could not understand what the secret was that they blamed her for not telling she had never concealed anything they told her when she said i have not concealed anything that they were sorry for reproaching her for concealing anything she ran off to tell the news to the oldest of the chambermaids the oldest of the chambermaids said of course he has done this without his mother's knowledge because i have not heard anything and i must know everything that anna petrovna knows and she went off to tell the whole story to the baryuna such was the mischief caused by matryona my confounded little tongue has made me a great deal of bother she thought marya alexyevna will find out who let the cat out of the bag but it happened that marya alexyevna forgot to ask who told of it anna petrovna could not say anything else but ach and och twice she fell in a swoon even while she was alone with the senior chambermaid of course she was greatly shocked and she summoned her son the son appeared mikhail is it true what i have heard in a tone of indignant suffering what have you heard maman that you have offered yourself to this to this to this to the daughter of our manager i have maman without asking your mother's consent i intended to ask your consent after i had obtained hers i presume that you were surer of her consent than of mine maman it is the fashion nowadays to get the girl's consent first and to speak to relations afterwards is that your fashion maybe it is also your fashion for the sons of good families to marry god knows whom and for the mothers to consent to it but maman she is not a god knows whom when you come to know her you will approve of my choice when i know her i shall never know her i approve of your choice 
i forbid any thought of this choice do you hear i forbid it maman this is not the fashion nowadays i am not a little boy to be led around by the hand by you i know myself where i am going ah anna petrovna shut her eyes mikhail ivanovitch had to yield before Maya alexievna to julie to vierotchka because they were women of sense and strong character but here as far as sense was concerned the battle was drawn and if the mother was stronger by reason of her character still the son felt solid ground under his feet he had stood in awe of his mother hitherto through habit but they both remembered very well that in reality the kozyaka was not the kozyaka but only the mother of the kozyayan and again that the kozyaka's son is in reality not the kozyaka's son but the kozyayan and therefore the kozyaka hesitated to use the decided word forbid she prolonged the conversation hoping to defeat her son and get him tired out before a genuine battle was fought but the son had gone to such lengths that it was impossible to withdraw and he was compelled by the necessity of the case to fight it out maman i assure you that a better daughter you could not have you torment your mother's murderer maman let us reason about it coolly sooner or later i shall have to get married and a married man must have greater expenses than a bachelor i could of course marry such a woman that all the income of the estate would have to be spent on my establishment but she will be a dutiful daughter and we could live with you just as i always have torment my murderer get out of my sight maman don't be angry i am not in the least to blame marry such a wench and not to blame now maman i am going to leave you i do not want you to call her such names in my presence my murderer anna petrovna fell in a swoon and michel went off satisfied with a courageous way in which he had carried out the first scene which was the most important of all seeing that her son was gone anna petrovna recovered from her swoon her son has absolutely escaped from her power in response to her i forbid he explains that the house is his anna petrovna thought and thought she poured out her grief before the senior chambermaid who in these circumstances shared absolutely in the kozyaka's feeling of contempt for the manager's daughter she consulted with her and sent for the manager hitherto i have been very well satisfied with you pavel konstantinovitch but now these intrigues in which possibly you have had no share may compel me to quarrel with you your ladyship i am not to blame in the slightest degree for god i knew long ago that michel was hanging around your daughter i did not put a stop to it because a young man cannot live without recreation i am willing to make allowances for the mischief of young men but i cannot endure that my family should be degraded how did your daughter dare to think of entertaining such an ambition your ladyship she has not dared to entertain any such ambition she is a modest girl we have brought her up respectably what do you mean by that your ladyship she would never dare to do anything against your will anna petrovna did not believe her ears can it be possible that this good news is true you must be aware what my will is i cannot consent to such an unnatural and i may say disreputable marriage we are sensible of that your ladyship and vierotchka feels it also she said so i do not dare to offend her ladyship were her very words how could that be it happened your ladyship that mikhail ivanovitch named his intentions to my wife and my wife told him that she could not give him an answer till to-morrow morning and my wife and me intended your ladyship to call on you and tell you all about it because being as it was late we did not dare to disturb your ladyship and when mikhail ivanovitch went we told vierotchka and she said i perfectly agree with you papenka and mamenka that it is not to be dreamed of is she such a sensible and honest girl certainly your ladyship she is a virtuous girl well i am very glad that we can remain friends with you i will pay you for this i am even now ready to pay you for this on the front stairs where the tailor lives the apartment on the second floor is vacant isn't it it will be vacant in three days your ladyship take it for yourself you may spend a hundred roubles to have it put in order and i will add to your salary two hundred and forty roubles a year allow me to kiss your ladyship's little hand very well that will do tatyana the senior chambermaid came in find me my blue velvet cloak i want to give this to your wife it cost me one hundred and fifty roubles really eighty-five i have only worn it twice 
in reality more than twenty times and this i give to your daughter anna petrovna handed the manager a lady's small watch i paid three hundred roubles in reality one hundred and twenty for it i can make presents and i shall not forget you in the future either i make allowances for the mischief of young men after dismissing the manager anna petrovna again summoned tatyana ask mikhail ivanovitch to come to me or no it's better i will go to him myself she was afraid that her messenger would tell the news to her son's valet and the valet would tell her son what news the manager brought and the bouquet would vanish and not make the impression on her son's nose as if it were fresh from the wine of her own words mikhail ivanovitch was lying down and not without some satisfaction was twisting his moustache now what has brought her here i have no smelling salts for fainting fits he thought getting up when his mother entered but he saw in her face a scornful triumph she sat down she said sit down mikhail ivanovitch and we will have a talk and she looked at him for a long time with a smile at last she continued i am very well content mikhail ivanovitch guess why i am content i do not know what to guess maman you are so strange you will see that there is nothing strange at all think away and perhaps you will guess again a long pause he is lost in perplexity she is enjoying her triumph you cannot guess i will tell you it is very simple and natural if you had a spark of noble feeling you would have guessed it your mistress in the former talk anna petrovna had to tack ship but now she had no reason to tack the means of defeating her was taken away from her opponent your mistress don't you answer me back mikhail ivanovitch you yourself have boasted everywhere that she was your mistress this creature of low origin of low training of low behaviour even this contemptible creature maman i am not willing to hear such expressions about the girl who is to be my wife i should not have used them if i had thought that she was going to be your wife and i began with the intention of explaining to you that this was not to be and why it was not to be allow me to finish then you may freely reproach me for these expressions which will then be out of place according to your idea but now allow me to finish i wish to say that your mistress this nameless creature untrained mannerless feelingless even she puts you to shame even she understands all the shamelessness of your intentions what what is that speak maman you yourself are hindering me i was going to say that even she do you hear even she could understand and appreciate my feelings even she when she learned from her mother about your offer sent her father to tell me that she would not put herself in opposition to my will and would not degrade our family by her polluted name maman you are deceiving me fortunately for me and you no she says that but mikhail ivanovitch was no longer in the room he had already put on his army coat hold him pyotr hold him cried anna petrovna pyotr opened wide his mouth at such an extraordinary command but mikhail ivanovitch was already running down the front doorsteps end of part one chapter eight recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one chapter nine of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part one the life of vira pavlovna in her parents family chapter nine new how was it asked marya alexyevna as her husband came back elegant matushka she knew all about it and she says how did you dare and i says we don't dare your ladyship and vierotchka has already refused him what what you said such nonsense as that you ass marya alexyevna you ass you villain you have killed me you have cut my throat take that the husband received a slap and take that another slap that's the way to teach you durak she seized him by the hair and began to drag him about the room the lesson continued for some time for storeshnikov after his mother's long lecture and pauses came running into the room and found marya alexyevna still in the full heat of instruction you ass you did not even fasten the door and what a state strangers find us in you ought to be ashamed to be such a hog that was all that marya alexyevna found to say 
where is vira pavlovna i must see vira pavlovna immediately is it true that she refuses me the circumstances were so embarrassing that marya alexievna could only motion with her hand the very same thing happened to napoleon after the battle of waterloo when marshal grouchy proved to be stupid like pavel konstantinovitch and lafayette was bold like vierotchka napoleon was fighting fighting doing accomplishing all the miracles in his art but it was without avail and he could only motion with his hand and say i give it all up let every one do as he pleases with himself and with me vira pavlovna do you refuse my hand judge for yourself how can i not refuse it vira pavlovna i have cruelly offended you i am to blame i am worthy of being hung but i cannot bear your refusal etc etc vierotchka listened to him for several minutes finally it was time to put an end to it this was hard no mikhail ivanovitch this is enough stop i cannot consent well if that must be so i beg one favour you feel just now too keenly how i offended you don't give me your answer yet allow me time to win your forgiveness i seem to you low vile but look maybe i shall grow to be better i will use all my strength to become a better man help me don't push me away now give me time i will obey you in everything that you may ask you shall see how humble i am maybe you will see that there is some good in me only give me time i am sorry for you said vierotchka i see the sincerity of your love vierotchka this is not love at all it is only a mixture of different grades of depravity and meanness love is something quite different because a man finds it disagreeable to be refused by a woman that man is not necessarily in love with her that is not love at all but vierotchka does not know this yet and she is touched you want me not to give my answer yet very good but i warn you that the postponement will lead to nothing i shall never give you any other answer than the one that you have just received i shall deserve another answer you will be my salvation he grasped her hand and began to kiss it marya alexievna came into the room and in the stress of her emotion was going to bless her dear children without further formality that is without pavel konstantinovitch then to call him and have them solemnly blessed storeshnikov demolished one half of her joy by explaining to her that vira pavlovna although she had not as yet consented did not absolutely refuse but merely postponed the answer this was bad but still it was good compared to what she had expected storeshnikov went home in triumph again the threat about the estate came upon the scene and again anna petrovna fell in a swoon marya alexievna was absolutely at a loss to know what to think about vierotchka her daughter spoke as though she were entirely opposed to her intentions but the result proved that her daughter put an end to all the embarrassment which had seemed too much for marya alexievna to manage if one judged by the course of the affair then it would look as though vierotchka wanted the same thing that marya alexievna wanted but as an educated and wily creature she elaborates her material in a different way but if this is so why should she not say to marya alexievna matushka i desire the same thing that you do be at ease or else she must be so angry at her mother that she wants to do the very same thing that they are both anxious to bring about by herself without her mother's cooperation but her willingness to postpone the answer is perfectly comprehensible to marya alexievna she wants to give her future husband a thoroughly good schooling so that he should not dare to breathe without her and so as to extort anna petrovna's submission apparently she is even more cunning than marya alexievna herself whenever marya alexievna thought about this her thoughts brought her to this view but her eyes and ears always testified against it and meantime how to act if this view is false if her daughter is not really going to marry storeshnikov she is such a wild creature that it is impossible to know how to tame her but in all probability the good-for-nothing virka does not want to marry such is doubtless the case marya alexievna's common sense was really too strong to be deceived by her own wily reasoning about vierotchka being a cunning intriguer but this vile young girl is managing everything in such a way that when she does marry and the deuce knows what she has in mind maybe this very thing at all events she will evidently be the complete mistress over her husband and his mother and over the whole household and so what is left for her only to wait and see nothing else is possible 
Just now Vierka does not want to do this, but she will make up her mind for the joke of the thing, and she will want it. Well, besides, we can use moral suasion. Only leave it to time. But now we must wait till that time shall come. Marya Alexievna waited. But how charming to her was the thought, refuted by her common sense, that Vierka was bringing the affair to a marriage. Everything but Vierotchka's words and actions corroborated this thought. The future husband was a silken one. The future husband's mother struggled about three weeks, but her son defeated her by using his threat in regard to the estate, and she began to grow more reasonable. She expressed the desire to make Vierotchka's acquaintance. Vierotchka did not go to see her. At the first moment, Marya Alexievna thought that if she were in Vierotchka's place, she should have acted more wisely, that she should have gone. But on thinking the matter over, she came to the conclusion that not to go was the wiser course. Oh, what a cunning creature! And in fact, in a couple of weeks, Anna Petrovna herself called, under the pretext that she wanted to look at the arrangement of the new apartment. She was cool and caustically polite. Vierotchka, after listening to two or three of her biting remarks, went to her room before she left it did not occur to marya alexievna that it was necessary to leave she thought it was necessary to answer biting remarks with biting remarks but when vierotchka left marya alexievna quickly reasoned yes that was the best move of all let her son pay her in her own coin that's the best way at the end of two weeks anna petrovna called again and gave no excuses for her call she simply said that she came to make them a call and she said nothing sarcastic in Vierotchka's presence. Time passed on. The prospective husband made Vierotchka presents. They were made through Marya Alexievna, and of course remained in her possession, like Anna Petrovna's watch. However, not all of them remained with her. Some of the cheapest of them she gave to Vierotchka, saying that they were things that had remained in pawn, unredeemed. It was necessary for the prospective husband to see some of his gifts worn by the bride. He saw them and grew more confident that he should get Vierotchka's consent, otherwise she would not have accepted his presence. But why does she put off her answer? He himself perceived, and Marya Alexievna told him, the reason. She is waiting till Anna Petrovna gets entirely reconciled. And he, with redoubled energy, pulled on the line whereto his mother was hooked, an occupation that gave him much satisfaction. Thus Vierotchka was left in peace they looked into her eyes this canine deference was detestable to her she tried to be with her mother as little as possible her mother ceased to have the courage to enter her room and when vierotchka was sitting there and this was the larger part of the day she was not disturbed mikhail ivanovitch was occasionally allowed to enter her room he was as obedient to her as a child she told him to read he read with great energy as though to get ready for an examination he derived very little instruction from his reading, but still he got some good from it. She tried to help him shine in conversation. Conversations came easier to him than books, and he made some progress, very slow, very trifling, but all the same he progressed. He began to treat his mother with more respect than before, began to prefer keeping her under the bridle than on the hook. Thus passed three or four months. There was a reconciliation, there was peace but every day a storm threatened, and Vierotchka's heart was dying within her at the horrible anticipation. If not today, then tomorrow Mikhail Ivanovitch or Marya Alexievna would demand of her the answer. They will not wait a whole century. If I were to want to make an effective collision, I should give to this situation a crackling conclusion, but such did not occur. If I wanted to allure by uncertainty, I should not say now that nothing of the kind happened but i am writing without any subterfuges and i therefore will anticipate and say there will be no crackling collision the situation will be untied without storms without thunder or lightning end of part one the life of vera pavlovna in her parents family recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter one of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others 
this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter one it is well known how situations like the above would end in former times a fine young girl belonging to a low family an insignificant man who is to become her husband under compulsion who is detestable to her who when left to himself being already a mean man would constantly grow meaner but joined to her comes under her influence and little by little begins to resemble a man of no especial account to be sure not very good but on the other hand not very bad the girl at first declares that she will not marry him but gradually getting accustomed to having him under her command and being convinced that out of two such evils as such a husband and such a family as her own the husband would be the less evil makes her admirer happy at first it is detestable to her when she finds that she can make her husband happy without loving him but her husband is obedient patience makes love and she becomes an ordinary fine lady that is a woman who excellent naturally gets reconciled to meanness and living on the earth only vegetates literally obscures the heaven with smoke such used to be the way in old times with nice young girls such used to be the way with nice young men all of whom became excellent people but lived on earth in such a way as to obscure the heaven such used to be the way in former times because excellent people were very few the harvest of them apparently was so small in old times that there was not one to a ten-acre lot footnote a russian proverb says that the ear of corn is so far from its neighbour that the sound of the voice cannot reach from the one to the other and no one can live a century as a single man or a single woman without fading away and thus they either used to fade away or reconcile themselves to meanness but nowadays it happens more and more frequently that things take a different turn respectable people get acquainted with each other yes and how can this help happening more and more often when the number of respectable people increases with every new year and in time this will be a very ordinary occurrence and indeed the time will come when nothing else will happen because all people will be decent then it will be very good good it was for virochka also therefore with her permission i will relate to you the story of her life since so far as i know she is one of the first women whose life was established in this good way first occurrences have a historical interest the first swallow is regarded with great interest by the natives of the north the occurrences by means of which virochka's life began to improve were somewhat in this order it was necessary to get virochka's little brother ready for the gymnasium her father asked his colleagues if they knew of a cheap tutor one of his colleagues recommended to him the medical student lopukov lopukov gave five or six lessons to his new pupil before he and virochka met he used to sit with fyodor in one room of the apartment she in another in her own room it was getting time for the examinations at the medical school and so he changed the lesson hours from morning till the evening because in the morning he had to do his own studying and when it came evening he found the whole family at tea on the sofa were sitting his acquaintances the father the mother of the pupil behind the mother on a chair the pupil was sitting and somewhat farther a person whom he did not know a tall well-proportioned young girl rather slender with black hair thick handsome hair with black eyes her eyes are handsome yes very handsome with the southern type of face as though she were a mallow russian or rather even a caucasian type that's nothing a very handsome face but somewhat reserved but that's not southern her health is good there would not be as many of us doctors if people were like her yes healthy red cheeks and a good broad chest she'll never make the acquaintance of the stethoscope when she enters society she will create a great effect however it does not interest me and she looked up at the tutor as he came in the student was no longer young a man of medium size or possibly taller than the average with dark auburn hair with regular and even handsome features with a proud and courageous expression not bad-looking he must be kind but he's too solemn she did not add to her thoughts the epilogue it does not interest me 
because it did not occur to her to ask herself whether she would be interested in him or not why should she be when fyodor told her so much about him that she was weary of hearing he is kind sister but he is not sociable and i told him sister that you were a beauty and sister he said what of that and i told him sister that everybody falls in love with pretty girls and he said all stupid people fall in love and i said don't you like them and he said i have no time and sister i said to him don't you want to get acquainted with virotchka and he said i have a good many acquaintances beside her all this fyodor rattled off immediately after the first lessons and afterwards he kept saying much the same thing with various additions and i told him to-day sister that everybody looks at you whenever you go anywhere and sister he said well that's good and i said to him don't you want to see her and he said i shall have time enough to see her and then again i told him sister what little hands you had and sister he said you want to chatter haven't you got anything better to chatter about and the tutor learned from fyodor everything that was worth knowing about his sister he tried to stop fyodor's chattering about family affairs but how can you stop a nine-year-old child from chattering to you about everything unless you threaten him after he has said five words you succeed in stopping him but then it is too late because children begin without any preface getting the very essence of the thing and among all sorts of disclosures relating to his family affairs the tutor heard such disjointed sentences as these my sister is going to marry a rich man and mamenka says that the bridegroom is a stupid and how mamenka flatters him and mamenka says sister caught him cute and mamenka says i am cute but virotchka is cuter and mamenka says we are going to fire the bridegroom's mother out of the house and so forth naturally when the young people got such ideas of each other they had no great desire to become acquainted however so far we know only this much that it was natural on virotchka's part she had not reached that stage of development that she had any desire of defeating savages or of taming such a bear nay she was still far from it she was glad that she was left in peace she was like a crushed and tortured man who has the good fortune to fall in such a way that the broken arm is undisturbed and the pain in the side is not felt and who fears to move lest the pain in all his joints should return why should she care to form new acquaintances and especially with young men yes such is virotchka new but he he is like a savage to judge him by fyodor's description and his head is full of books and anatomical preparations such as fill the soul of a medical student with the keenest delight and furnish him the richest pabulum or perhaps fyodor misrepresented him end of part two chapter one recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter two of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter two no fyodor did not misrepresent him lopukhov was in fact a student whose head was full of books what books we shall learn from marya alexievna's bibliographical investigations and with anatomical preparations for unless a man fills his head with anatomical preparations he cannot become a professor and that was lopukhov's ambition but as we see if we depend upon fyodor's descriptions of virotchka made for lopukhov's benefit lopukhov did not learn very accurately about her and for the same reason we must correct fyodor's description of his teacher if we would know lopukhov better as regarded pecuniary matters lopukhov belonged to that very small minority of special medical students who are not supported by government and yet who just escape starvation and freezing how and in what way the great majority of them live is known of course only to god not to mortals but our story does not intend to deal with people who are in need of victuals and therefore it will devote only two or three words to the period in lopukhov's life when he suffered such hardships and it was not very long that he was in such a condition only three years and even less before he entered the medical school he had plenty of food his father a meshanin or commoner of the town of ryazan 
lived in the style of the meshanin comfortably that is his family had she cabbage soup and meat not on sundays only and even had tea every day he was able to keep his son at the gymnasium after a fashion but after his son reached the age of fifteen he made it easier for him by doing some teaching the father's means were not sufficient for the support of his son in petersburg however during the first two years lopukhov received from home the sum of thirty-five roubles a year and he obtained almost as much more by copying papers as unattached clerk in one of the districts of the vyborgsky ward it was only during this time that he was hard up and that was his own fault he was accepted as a governmental scholar but he managed to quarrel with someone and was compelled to take to his own fodder when he was in the third class his affairs began to improve the assistant district supervisor engaged him as a private tutor then he found other pupils and now for two years he has not been in need for a year and more he has been living in one house not in one but in two different rooms and that is proof that he is not poor he has for a roommate another student as lucky as himself his name is kirsanov they are the closest friends both of them were used from early life to push their own way without depending upon others and in other respects there was a great resemblance between them so that if one were to meet either of them separately they would both seem like people of the same character and when they were seen together it was observable that though both of them were very reliable and honest people lopukhov was rather more reserved while his chum was more effusive so far we have seen only lopukhov kirsanov will appear later on apart from kirsanov it may be remarked in regard to lopukhov exactly the same thing that we shall have to remark about kirsanov for instance lopukhov was at the present time occupied more than with anything else with the question how to establish his life after his graduation which would occur now in a few months and the same is true of kirsanov's and both had the same plan for the future lopukhov knew for a certainty that he was going to be a surgeon in one of the army hospitals of petersburg and this is looked upon as a great piece of good fortune and that he was going to get a professorship in the medical school he had no desire to practice it is a very peculiar thing that during the past ten years there has appeared among some of the best of the medical students a resolution not to practice medicine after graduation though that is the only way by which a medical man can gain a livelihood at the first opportunity they give up medicine for some of its subsidiary sciences physiology chemistry or something of the sort and every one of these young men knows that if they practice until they were thirty years old they might gain a reputation at thirty-five a competency for life and at forty-five wealth but they argue in a different way you see don't you that medicine is in such a state of infancy that one should not as yet try to cure but to collect the materials so that the doctors of the future may know how to cure and here for the advantage of the well-beloved science they are great hands to curse medicine but nevertheless they are devoting all their energies for its advantage they refuse riches they refuse pleasure for the sake of sitting in the hospitals and they are making don't you know observations that are interesting to science they cut up frogs they dissect a hundred subjects every year and at the first chance they establish chemical laboratories with what severity they follow out this lofty resolution depends of course on the way in which their domestic life is established if it is not necessary for those dependent upon them they do not even begin to practice and they are willing to live almost in poverty but if their domestic circumstances compel them to do so they practice but only just so long as it is necessary to for their family that is on a very limited scale and they cure only those people who are really sick and who can really be cured by the present pitiful state of the science that is the sick who bring them no advantage at all to this class lopukhov and kirsanov belonged they expected to graduate this year and they have announced that they will take or as they say at the medical school do their examinations merely for the degree of m d they have both been hard at work on their medical theses and they have made way with a huge quantity of frogs both have adopted as a specialty the nervous system and properly speaking they were working in cooperation but for the formal dissertation the work was divided one has gathered for his materials the facts that they both observed on one question the other did the same thing for another 
however it is now time to speak about lopukhov alone there was a time when he drank too much this happened when he was without tea and sometimes even without boots such circumstances are extremely conducive to drinking not only as regards willingness but also possibility to buy drink is cheaper than to buy food and clothes but this habit of drinking arose from grief at intolerable poverty and nothing more now there was not to be found a man who led a sterner life and not in regard to wine alone in other days lopukhov had a good many love adventures once for example it happened that he fell in love with a foreign ballet dancer what was to be done he thought the matter over and went to call upon her what do you want i was sent by count so-and-so with a note his student's uniform was easily mistaken by the servant to be that of a clerk or some officer's denshchik give me the note will you wait for an answer the count told me to wait the servant returned in surprise she bade me ask you in here he is here he is this is the man who shouts so loud for me that i can distinguish his voice from the green room how many times have you been carried off to the police station for such a demonstration in my honour twice that isn't much well why are you here to see you capital what else i do not know what would you like well i know what i would like i would like some breakfast you see the things are on the table sit down with me another plate was placed on the table she laughed at him he laughed at himself he is young not bad-looking not stupid and besides it's a novelty why not have some fun out of him she fooled him about two weeks and then she said get thee hence well that is just what i wanted to do but i did not know how then we will part good friends they gave each other a parting kiss and that was the end of it but this was some time before three years ago and now it is two years since he has renounced all such follies besides his comrades and two or three professors who recognized in him a good worker in the cause of science his only acquaintances were in the families where he gave lessons but he did not know the families at all he avoided familiarity as he would fire and he held proudly aloof from all the members of these families except the little boys and girls who were his pupils end of part two chapter two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter three of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter three and so lopukhov entered the room saw the company sitting at the tea-table and in their number was vierotchka nu of course the company including also vierotchka saw that the tutor entered the room please take a seat said marya alexyevna matryona bring another glass if it is meant for me then i thank you i don't drink tea matryona no matter about the glass a well-bred young man why shouldn't you drink some you ought to drink some he looked at marya alexyevna and at vierotchka willingly as it were and maybe it was really willingly maybe he noticed that she slightly shrugged her shoulders and he must have seen that i blushed thank you i drink tea only at home after all he is not such a savage he came in and he bowed easily and gracefully such was the observation made at one end of the table after all if she is a trifle spoiled then at least she blushes for her mother's meanness was the observation at the other end of the table but fyodor soon finished his tea and went to take his lesson the most important result of the evening was that marya alexyevna formed a most favourable opinion of the tutor because she saw that her sugar-bowl would in all probability not suffer great loss by changing the hour of the lessons from morning to evening two days later the teacher again found the family at table and again he refused to take tea and thus he absolutely calmed marya alexyevna's fears but this time he saw at the table a new face an officer upon whom marya alexyevna was assiduously fawning ah the bridegroom but the bridegroom owing to the importance of his uniform and family felt that it was incumbent upon him not simply to look at the tutor but after looking at him to measure him from head to foot 
with the impertinent steady stare which is adopted in fashionable society but he had no sooner taken his measure than he began to feel that the tutor was likewise taking his measure and even worse was looking straight into his eyes and so keenly that instead of keeping up the stare the bridegroom said your work must be hard monsieur lopukhov i mean your medical work yes it is and he continues to look him straight in the eyes the bridegroom was conscious that he was fumbling with his left hand at the upper three buttons of his uniform but he did not know the reason nu no, when the awkwardness gets as far as the buttons there is no other salvation than to make haste to drink his tea and ask marya alexievna for some more your uniform if i am not mistaken belong to such and such a regiment yes i serve in that regiment is mikhail ivanovitch's reply have you been long in the service nine years did you begin in that regiment i did have you a company or not no i have none as yet he cross-examines me as though i were a private do you expect to get one soon not very soon hm the tutor was satisfied and ceased his examination though he still looked straight into the imaginary private's eyes and yet and yet thinks vierotchka and what does she mean by and yet finally she makes up her mind what she means by and yet and yet he conducts himself just as serge did when he came with the kind julie how is he a savage why does he speak so strangely about girls that pretty girls are loved only by stupid people and and why does she repeat and at last she knows and why didn't he want to know anything about me why did he say that it was not interesting vierotchka will you play something on the piano for mikhail ivanovitch and i said marya alexievna when vierotchka had set down her second cup certainly and if you would sing something adds mikhail ivanovitch in a flattering tone certainly this certainly sounded as though she had said i am ready to do anything to get rid of you thinks the tutor and now he had been sitting down with them fully five minutes and though he had not been looking at her yet he knows that she has not looked once at the bridegroom except when she answered him just now and even now she looks at him as though she were looking at her father and mother coolly and without the least trace of affection there must be something quite different from what fyodor told me however more than anything else she must be in reality a proud calculating girl who wants to enter the upper ten in order to rule and shine it is disagreeable to her that she cannot find a better bridegroom for that purpose but despising the bridegroom she yet accepts his hand because there is no other hand to lead her where she wants to go well after all this is rather interesting fyodor hurry up and finish your tea remarked the mother don't hurry him marya alexievna i want to listen if Vera pavlovna will allow me vierotchka picked up the first music that came to hand without looking at what it was opened it at haphazard and began to play mechanically no matter only so as to get done with it the sooner but the piece happened to be of a good order it was from an excellent opera and soon the girls playing grew animated after she was done she started to get up but you promised to sing vira pavlovna if i were there i would ask you to sing something from rigoletto this winter la donna e mobile was the fashionable aria if you like vierotchka sang la donna e mobile then she got up and went to her room no she is not a heartless cold girl without any soul this is interesting isn't that good asked mikhail ivanovitch in a simple voice without this time taking the tutor's measure there is no need of being in strained relations with people who can examine privates why not speak without any pretentiousness so as not to get his ill will yes very good do you understand music just a little are you a musician somewhat marya alexievna overheard this talk and a happy thought struck her what do you play on dmitri sergeyitch she asked the piano may we ask you to give us a tune very willingly he played a certain piece he played passably not badly at all after he had finished the lesson marya alexievna came to him and said that they were going to have a little party the next evening that it was her daughter's birthday and asked him to come round of course there is always a dearth of young men according to the style of all such parties but no matter he looked closer at the girl with her or about her there is something interesting i thank you heartily but the tutor was mistaken marya alexievna had something more important in view 
than in finding a partner for her dancing girls reader you of course have anticipated that on this evening some explanation would take place that vierotchka and lopukhov will fall in love with each other of course they will end of part two chapter three recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter four of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter four part two first love and legal marriage chapter four Maria Alexievna wanted to give a great party on Vierotchka's birthday, but Vierotchka begged to have no guests invited. The one wanted to show off the bridegroom, the other found such an exhibition distasteful. They compromised by having the smallest possible party, inviting only a few of their most intimate friends. They invited Pavel Konstantinovitch's colleagues, those, of course, who had been longer in the service and were higher in position than himself, two of Maria Alexeyevna's friends, three young girls who were more intimate with Virochka than any others. As Lopukhov looked over the assembling guests, he noticed that there was no lack of partners. Every one of the young girls had a young man, either as candidate for bridegroom or bridegroom already. Therefore Lopukhov was not invited in the capacity of a partner. Why, then? As he thought the matter over, he remembered that his playing on the piano preceded his invitation of course he was invited so as to save expense to take the place of an accompanist all right he thought excuse me marya alexeyevna and he went to pavel konstantinovitch how now pavel konstantinovitch it's time to have a game of cards you see it's rather tiresome for us old people what do you want to play anything soon a party was made up and lopukhov sat down to play the medical school on Vyborgskaya street is a classical establishment for card-playing it is not a rare occurrence in some of the rooms that is in the governmental students apartments for a game of cards to be kept up for a day and a half without stopping it must be admitted that the sums that change hands at the students card-tables are much smaller than those at the english club but the standard of the gamester's art is much higher even lopukhov used to play a great deal in his day that is when he had no money mesdames what shall we do we must play by cutting in that's a fact but there'll be only seven of us left either a gentleman or a lady will be lacking for the quadrille the first rubber was drawing to an end when one of the girls the liveliest of all came flying up to lopukhov monsieur lopukhov you must dance on one condition he said rising and bowing what that you give me the first quadrille Ah moi i am engaged for the first one you are welcome to the next though lopukhov again made a profound bow two of the gentlemen took their turn in cutting in at the third quadrille lopukhov asked vierotchka the first she had danced with mikhail ivanovitch the second he danced with the lively girl lopukhov had been watching vierotchka and was now absolutely convinced of the mistake in his former idea of her being a heartless girl coolly marrying for money a man whom she despised he saw before him an ordinary young girl who dances and laughs with her whole soul yes to vierotchka's shame be it said that she was an ordinary girl who loved to dance at first she set her face firmly against the party but when the party was arranged small without any show and consequently not a trial to her even she in a way that she would never have believed forgot her melancholy at her time of life one does not like to be melancholy but liveliness and gaiety are so natural that the least chance of self-forgetfulness brings also for a time forgetfulness of sorrow lopukhov was now inclined in her favour but as yet there were a good many things not clear to him he was getting interested in vierotchka's anomalous position monsieur lopukhov i never expected to see you dancing she began why not is it so hard to dance for most people certainly it is not but for you why yes of course it is why for me 
because i know your secret yours and fyodor's you despise women fyodor did not in the least understand my secret i don't despise women but i avoid them and do you know why i have a bride a very jealous one who in order to compel me to avoid them told me their secret you have a bride yes how surprising a student and already engaged is she pretty are you in love with her yes she is a beauty and i love her very dearly is she a brunetka or a blondinka i cannot tell you that it is a secret well god be with her if it is a secret but what was the secret about women that she revealed to you that makes you avoid their society she saw that i did not like to be in a melancholy state of mind and she whispered in my ear such a secret about them that i cannot see a woman without getting into a melancholy mood and so i avoid women you cannot see a woman without getting into a melancholy mood at all events you are a master in the art of making compliments what else can i say to pity is the same thing as being in a melancholy state of mind do we need pity so much as all that yes aren't you a woman i have only to repeat to you your dearest wish and you will agree with me it is the universal desire of all women do tell me tell me it is this ah how i should like to be a man i never met a woman who did not secretly wish this with all her heart and in the majority of cases it is not necessary to search for it it is expressed spontaneously without any need of drawing it out if a woman has any trouble whatsoever you will soon hear something like this we are poor miserable creatures we women or men are so different from women or even without any circumlocution ach why was i not a man vierotchka smiled true every woman has said that and now you see how women are to be pitied for if their dearest wish were to be fulfilled there would not be any women in the world yes it seems as if it were so said vierotchka it is exactly the same way if the eager desires of every poor man were fulfilled there would not be a single poor man in the world don't you see how pitiable women are they are just as much to be pitied as the poor are who likes to see poor people just the same way it is painful for me to see women since i have learned their secret and it was revealed to me by my jealous bride on the very day of our engagement till that time i was very fond of being in the society of women after that it was snatched away from me my bride cured me your bride must be a kind and sensible young lady yes we women are pitiable creatures we are poor said vierotchka but who is your bride you speak so mysteriously that is one of my secrets which fyodor does not tell you i entirely share the wish of the poor that there should not be any in existence and some time this wish is going to be realized sooner or later we shall be able to lay out our lives in such a way that there will be no poor but what no more poor interrupted vierotchka i myself have thought that the time might come when there would not be any more poverty but how it would come about i could not tell tell me how i myself cannot tell this only my bride can tell i am alone here i can only say this much that she is looking out for that and she is very strong she is stronger than any one else in the world but let us not talk about her but about women i perfectly agree with the wish of the poor that there should not be any more poor and my bride is going to bring this about but i do not agree with the wish of women that there shouldn't be more women in the world because this wish cannot be realized and i never agree with what cannot be realized but i have a different kind of a wish i should like all women to get acquainted with my bride she takes as much care of them as she does of everything else if they would make friends with her i should have no reason to pity them and their wish ach why wasn't i born a man would vanish for if women get acquainted with her then they would not be worse off than men are monsieur lopukhov one more quadrille without fail i shall be very much pleased he pressed her hand as calmly and gravely as though he were an old friend or she his comrade which one the last one very well Maria alexievna several times passed near them while they were dancing the quadrille what would Maria alexievna have thought had she heard this conversation we who have heard every word of it from beginning to end all of us will say that such a conversation during a quadrille is very unnatural the last quadrille came we spoke all the time about myself said lopukhov 
and that is very bad manners on my part to be speaking all the time about myself now i want to make up for my impoliteness by speaking about you vira pavlovna did you know that i had a far worse opinion of you than you did of me and now well we'll speak about this afterwards now first of all there is one question that i cannot answer please answer it for me will your marriage take place soon never i thought so for the last three hours ever since i left the card-table to come in here but why is he considered to be your bridegroom why is he considered to be my bridegroom why indeed there's one reason i cannot tell you it is too hard for me but there's another i can i pity him he loves me so you will say i must tell him frankly what i think about our marriage i did tell him but he replied don't speak it kills me be silent that is the second reason but the first one which you find hard to tell me i can tell you it's because your position in your family is terrible at the present time it is tolerable now no one torments me they are waiting for me to decide and they leave me almost entirely alone but this may not last very long they will begin to bring pressure upon you what then nothing i have thought about it and made up my mind what to do i shall not stay here any longer i can be an actress what an enviable life it is liberty liberty and applause yes that's also pleasant but the main thing is liberty to do what i please to live as i please not asking anybody for anything not be dependent on anybody that's the way i want to live that is true that is good now i want to ask you something i will find out how this can be done to whom application must be made shall i thank you vierotchka pressed his hand do it very soon i want to tear myself away as quick as i can from this miserable intolerable and degrading situation i say i am calm i can bear it but is it so in reality don't i see what is done with my good name don't i know what all those who are here think of me they say she's a schemer she's cunning she wants to be rich she wants to get into fine society to shine she will keep her husband under the shoe twist him around her little finger deceive him don't i know that they think this about me i don't want to live so no indeed suddenly she fell into deep thought don't laugh because i said i pity him he loves me so does he love you does he look at you the same way that i do or not has he such a look your eyes are frank honest no your look does not offend me you see vira pavlovna it is because but no matter does he look so vierotchka blushed and made no reply then he does not love you that is not love vira pavlovna but vierotchka did not finish her sentence but stopped you were going to say what is it then if it is not love let that go but you yourself say that is not love whom do you love best of all i am not speaking of this kind of love but of your relations your friends it seems to me no one in particular none of them very much but no not long ago i met a very peculiar woman she spoke very badly to me called herself very hard names she forbade me to keep up my acquaintance with her we met in a very extraordinary way she said that if ever i found myself in such need that i was in danger of dying then only i might come to her but not otherwise i loved her very much would you want her to do anything for you that would be disagreeable or injurious for her vierotchka smiled but how could it be so but no now imagine that you were very very much in need of her help and that she said to you if i do this for you it would torment me would you repeat your request would you insist on it i would sooner die now you just told me that you loved her but this love is only feeling not a passion and what is love passion and how can you distinguish passion from simple feeling by its strength consequently if when one is moved by simple feeling which is weak very weak compared to passion love places you in such relations to a man that you say i would rather die than be the cause of torment to him if a simple feeling speaks so what will passion say which is a thousandfold stronger it will say i will sooner die then not ask not demand but even admit that any man should do anything for me except what is agreeable to himself i would sooner die than admit the possibility of his doing anything for my sake under compulsion or at inconvenience to himself such a passion speaking this way is love 
but passion that speaks otherwise is passion and not love i am going home now i have told you everything vira pavlovna Yerochka pressed his hand au revoir but why don't you congratulate me to-day is my birthday lopukhov looked at her maybe maybe if you have not made this mistake then i am glad end of part two chapter four recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter five of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter five how soon this came how unexpected thinks vierotchka alone in her room at the close of the evening we spoke for the first time and yet we became such good friends half an hour before not to know each other and in an hour's time to become such good friends how strange no it is not strange at all vierotchka people like lopukhov have magical words which attract to them every abused and persecuted creature it is their bride that whispers such words into their ears but here is something that is indeed strange vierotchka but not for you and me that you are so calm here people think that love is an exciting feeling and you will fall asleep as gently as a child and you will be neither frightened nor disturbed by dreams you may dream of happy childish games forfeits tag or maybe dances also gay and unconcerned it seems strange to some people but you do not know that it is strange and i know that it is not strange agitation in love does not point to love agitation in it is something that should not exist for love in itself is joyous and unconcerned how strange this is thinks vierotchka here i myself again and again have thought and felt all that he said about the poor and about women and how one should love where could i have got my ideas or was it in the books which i have read no there is nothing of the sort there what i found in books was either doubts or reservations and everything like this seemed extraordinary incredible like ideals that are good but are impossible to be realized and all this seems to me so simple simpler than anything else a perfectly ordinary thing it cannot help being it must be so surely more surely than anything else and i used to think that those were the best books now here is georges sand such a good and noble woman and yet she thinks that these ideas are only visionary and our own writers but no our writers have nothing of the kind at all or take dickens he has something of the sort but it seems as though he did not hope for it at all as though he only wished that it might be for he is kind-hearted but he is sure that it cannot be but how is it that they don't know that this cannot help being that this state of things must actually come about that it will be accomplished without fail that no one will be poor or unfortunate but don't they say this no they only feel pity but they think that in reality things will remain as they are at present possibly a trifle better but not much and these thoughts of mine they don't express them if they did i should have known that kind and sensible people also think so but here i have been imagining that it is only i who had such thoughts it's because i am a dull young girl how absurd to think that besides my stupid self no one else has had such thoughts that no one else expects this new order of things but he says that his bride explains to every one who loves her that all these things will come about as it seems to me they will and she explains it to them so plainly that all of them have begun to strive to have it realized as soon as possible what a sensible bride he has but who is she i must find out surely i shall find out yes it will be a good thing when there should be no more poor people won't oppress each other then all will be joyous kind and happy and hereupon vierotchka fell asleep and slept soundly and saw nothing in her dreams no vierotchka it is not strange that you have thought over and taken all this to heart you who are a simple-hearted young girl and have not even heard the names of those men who have begun to teach this and prove that this must be so that this must come about without fail that this cannot help being 
it is not strange that you have understood and taken to heart the thoughts which your books have failed to present plainly to you your books were written by men who were only beginning to learn these ideas when they were only ideas these ideas seemed wonderful and fascinating and nothing more now vierotchka these ideas are plainly seen to be realizable and other books are written by other people who find that these ideas are excellent that there is nothing wonderful in them and vierotchka these ideas are floating in the air like a perfume from the fields in flower time they penetrate everywhere you have heard them even from your tipsy mother who told you that it was necessary to live and why it was necessary to live by deceit and theft she wanted to speak against your ideas but she herself gave them greater development you heard them from the cynical ruined french girl who drags her lover after her like a chambermaid does whatever she pleases with him yet as soon as she comes to her senses she finds that she has no will of her own that she must please compel herself though it is very hard for her and yet it would seem would it not that her life with the kind refined and complacent serge is easy and pleasant and yet she says even for me bad woman as i am such relations are detestable nowadays it is not difficult to adopt such ideas as you have but others do not take them to heart as you have this is good but there is nothing strange about it is there anything strange in the fact that you want to be free and happy now such a desire god knows what a head-splitting discovery this is god knows what a step forward it is towards heroism but here is something strange Virochka, that there are some people who have no such desire who have other desires and it may probably seem strange to such people that on the first evening of your love you fell asleep with such thoughts that from the thought of yourself of your sweetheart of your love you turn to the thoughts that all people must be happy and that it is necessary to bring about its accomplishment as soon as possible and do you not know that it is strange and i do know that it is not strange that it is both natural and human i feel joy and happiness consequently i want all people to feel joyful and happy but humanely speaking both thoughts are the same you are a good girl you are not a stupid girl but excuse me if i do not find anything wonderful in you maybe half the girls whom i have known and whom i know and maybe more than half i have not counted them they are too many to count are not worse than you and some of them are even better excuse me it seems to lopukhov that you are a wonderful girl so it is but it is not wonderful that it seems to him so because he has fallen in love with you and there is nothing wonderful in the fact that he loves you it is quite possible to love you and if he loves you then it must seem to him that you are wonderful end of part two chapter five recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter six of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter six during the time of the first quadrille marya alexyevna was continually dogging her daughter and the tutor but during the second quadrille she did not show herself near them but was busy in her capacity as hostess in the preparation of the supper after her preparations were made she asked for the tutor but the tutor was gone two days later the tutor came to give his lesson the samovar was placed on the table and matryona came to call fyodor while he was giving the boy his lesson he was interrupted by marya alexyevna entering the room the tutor preferred to remain in his place because it was not his custom to drink tea with them and besides he was going to look over fyodor's copybook but marya alexyevna asked him to come in because she wanted to have a talk with him so he went and sat down at the tea-table marya alexyevna began to ask him about fyodor's capacity about the best gymnasium for him and whether it would not be better to place the boy in the gymnasium boarding-house these questions were very natural but were they not made too soon during this conversation she so sincerely and politely begged the tutor to take tea with them that lopukhov concluded to break his rule he took the glass 
Yerochka did not make her appearance for some time. At last she came in. She and the tutor bowed to each other as though there were nothing between them, and Marya Alexyevna continued to speak about Fyodor. Then abruptly she turned the conversation to the tutor himself. She asked him who he was, what he was, what relations he had, whether they were rich, how he lived, and how he intended to live. The tutor answered laconically and indefinitely that he had relatives, that they lived in the provinces, that they were not very well to do, that he supported himself by giving lessons, that he intended to practice medicine in Petersburg. In a word, Marya Alexyevna gained very little information from what he said. Determining to break through his reserve, Marya Alexyevna went at the matter more directly. Now you say that you intend to practice medicine here, and thank God the city doctors are able to make a living. Have you thought yet of setting up a family? I mean, have you found a girl yet? What does she mean? The tutor had almost forgotten about his ideal bride, and he had it on his lips to say, I have no one in view as yet. But he suddenly remembered. Ah, of course she overheard. It put him into a ridiculous dilemma. What a piece of work I made of it. Why did I make up such an allegory when it wasn't in the least necessary? Nouveau, go to. They say that it's dangerous to take part in a propaganda. Now hear how my propaganda influenced Vera Pavlovna, though her heart is pure and disposed to no ill. Knew she must have overheard and understood, but what business is that of mine? Yes, I have a girl in view. Are you engaged to her yet? I am. Are you formally engaged, or is it only a tacit understanding between you? We are formally engaged. Poor Marya Alexyevna. She had caught the words, my bride, your bride, I love her very much, she is a beauty, and her solicitude, lest the tutor were flirting with her daughter, was allayed. And so, during the second quadrille, she was able entirely to put her mind on the care of preparing the supper. But she wanted to hear the details of this reassuring story more circumstantially and particularly. She kept on with her cross-examination. All people like such reassuring conversation. At all events, it satisfies curiosity, and one likes to know everything. The tutor gave satisfactory answers, though, according to his wont, they were very brief is your bride pretty uncommonly has she a dowry a very large one how large very large as much as a hundred thousand oh, much more than that how much more there's no use telling that it is large enough in cash some of it in money some of it in estates also yes there's landed property soon soon you mean you are going to be married soon yes that is right dmitri sergeitch get married before she comes into her property and so get rid of the crowd of men that'll be after her money perfectly right how it is that god sent you such good luck while other men have no such luck at all it's so but almost nobody knows that she is such an heiress and you found out i did how was it you did to tell the truth i had long been on the lookout for such a chance and at last i found it and you haven't made any mistake certainly not i've seen the documents seen them yourself i myself that was the first step i took was that the way you said about it of course a man who is in his right mind does not take any risks without proofs that's true dmitri sergeitch no one does what good luck it must have been an answer to your parents prayers it must be so Marya Alexyevna had taken a fancy to the tutor from the time when she found out that he did not drink up her tea. It was apparent from everything that he was a man of solid character, with a firm basis of sense. He had little to say, so much the better, he was not empty-headed, and whatever he said was to the point, especially in regard to money. But since the evening of the party, she saw that the tutor was a godsend, on account of his absolute disinclination to flirt with the girls, in the families where he gave lessons such an absolute disinclination can rarely be found among young men but now she was at the height of her satisfaction with him indeed what a splendid man he is and he had never boasted that he was going to marry a rich bride it was necessary to draw out every word with pinchers and what keen scent he had apparently he must have made up his mind long ago that he would find a rich bride and how he must have flattered her Knew 
this young man i may say knows how to manage his affairs and he set to work by getting hold of the documents how sensibly he talks about it he says that no one in his right mind can do such things without documents he's a young man of rare good sense vierotchka could hardly restrain herself from smiling too frankly but gradually it seemed to her but how did it seem to her no it can't be so yes it must be he must be speaking not to marya alexievna though he answers her questions but to her vierotchka that he is making fun of marya alexievna that the seriousness and the truth which underlies what he says is meant only for her vierotchka whether it only seemed so to vierotchka or whether it was really so who can say he knew and she afterwards found out but for the rest of us perhaps there is no need of knowing for we want only facts and the fact was that vierotchka as she listened to lopukhov at first smiled but afterwards became serious and imagined that he was speaking not with marya alexievna but with her not in jest but in earnest and marya alexievna who had taken in solemn earnest all that lopukhov said from the beginning turned to vierotchka and said vierotchka my dear what's become of your thoughts you are acquainted now with dmitri sergeitch you'd better ask him to play your accompaniment for you and give us a song by this she meant to intimate we have great respect for you dmitri sergeitch and we want you to be a good friend in our family and you vierotchka don't be coy to dmitri sergeitch i'm going to tell mikhail ivanovitch that he's got a bride of his own and mikhail ivanovitch will not be jealous of him this was what was meant to be understood by vierotchka and dmitri sergeitch he was now in marya alexievna's thoughts not the tutor but dmitri sergeitch but for marya alexievna herself these words had a third interpretation which was very natural and real we must flatter him a little his acquaintance may be of some use to us by and by when he is to be rich the rascal this was the general signification of marya alexievna's word for herself but beside the general signification there was also a special thought when i have flattered him a little i will tell him that we are poor people that it is hard for me to pay him a silver rouble a lesson so many different meanings were in marya alexievna's words dmitri sergeitch said that he would finish his lesson first and then it would give him pleasure to play on the piano end of part two chapter six recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter seven of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter seven marya alexievna's words had many interpretations and they were not less fecund in results on the side of the special signification that is as regarded the reduction in the price of the lessons marya alexievna attained greater success than she anticipated when after two more lessons she insinuated that they were poor people dmitri sergeitch at first stuck to his price stuck to it strenuously for a long time he did not yield long insisted on his three paper roubles it must be remembered that at this time the three rouble note was worth only seventy kopecks marya alexievna did not expect to beat down his price but contrary to all her expectations succeeded in reducing the price to sixty kopecks a lesson apparently the special signification of her words the hope of beating down the price contradicted her high opinion of dmitri sergeitch not of lopukhov but of dmitri sergeitch as of a man shrewd in money matters what would make a man who was a keen financier give in about money on account of our poverty and if dmitri sergeitch did yield then consequently one would be disappointed in him and find in him a short-sighted man and therefore a man to be avoided of course she would judge that way in the case of a stranger but human beings are so created that it is hard for them to judge of their own affairs according to the general rule a man is extremely apt to make exceptions in his own favour what can be done with this peculiarity of the human heart 
it is bad it is injurious but marya alexyevna was unfortunately not exempted from this fault which is the almost universal affliction of the penurious of the sneaks and of the wicked there is salvation from it in only two extreme and opposite kinds of moral right a man may reach such a lofty plane of transcendental rascality that he becomes the eighth wonder of the world for his virtuosity in crime like ali pasha yaninska jezar pasha of syria mahomet ali of egypt all of whom deceived the european diplomats and jezar deceived napoleon the great as though they were children when rascality has enclosed a man around with such an absolutely impregnable armour that it is absolutely impossible to reach any human weakness ambition love of honours love of command love of self or anything else he is safe but such heroes of rascality are very rare you can scarcely find them in the countries of europe where virtuosity in wickedness is destroyed by a good many weak points therefore if they show you a wily fellow and say this fellow cannot be deceived by any one boldly put up ten roubles against one that you although not so wily will mislead this wily fellow if you only make up your mind to do so and still more boldly put up one hundred roubles against one that he himself is leading himself by the nose in some direction or other because it is the most ordinary and characteristic feature in the wily to be led in some direction or other by the nose how artful in all appearance were louis philippe and metternich and how nicely they led themselves by the nose out of paris and vienna into golden and lovely places of bucolic calmness and enjoyed the picture of makar driving his calves and napoleon i what a wily rascal he was wilier than louis philippe and metternich taken together and yet they say that with all his wiliness he had a genial temper and thus how masterly he led himself by the nose to elba nay he even wanted to go further and dragged himself by the nose to st helena how unlikely it seemed at first almost impossible but he succeeded at last in overthrowing all the obstacles in the way of reaching the island of st helena just read over the history of the campaign of eighteen fifteen and you will see with what energy and skill he dragged himself by the nose alas and even Maria Alexeyevna was not exempted from this injurious tendency. There are few people for whom the armor against temptation serves as an absolute protection from the deception of others. But on the other hand, there are a good many people for whom simple honesty of heart serves as a protection against such deception. According to the testimony of Vidox and Johnny Keynes, there is nothing harder than to deceive an honest, sincere man if he has some common sense and knowledge of the world bright honest men who have their wits about them are not liable to temptation individually but they have in one respect a weakness that is injurious when taken altogether they are subject to deception a rascal is not able to lead any one of them by the nose but the noses of them taken collectively are always ready for use but the rascals whose noses individually are weak cannot be led by the nose in this consists the whole mystery of the history of the world but to branch off into the history of the world is not necessary when you are writing a novel go ahead with your novel the first result of marya alexeyevna's words was the cheapening of the lessons the second result was that by getting the tutor cheaper that is not the tutor but dmitri sergeyitch marya alexeyevna was still more confirmed in her good opinion of him as a man of solidity she even came to the conviction that conversation with him would be profitable for Virochka his influence will dispose Virochka to marry mikhail ivanovitch this conclusion was extremely brilliant and marya alexeyevna would probably not have reached it by her own wit but she met with such plain proof that she could not help noticing dmitri sergeyitch's good influence over Virochka. how this was proved to her we shall soon see the third result of marya alexeyevna's words was that Virochka and dmitri sergeyitch began under her encouragement and permission to spend considerable time together after he had finished giving his lessons towards eight o'clock lopukov used to stay for two or three hours longer at the rosalskys he played cards with the mother of the family and the bridegroom he talked with them he played on the piano and virochka would sing or virochka played and he would listen sometimes he spoke with virochka and marya alexeyevna did not interfere 
was not angry although of course she did not leave them without her supervision oh of course she did not leave them absolutely to themselves because although dmitri sergeitch was a very proper young man still the proverb does not say in vain don't hide things carelessly and you won't lead a thief into sin dmitri sergeitch is a thief there is no doubt about it but it is not said by way of blame but on the contrary otherwise there wouldn't be any reason for respecting him and making him a friend of the family would there is there any sense of making the acquaintance of fools of course it is well to make the acquaintance of fools sometimes when you can take advantage of them but dmitri sergeitch has nothing to his name as yet it must be therefore that they are friendly with him only because of his good qualities that is for his sense solidity prudence and skill in managing his own affairs and if every one has the deuce knows what in his mind then such a clever man must have more than others consequently we must look and look at dmitri sergeitch and marya alexievna studied him very industriously and energetically but all her observations only corroborated her opinion of dmitri sergeitch's solidity and good character for instance how can one tell amorous intentions by noticing the way in which a young man looks at a girl here vierotchka is playing and dmitri sergeitch is standing and listening and marya alexievna is watching the direction in which he turns his eyes but sometimes he does not even look at vierotchka he looks anywhere else or sometimes when he is looking at her he looks so innocently so indifferently into her face that it can quickly be seen that he is looking at her only out of politeness and is thinking of his bride's dowry his eyes do not burn like mikhail ivanovitch's again how can the existence of love be detected by caressing words but in this case no caressing words are heard and they really speak very little together he talks by preference with marya alexievna or here for instance he began to bring vierotchka books once vierotchka went to see a friend and mikhail ivanovitch was at the rosalskys marya alexievna took the books that the tutor brought and handed them to mikhail ivanovitch just look here mikhail ivanovitch this french i almost understand by myself this word gostinaya meaning drawing-room of course it must be a book about manners ain't it but the german one i don't understand no marya alexievna that word is not gostinaya but destine fate what kind of a fate is it a novel that's called so or is it a sort of oracle or fortune book we will quickly find out marya alexievna from the book itself mikhail ivanovitch turned several of the leaves it seems to speak mostly about series and things i guess it is a scientific book about serious things that is good no series what series oh yes banknotes then it's something about managing money yes that's it marya alexievna nu no. what's the german one mikhail ivanovitch read slowly concerning religion works of ludwig oh yes ludwig the fourteenth marya alexievna this is the work of louis the fourteenth he was a french king marya alexievna the father of the king in whose place napoleon is reigning now then it must be a theological work yes i think so that is good mikhail ivanovitch yes indeed i knew it dmitri sergeitch is a reliable young man still one must keep his eyes sharp on any young man of course he has no bad intentions in his mind but for all that i am extremely grateful to you marya alexievna for keeping your eyes open one's got to do so i am on the watch mikhail ivanovitch it is a mother's duty to keep her daughters straight and i pledge you my honour as far as vierotchka is concerned but there's one thing occurs to me mikhail ivanovitch what belief did that french king hold catholic naturally then don't he try to convert folks into the papistry i don't think so marya alexievna if he had been a catholic bishop then of course he would have tried to make converts but a king would not spend his time that way as a wise ruler and politician he'd simply teach virtue what else marya alexievna could not help seeing that mikhail ivanovitch with all his narrow mind argued the case very skilfully but for all that she cleared up the matter with perfect satisfaction two or three days later she suddenly said to lopukov while playing with him rather than with mikhail ivanovitch tell me dmitri sergeitch i want to ask you something the father of the last french king the very man in whose shoes the present napoleon is reigning did he make folks get converted into the religion of the pope no he did not marya alexievna 
is the pope's religion good dmitri sergeitch no it is not marya alexeyevna i play seven of diamonds i just asked out of curiosity dmitri sergeitch being as i'm an ignorant woman and it is interesting to know you are taking a good many tricks dmitri sergeitch it can't be helped marya alexeyevna we are taught at the medical school to play cards well a doctor must know how to take tricks lopukhov is puzzled to this day to know why marya alexeyevna wanted to know whether philippe egalite ordered folks to be baptized in the religion of the pope well how after all this could it be wondered at that marya alexeyevna stopped wearying herself by perpetual supervision he keeps his eyes where they should be his face has shown no amorous susceptibilities he gives her theological books to read that ought to be enough but no marya alexeyevna was not satisfied but she even managed to put him to a test as though she had studied the logic which i have learned by heart and which says the observations of phenomena must be made by means of experiments carried on in a skilful plan if one would have the most thorough penetration into the secrets of such relations and she so managed to bring about this trial as though she had read saxon's grammar which tells how hamlet was tempted by ophelia in the grove End of part two, chapter seven. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part two, chapter eight of A Vital Question, or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, 1852 to 1935, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter eight the temptation of hamlet one day at tea marya alexeyevna said that she had a headache after serving the tea and locking up the sugar bowl she went away and retired vera and lopukhov remained sitting in the tea-room which adjoined the bedroom where marya alexeyevna had gone after a few minutes she sent a message by fyodor tell your sister that their talk keeps me from going to sleep let him go somewhere else so as not to bother me say it politely so as not to offend dmitri sergeitch you see what good care he takes of you fyodor went and told what his mother wanted let us go to my room dmitri sergeitch it is away from mother's bedroom and we shall not be disturbed of course this was what marya alexeyevna expected at the end of a quarter of an hour she crept in her stocking feet up to the door of yurochka's room the door was ajar between the door and the jam was a splendid crack marya alexeyevna applied her eyes to it and strained her ears this was the sight that she saw in yurochka's rooms were two windows between them stood a writing-table yurochka was sitting near one window knitting a woolen chest protector for her father religiously fulfilling marya alexeyevna's command at the other window at the other end of the table lopukhov was sitting he was leaning with one elbow on the table he had a cigar in his hand his other hand was thrust in his pocket the distance between vierotchka and him was not less than two arshins vierotchka was looking most of the time at her knitting lopukhov was looking most of the time at his cigar this was a gratifying state of things the conversation that she overheard was as follows is it necessary to look at life in this way these were the first words that marya alexeyevna caught yes vira pavlovna it is necessary then cold practical people must tell the truth when they say that men are governed only by selfish motives they tell the truth what are called the higher feelings ideal aspirations all these in the general course of life are absolutely nothing in comparison with the inspiration felt by every one to do things for his own interests at bottom the impulse even for the others is caused by selfishness da yeah. are you for example of the same sort what do you suppose vira pavlovna just listen and see what is the essential motive of all my life the essence of my life hitherto has consisted in study and preparation to be a doctor excellent why did my father send me to school he used constantly to repeat to me study mitya when you have finished your course you will be a chinovnik you will be able to support me and your mother and it will be good for you too and that was the reason that i studied 
without that motive my father would never have let me study you see my family was in need of a wage winner da and i myself though i am fond of study would not have spent time on it would i if i had not thought that the expenditure would have been paid back with interest after i got through school i urged my father to send me to the medical academy instead of making me a chinovnik how did that come about father and i saw that medical men live much better than civil chinovniks and the heads of departments and i could not get any higher rank than that and that was why i got the means and went to the medical school it stood for bread and butter without this in view i should not have gone to the medical school and should not have stayed in it but you loved to study while you were at school and have you not liked medical science yes it is an ornament and it is also profitable but success is generally won without this ornament while without a motive never love for science was only a result arising from a certain state of things it was not the cause the cause was just one thing self-interest let us suppose that you are right yes you are right all actions that i can remember can be explained by self-interest but this theory is cold theory must by necessity be cold the mind must judge of things coldly but it is merciless yes to fancies that are empty and injurious but it is prosaic science does not care for a poetical form and so this theory which i cannot help admitting brings people into a cold merciless and prosaic life no vira pavlovna this theory is cold but it teaches a man to bring out the warmth a match is cold the matchbox on which you scratch the match is also cold but there is fire in them which gets a man warm food and warms him also this theory is merciless but if it is followed people will not become the wretched objects of idle charity the lancet must not bend otherwise it will be necessary to pity the patient who will suffer none the less because of your sympathy this theory is prosaic but it reveals true motives of life and poetry in the truth of life why is shakespeare the greatest poet because he is true to life and has less illusion than other poets so am i also going to be pitiless dmitri sergeyitch said vierotchka smiling don't be drawn away by the thought that you have in me an obstinate opponent of your self-interest theory and that you have converted me to be a new disciple i myself long ago felt the same thing especially after i read your book and heard it from you but i thought that these were my individual ideas that clever and scientific men thought otherwise and so i was in doubt all that we used to read was written in a spirit of contrariety it was full of adverse criticisms of sarcastic attacks upon what we used to see in ourselves and others nature life reason lead you one direction books drag you the other they say this is mean contemptible do you know i myself saw the absurdity of the arguments which i myself brought up yes so they were absurd vira pavlovna well then said she laughing we are making each other wonderful compliments i say to you you dmitri sergeyitch please don't lift your nose so high you say to me you are ridiculous with your doubts vira pavlovna at any rate said he also laughing we have no selfish interest in making love to each other and therefore we don't make love all right dmitri sergeyitch people are egotistical aren't they you were speaking about yourself and now i want to speak about myself of course men think about themselves most of all very good now let us see if you will put this into practice let us see a rich man wants to marry me i don't like him must i accept his offer consider what is for your best advantage my best advantage you know that i am very poor on one side is my dislike of the man on the other i should have the upper hand of him an enviable position in society money a crowd of worshippers weigh everything choose what would be most advantageous and if i choose the husband's wealth and the crowd of worshippers i shall say that you have chosen that which seemed more correspondent with your interests and what ought to be said about myself if you have acted coolly after mature deliberation it will have to be said that you have done wisely and probably you will not be sorry for it but would my choice deserve condemnation people who talk all sorts of nonsense will speak about it as they please but people who look upon life from a reasonable standpoint will say that you have done as you ought 
If you have done so, it will show that such was your individuality that you could not have acted otherwise, circumstances being as they are. They will say that you have acted under the necessity of things, that properly speaking you could not have had any other choice. And no condemnation whatever for my actions? Who has the right to condemn the results of a fact when the fact itself is in existence? Your individuality in the given circumstances is a fact. Your actions are the essential, unavoidable results of this fact, arising from the nature of things. You are not responsible for them, and to condemn them is absurd. Well, I see you stick to your theory, and so I shall not deserve your condemnation if I accept the rich man's offer. I should be a fool if I condemned it and so your permission i might say your approval i might even say your direct advice is to do as i have said there is always one thing to advise reason out what is for your best if you do that you have my approval thank you now the personal case is decided let us return to the first that is the general question we began by saying that a man acts from necessity his actions are determined by the influence from which they take their rise the stronger motives always predominating our arguments went thus when an action has vital importance the stimulus is called self-interest its interaction in man is the calculation of self-interest and therefore a man must always act in accordance with the motive of self-interest do i express the thread of the thought perfectly you see what a good pupil i am now this private question about the actions that have an important bearing upon life is settled but in the general question there remain some difficulties yet your book says that a man acts from necessity but there are cases when it seems that it depends upon my will to act in this way or in that for instance i am playing and i turn the leaves of the music i turn them sometimes with my left hand sometimes with my right hand let us suppose that i have turned them now with the right hand why could i not have done it with my left hand does it not depend upon my own will no vira pavlovna when you are turning the leaves not thinking which hand you use you turn them with the hand that is most convenient there is no will about it if you think let me turn them with my right hand you then turn them under the influence of this thought but this thought itself was not a matter of your will but was engendered unavoidably by others at this word marya alexeyevna ceased to listen nu no, they are spending their time over science that ain't in my line it ain't necessary either what a wise intelligent and i may say noble young man he is what reasonable advice he gives vierotchka and that shows that he is a learned man now here i go and tells her the same things she does not listen she gets offended i can't suit her because i don't know how to speak scientific enough but here when he speaks scientific she listens and sees that it is the truth and she agrees with it da it is said not in vain knowledge is light ignorance darkness if i had been a well-educated woman would it have been with me as it is now i'd have got my husband into favour with the generals i would have got a place for him in the department of supplies or somewhere else just as good no of course i should have done the business myself with the contractors the idea of his doing it rubbish i'd have built a much better house than this i'd have bought more than a thousand souls but now i cannot it is necessary to get a recommendation first in the society of generals and how can i do that i can't speak french nor any other language of theirs they'll say she ain't got any manners all she's good for is to make an uproar on the haymarket so i am no good ignorance is darkness indeed knowledge is light ignorance is darkness now it was just this conversation that marya alexeyevna had overheard that brought her to the conviction that dmitri sergeitch's conversation was not only not dangerous for vierotchka she had been inclined to think that before but was even likely to do her good to lighten her own labours in overcoming vierotchka's foolish inexperienced girlish thoughts and hasten the mystical benediction in the affair with mikhail ivanovitch End of part two, chapter eight, recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part two, chapter nine of A Vital Question, or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five, and others. 
this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatria in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter nine the relations of marya alexyevna to lopukhov resemble a farce marya alexyevna's character is exposed by them in a ridiculous way both these facts are quite against my will if i had wanted to preserve a high standard of art i should have concealed marya alexyevna's relations to lopukhov the description of which gives this part of my story the nature of a vaudeville to hide them would have been easy the essential element of the matter could have been expressed without them would it have been at all surprising if the tutor even if he had not entered into this friendship with marya alexyevna had found occasion sometimes though seldom to say a few words with the daughter of a family where he is giving lessons does it take many words to engender love there was no need of marya alexyevna putting in a hand to help along this result which was brought about by the meeting of yerochka with lopukhov but i am telling this story not as it would be necessary if i wanted to win an artistic reputation but simply in accordance with the facts as a novelist i am very sorry because i have written several pages which are on the low level of a vaudeville my design of relating the case as it was and not as it would have been if i had followed my inclinations also causes me another unpleasantness i am very much dissatisfied because marya alexyevna is represented in a ridiculous way with her conceptions of lopukhov's bride as he described her with her fantastic guessing about the contents of the books which lopukhov gave yerochka with her reasoning about philippe egalite trying to convert folks to the faith of the pope and her ideas of the works written by king louis the fourteenth every one is liable to error mistakes may be stupid if a man judges of matters which are foreign to his experience but it would be unjust to conclude from these stupid blunders made by marya alexyevna that her disposition to lopukhov was founded entirely on these blunders not at all not for a moment would any fantastic ideas of a rich bride or the goodness of philippe egalite have obscured her common sense if in lopukhov's actual words and actions had anything suspicious been noticeable but in point of fact he behaved himself in such a way that according to marya alexyevna's opinion only a man after her own heart could behave himself now here was a brave young man who did not allow his eyes to gaze impudently at a very pretty young girl he did not pay her ambiguous attentions he was always willing to play cards with marya alexyevna he never said that he would rather sit with vira pavlovna he discussed matters in a spirit that seemed to marya alexyevna in accordance with her own spirit like her he said that everything in the world is done for self-interest that when a cheat cheats there is no need of getting excited and crying out about the principles of honesty which such a cheat is bound to observe that a cheat is not a cheat without good reason that he was made such by his environment that not to be a cheat leaving aside the impossibility of not being a cheat would have been stupid that is simply foolish on his part yes marya alexyevna was right when she found a resemblance between her and lopukhov i appreciate how deeply lopukhov is compromised in the eyes of the civilized public by the sympathy shown by marya alexyevna in his way of thinking but i do not want to flatter any one and i don't conceal this circumstance though it is so injurious to lopukhov's reputation although i confess that it was in my power to conceal lopukhov's relations with the rozalsky family i will say even more i myself will even undertake to explain that he even actually deserved marya alexyevna's good will in point of fact it appears from the conversation between lopukhov and vierotchka that the style of his thinking would far more easily seem good to people of marya alexyevna's stamp than to eloquent partisans of various beautiful ideas lopukhov saw things in exactly the same light as they appear to the great mass of the human race with the exception of the partisans of beautiful ideas if marya alexyevna could repeat with satisfaction what she herself had heard of lopukhov's advice to vierotchka in regard to storeshnikov's offer he likewise would take satisfaction in adding right to her drunken confession to vierotchka 
the resemblance between their conceptions was so striking that enlightened and noble novelists journalists and other instructors of our public would long ago have declared that people of lopukhov's stamp differ in no respect from people of marya alexievna's stamp if such enlightened and noble writers so understand lopukhov's stamp could we really condemn marya alexievna because she could find in lopukhov nothing but what our best writers teachers and philosophers find in people of his stamp of course if marya alexievna had known half of what these writers knew she would have had sufficient cause to understand that lopukhov is bad company for her but aside from the fact that she was an uneducated woman she has still another excuse for mistake lopukhov did not give her the full benefit of his ideas he was a propagandist but not such an one as the lovers of fine ideas who are always anxious to give marya alexievna the benefit of the noble conceptions by which they themselves are enlightened he had enough good sense not to try to straighten a fifty-year-old tree they both accepted facts in the same way and so discussed them like a man with a theoretical education he could draw from facts such conclusions as were impossible to marya alexievna and her similars who do not know anything beyond personal everyday cares and current aphorisms of popular wisdom proverbs sayings and the folklore which is old archaic and even stale but they could never reach his conclusions if for instance he had begun to explain what he meant by the word self-interest which he used when talking with virotchka marya alexievna would have made a grimace seeing that self-interest as he understood it was not the same as self-interest as she understood it but lopukhov did not explain this to marya alexievna and neither was there any explanation of it in his talk with virotchka because virotchka knew the meaning of the word as she had seen it used in those books which started the conversation of course it is also true that while saying you are right to marya alexievna's drunken confession lopukhov would have added to the word right these words according to your own confession marya alexievna the new order of things is much better than the old and i have nothing against those who are trying to make the reform and get pleasure out of it but as far as the stupidity of the people is concerned which you regard as a hindrance against the new order then of course i must agree with you but you yourself will not deny marya alexievna that people soon get educated and they see that it is to their advantage to do what before they could not see any need of doing you will also agree that hitherto they have had no way of learning sense and reason but give them this possibility and why of course they will take advantage of it but he never went as far as this in speaking with marya alexievna and that too not from carefulness though he was very careful but simply from the very good reason of his common sense and politeness which also prevented him from talking to her in latin and from tiring her ears with arguments about the latest advances in medicine though such subjects were interesting to him he possessed so much politeness and delicacy that he would not torment a person with declamations which are not understood by that person now while i say all this to justify marya alexievna's oversight in not finding out in time what sort of man lopukhov really was i don't say it to justify lopukhov himself to justify lopukhov would not be the right thing and why it would not be the right thing you will see as you go on those who could not justify him but yet from their sense of humanity would forgive could not forgive him for instance they might allege for his excuse that he was a medical man and was occupied with natural sciences and that disposes to a materialistic view but such an excuse is very poor there are very many sciences that lead to such a view aren't there mathematical and historical and political and many others of all sorts but are all geometricians astronomers all historians political economists lawyers journalists and all other scientific people materialists not by a long chalk consequently lopukhov is not to be excused for his fault those who sympathize with him but do not justify him could also say for his excuse that he is not entirely lacking in praiseworthy characteristics he made up his mind conscientiously and resolutely to renounce all material advantages and honors so as to work for the benefit of others finding that the pleasure to be derived from such work was most beneficial for him he looked at a girl who was so beautiful that he fell in love with her with purer eyes than if she had been his sister 
but in reply to this excuse for his materialism it must be said that it is universally true that there is no man so depraved as not to show some signs of good and that materialists of whatever character remain materialists still and this itself proves decidedly that they are immoral and degraded people who cannot be excused because to excuse them would be to encourage materialism and so while not justifying lopukhov it is also impossible to excuse him and to justify him is also not the right thing because the lovers of fine ideas and the defenders of higher aspirations who have declared that materialists are low and immoral people in these later days have so thoroughly recommended themselves in the matter of sense and also in the matter of character in the eyes of all respectable people whether materialists or not that to defend anybody from their censure has become a work of supererogation and to pay heed to their words has become even unseemly end of part two chapter nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter ten of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter ten of course the main subject of the conversations between lopukhov and vierotchka was not the question as to which fashion of ideas should be looked upon as the right one but as a rule they spoke with each other very little and their long talks which rarely occurred touched upon only outside matters such as ways of thinking and kindred topics they knew that two very vigilant eyes were on them and consequently in regard to the main thing that interested them they exchanged very few words and this was generally at the time when they were getting the music ready for playing or singing and this main topic which occupied so small a place in their infrequent long talks and even in their brief snatches of talk occupied but a small place this subject was not their feeling towards each other not at all they did not speak a word after the first indefinite words which were said at their first talk during the party they had no time to speak about it in the two or three minutes used for the exchange of thought without the fear of being overheard they had hardly time to speak about the other subject which was more important to them than their own thoughts and feelings and this was in regard to the ways and means by which virotchka could escape her terrible situation on the morning that followed his first conversation with her lopukhov took pains to find out how it would be possible for her to become an actress he knew that there were a good many risks and trials standing in the way of a girl going on the stage but he thought that with a firm character she might succeed all straight but it proved to be otherwise when he came to give his lesson two days later he was compelled to say to virotchka i advise you to give up the thought of becoming an actress why because it would be much better for you to accept storeshnikov's offer this ended the talk which was said while he and vierotchka were getting the music he about to play and she to sing vierotchka hung her head and several times lost the beat although the piece was very familiar to her when the piece was finished they began to consult what they should sing next and vierotchka found a chance to say it seemed to me that that was the very best and it's hard for me to hear that it is impossible it will be harder to live but still i shall find some way of living i will go out as governess when he was there again two days later she said i could not find any one through whom i could get the place of governess please keep your eyes open for me dmitri sergeitch there is no one but you i am sorry i have so few acquaintances who might help in this way all the families where i am giving or have given lessons are poor people and their acquaintances are about the same but i will do the best i can my friend i am wasting your time but what else can i do vira pavlovna there is no need of speaking about my time since i am your friend virotchka both smiled and blushed she herself did not notice how instead of calling him dmitri sergeitch she called him my friend lopukhov also smiled you did not mean to say it vira pavlovna 
take it back if you are sorry that you gave it to me Birotchka smiled it is too late and she blushed and i am not sorry and she blushed still more when need comes you will see that i am a true friend they pressed each other's hands you have here the two first conversations after that evening two days later there was in the police gazette an advertisement to this effect a girl of good family speaking french and german etc desires a place as governess inquiries can be made of the chinovnik so-and-so at kolomus n n street n n house now lopukhov was obliged to spend a great deal of his time in attending to vierotchka's affairs every morning he had to go for the most part on foot from vyvorgsky ward to kolomna to his friend whose address was given in the advertisement it was a long walk but he could not find any other friend who lived near the vyvorgsky ward it was necessary that the friend at whose home inquiries could be made should be subject to several conditions a respectable home good family circumstances a respectable appearance a poor domicile might lead to the offer of unfavourable conditions as a governess without respectability and apparently good family circumstances the girl's recommendation would not be looked upon favourably and lopukhov could not place his own address in the advertisement what would be thought of a girl who was cared for by no one besides a student and so lopukhov had to take an unusual amount of exercise after he had taken the addresses of those who came to inquire about the governess he had to continue his walk still farther the chinovnik told the inquirers that he was a distant relative of the girl and acted only as agent but that she had a nephew who would come the next day and give further particulars the nephew instead of going in a carriage went on foot looked at the people and of course as a general thing was dissatisfied with the surroundings in one family they put on too many airs in another the mother of the family was a good woman but the father was a fool and the third the opposite was true and so on in some it would be comfortable to live but the conditions would be impossible for vierotchka either it was necessary to speak english but english she does not speak or they did not want a governess but a nurse or the people were well enough in their way but they were themselves poor and there was no place in their apartment for a governess where there were already two grown children two little ones a maid and a nurse but the advertisement continued to appear in the police gazette and likewise the governess seekers and lopukhov did not lose hope in such a manner two weeks passed by on the fifth day of his hunt when lopukhov had returned from his walk and was lying down on his sofa kirsdnof said dmitri you are getting to be a bad assistant in my work you spend all your mornings out and the larger part of your afternoons and evenings you must have got a good many lessons to give haven't you can you spare the time to give them up just now i want to give up those that i have i have saved up forty roubles or so and that will be enough till i graduate and you have more than i have at least a hundred haven't you more a hundred and fifty i have no pupils though i have given them all up but one i have something that i must attend to if i accomplish it you will not be sorry that i am behind you in the work what is it you see the lesson which i have not given up is in a wretched family but there is a nice girl there she wants to be a governess so as to leave the family and so i am looking up a place for her a nice girl yes nu no, this is good look out and so the conversation ended eh messieurs kirsdnof and lopukhov you are learned men but you cannot imagine in what respect this is peculiarly good let us grant that what you have been talking about is good kirsdnof did not think of asking whether the girl were pretty and lopukhov did not think to say that she was kirsdnof did not think to say yes brother you must have fallen in love that you are so energetic in looking out for this girl lopukhov did not think of saying and i brother am very much interested in her or if he thought it and did not care to say it he certainly did not think to remark for the sake of turning aside suspicion don't imagine alexander that i am in love don't you see they both thought that when there was a chance to free a person from a bad situation it made very little difference whether that person possessed a handsome face or not even though the person were a young girl but in such a case there could be no discussion of falling in love or not falling in love they did not even think of thinking of it and what is best of all they did not notice that they were doing a noble action 
but however doesn't this prove to the sagacious class of readers it proves to the majority of literary men and this is composed of the most sagacious people doesn't it prove i say that kirsdnof and lopukhov were cold and deprived of all aesthetic sense this was not so very long ago a favourite expression among the aesthetic writers who had lofty ideals aesthetic sense may be even now fashionable i don't know how it is i have not seen it used for some time is it natural that young men who possess a spark of taste or a grain of heart can fail to be interested in the face when speaking of a girl of course these people have no artistic feeling that is aesthetic sense and according to the opinion of others who have learned human nature in circles which are richer in aesthetic feelings than the company of our aesthetic literati young men in such circumstances will invariably speak about young women from the plastic side gentlemen it used to be so but not now it is now true in certain instances but not with those young men who are alone regarded as the present generation gentlemen this is a peculiar generation end of part two chapter ten recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter eleven of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter eleven well my dear haven't you found any situation for me yet not yet vira pavlovna but don't despair we shall find one every day i go to see two or three families it is impossible that a respectable place will be not found at last where you can live ah but if you only knew my friend how hard how hard it is for me to remain here when there was no near possibility for me to escape from this degradation from this misery i kept myself by main force in a deathly apathy but now my friend it is too suffocating in this foul wretched atmosphere patience patience vira pavlovna we shall find something here is an example of their talk for a week tuesday patience patience vira pavlovna we shall find something my friend how much trouble this is causing you what a waste of time how can i repay you you will repay me my dear by not getting vexed lopukhov said this and became confused vierotchka looked at him no it was not that he did not finish his sentence he did not intend to add to it and he is waiting for her answer what should i be vexed about what have you done lopukhov became still more confused and seemed to be grieved what is the matter my friend to think you did not notice it at all he spoke so sorrowfully and then he laughed so gaily ah beau moi how stupid i am how stupid forgive me my friend nu no, what is the matter nothing you have already given me my reward ah what do you mean what a jester you are well all right you may call me so on thursday came the trial of hamlet according to saxon's grammar for several days after that marya alexievna takes some little though not much rest from her inspection saturday after tea marya alexievna goes out to count over the clothes which the laundress had brought my dear i think the matter will be successful really if that is so ach bourgeois ach bourgeois arrange it as soon as possible it seems to me that i shall die if this is to go on much longer when will it be and how it will be decided to-morrow the hope is almost almost certain what is it how is it keep calm my friend you'll be noticed here you are almost dancing with joy marya alexievna will be back after something if you don't look out well you are a fine fellow you came in so radiant that mamenka looked at you a long time at any rate i told her why i was happy i saw that it was necessary to tell her and so i said that i have found a splendid place you horrid horrid man here you keep cautioning me and you have not told me as yet a single thing what is it do tell me at last this morning kirsdnof you know my dear that my chum's name is kirsdnof i know you horrid horrid man i know 
now speak quick without any more nonsense you yourself are hindering me my friend ah boche moi and all these digressions without ever once coming to the point i don't know how i could punish you i will get you down on your knees yet it cannot be done here i command you to get down on your knees in your room as soon as you get home and i want your kirsdnof to look on and then send me a note saying that you were down on your knees do you hear what i am going to do with you very good i will get down on my knees and now i shall hold my peace after i have undergone my punishment and am forgiven i will speak i forgive you only speak you horrid man thank you you grant forgiveness when you yourself are to blame you yourself have made all the interruptions vira pavlovna why do you call me so i thought you were going to call me my friend yes i meant it as a reproach my friend i am a man easily offended and very severe a reproach how dare you make me reproaches i do not want to hear you you don't certainly i don't what is there for me to hear you have told me everything already that the matter will be arranged that it will be decided to-morrow you see my friend you yourself don't know anything more to-day what is there to hear good-bye my dear but listen to me my friend my friend do listen i am not going to listen i am going away she came back speak quick i will not interrupt you ah bouge moi she only knew how happy you have made me give me your hand see how warmly warmly i press it but why are your eyes full of tears i thank you i thank you this morning kirsdnof gave me the address of a lady who made an appointment for me to call on her to-morrow i am not personally acquainted with her but i have heard much about her from a mutual friend who acted as go-between i know her husband though we have met at our friends many times judging from all this i am sure that one could get along well in her family and when she gave her address to her friend she said that she was certain that we should agree about terms consequently the matter can be looked upon as almost absolutely settled ah how good it will be what joy murmured vierotchka but i want to have it settled soon as soon as possible will you come from her directly to us no my dear that would rouse suspicions i never come here except during lesson hours i'll do this way i will send a letter to marya alexeyevna by mail saying that i shall not be able to give the lesson on tuesday and shall have to postpone it till wednesday if the letter says wednesday morning you will understand that the matter is arranged if it says wednesday evening you will know that it has fallen through but it is almost certain to read in the morning marya alexeyevna will tell it to fyodor and to you and to pavel konstantinovitch when will the letter get here in the evening oh it's so long no i shall not have enough patience and then what shall i learn from the letter only yes and then i shall have to wait till wednesday it is torturing if it is yes i shall go and call on the lady as soon as i can i shall want to know all about it but how can it be managed that is the way i'll do i'll be waiting for you on the street when you leave that lady's my friend that would be still more risky than for me to call on you no it would be much better for me to call on you no perhaps it would be impossible for us to have a word together at any rate mamenka might become suspicious no it would be better as i suggested first i have such a thick veil that no one would recognize me through it well i admit that your plan seems feasible let me think there's no time to think mamenka may be here any minute where does the lady live on galernaya street near the bridge what time shall you call on her she appointed twelve o'clock at twelve i shall be sitting on the konogvardaisky boulevard on the last bench and at the end nearest the bridge i said that i would wear a thick veil but here's a sign for you i will carry a roll of music in my hand if i am not there on time you will know that i am detained but you sit down on that bench and wait i may be late but i shall be there without fail how well i have planned it how grateful i am to you how happy i shall be how is your bride dmitri sergeitch see i call you dmitri sergeitch instead of my friend how glad how glad i am vierotchka ran to the piano and began to play my dear what a degradation to art how ruinous to your taste to give up operas for galops certainly certainly in a few minutes marya alexeyevna returned dmitri sergeitch played two-handed preference with her at first he won then he allowed her to win 
he even lost thirty-five kopecks this was the first time and it filled her with victorious glory and when he went away he left her greatly pleased not so much on account of the money as on account of the victory there are purely ideal pleasures even for hearts soiled with materialism and this is proof positive that a materialistic explanation of life is unsatisfactory end of part two chapter eleven recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter twelve of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love in legal marriage chapter twelve vierotchka's first dream and vierotchka dreamed a dream she dreamed that she was locked up in a damp gloomy cellar and suddenly the door opened and vierotchka found herself in a field she was running frolicking and she thinks how is it that i did not die in the cellar it is because i had never seen the fields before had i seen them i must have died in the cellar and again she seemed to be running and frolicking then she dreamed that she was paralyzed and she said to herself how is it that i have the paralysis old men old women have the paralysis but young girls never have it oh yes they do very often an unknown voice seemed to reply and very soon you will be well let me only touch your hand you see you are well already now get up who was it that spoke how relieved i am all the pain has gone and vierotchka got up and began to walk to run and again she is in the field again she is running and frolicking and she thinks how could i have endured the paralysis it was because i was born with paralysis and did not know how to walk and to run had i known i could not have endured it and still she keeps on running and frolicking and here comes a young girl across the field how strange her face and her gait everything about her keeps changing changing constantly now she is english french now she is already german polish and now she has become russian again english again german again russian and how is it that she has only the one face an english girl does not look like a french girl a german girl does not look like a russian but her face keeps changing and yet it is the very same face what a strange person and the expression of her face is constantly changing how gentle she is how angry now she is melancholy now she is gay she is always changing and she is always kind how is that even when she is angry is she always kind but only see what a beauty she is no matter how her face changes with every change she grows more and more beautiful she approaches vierotchka who are you he used to call me vera pavlovna but now he always calls me my dear ah so this is you that vierotchka who fell in love with me yes i love you very much but who are you i am your bridegroom's bride what bridegroom i do not know i do not know my own bridegrooms they know me but it is impossible for me to know them i have so many you must choose one of them as a bridegroom for yourself only from among them from among my bridegrooms i have already chosen i do not need to know his name and i do not know them but only choose from among them from my bridegrooms i want my sisters and my bridegrooms to select from amongst each other have you been locked up in a cellar have you been paralyzed i have are you free now i am it is i who set you free it is i who cured you remember that there are a good many not yet freed many not yet cured free them cure them will you i will but what is your name i am so anxious to know i have many names i have various names according as it is necessary for any one to call me an appropriate name i give you may call me philanthropy love for humanity this is my real name not many call me so but you must call me so and vierotchka seems to be going about in the city here is a cellar in the cellar young girls are locked up vierotchka touches the lock the lock is unfastened you are free out they go here is a room in the room young girls are lying stricken with paralysis arise they get up they go out and here they are all in the field running and frolicking ah 
how gay when there are so many together it is far more lively than to be in solitude ah how gay end of part two chapter twelve recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter thirteen of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter thirteen lopukhov during these last weeks has had no time to spend with his acquaintances of the medical school kirsdnof who has kept up his intercourse with them has replied when asked about lopukhov that he has had among other things some business to attend to and one of their common friends as we know gave him the address of a lady the lady to whose house lopukhov is now going how excellently the matter will be arranged if all turns out satisfactorily thought lopukhov on his way to the lady's house in two years or certainly in two years and a half i shall get a professorship then we shall have something to live on and meantime she will be staying quietly at the b s provided only mrs b proved to be the right sort of woman and there can hardly be a doubt of that in fact lopukhov found in mrs b a clever kind-hearted woman without pretence though from her husband's position and from their wealth and connections she had a right to put on great style the conditions were favourable the family circumstances very propitious for vierotchka everything proved to be entirely satisfactory just as lopukhov expected mrs b also found lopukhov's replies in regard to vierotchka's character perfectly satisfactory the affair was rapidly drawing near a settlement and after they had talked half an hour mrs b said if your young aunt should consent to my terms i will ask her to remove to my house and the sooner the better for me she consents she has authorized me to consent for her but now that we have settled the matter i must tell you what would have been wrong for me to tell you before the young girl is no relation of mine she is the daughter of a chinovnik at whose house i give lessons there is no one besides me to whom she can confide her troubles but i am an absolute stranger to her i knew it monsieur lopukhov you yourself professor n naming the acquaintance through whom her address had been obtained and your chum who spoke to him about this matter of yours know each other to be so honourable that you can speak among yourselves about the friendship one of you has for a young girl and not compromise the young girl in the eyes of the others and professor n having the same good opinion of me and knowing that i was looking for a governess felt that he was in the right to tell me that the young girl was no relation of yours don't blame him for indiscretion he knows me very well i also am a person of honour monsieur lopukhov and believe me i understand who is worthy of respect i have as much faith in n as i have in myself and n has as much faith in you as he has in himself but n did not know her name and now it seems to me that i may ask it seeing that we have settled the matter and to-day or to-morrow she may come into our family her name is vera pavlovna rozalskaya now there is another explanation that i owe you it may seem strange to you that i with all my care for my children should decide to settle this matter with you without having seen the one who will come into such close relations to my children but i know very well of what sort of people your circle consists i know that if one of you takes such a friendly interest in a person then this person must be a genuine godsend for a mother who wishes her daughter to grow up into a truly good woman therefore an examination seemed to me an entirely unnecessary piece of indelicacy i am giving not you but myself a compliment i am very glad now for mademoiselle rozaskaya her domestic life has been so hard that she felt that she should be comfortable in any sort of a family but i did not dream of finding such a really excellent career for her as opens for her in your home yes n told me that she leads a miserable life in her family very miserable lopukhov began to relate all that was necessary for mrs b to know so that in conversations with vierotchka she might avoid all references that would remind the young girl of her past life mrs b listened with interest finally she pressed lopukhov's hand no that is enough monsieur lopukhov 
or i shall get sentimental and at my age and i am almost forty it would be ridiculous to show that even now i cannot listen with indifference to tales of family tyranny from which i suffered myself when i was young allow me to tell you one thing more it is not so important for you and there is probably no need of my telling you this yet it is better to tell you just now she is running away from a lover whom her mother is doing her best to make her marry mrs b was lost in thought lopukhov looked at her and also began to appear thoughtful if i am not mistaken this circumstance does not seem to you as unimportant as it does to me mrs b seemed utterly absorbed in thought excuse me he continued seeing that her mind was entirely distracted excuse me but i see that this troubles you yes it is a very serious matter monsieur lopukhov to leave home against the will of her parents that of course means to bring about a great quarrel but that as i told you was of no consequence if she were running away merely from their folly and cruelty the matter could be arranged with them some way or other if worst came to worst we could give them some money and they would be satisfied that's nothing but when such a mother forces a bridegroom on her daughter it means that the bridegroom is rich a very profitable investment of course said lopukhov in a perfectly melancholy tone of voice of course monsieur lopukhov he's rich and it is that which troubles me in such a case the mother is not going to give in so easily and do you know the law about parents in matters of this kind they have full control they will begin a lawsuit and carry it out to the bitter end lopukhov arose and so it remains for me only to ask you to forget all that i have told you no wait a moment allow me at least to justify myself somewhat before you beau moi how mean i must seem in your eyes that which ought to stir up every honourable person to sympathy and protection that very thing keeps me back oh what pitiable people we are indeed it was sad to look at her she was not putting it on it was really painful to her for a long time her words were disjointed so confused had she become then her thoughts began to become logical but whether disjointed or logical they meant nothing to lopukhov yes even he was also confused he was so occupied with the discovery that she had made for him that he could not heed her explanation in regard to the discovery after he had given her sufficient time to speak out her mind he said all that you have said in your own excuse is idle i was obliged to remain so as not to seem discourteous lest you should think that i blamed you or were angry but i must confess that i did not listen to what you said oh if i did not know that you were right and how good it would be if you were not right i would tell her that we could not agree about the terms or that you did not satisfy me and that would be the end of it she and i could hope for some other way of escape but now what can i tell her mrs b shed tears what can i tell her repeated lopukhov as he went downstairs what will become of her what will become of her he asked himself as he came out from galernaya street upon the kono gvardaisky boulevard of course mrs b was not right in that absolute sense of the word in which people are right who try to prove to little children that the moon is not to be seized with the hand it was very possible nay even probable that through her position in society through her husband's quite important official connection if she had seriously desired vierotchka to live with her marya alexyevna would not have been able to tear vierotchka from her hands without causing serious trouble for herself and her husband who would have to figure as the official defendants in the lawsuit and this she would have feared but nevertheless mrs b would have had to take a good deal of trouble on her shoulders and would possibly have some disagreeable interviews it would be necessary in behalf of a stranger to incur obligations to people whose services it would be better to reserve for one's own affairs who is compelled and what reasonable man would want to act in a different way from mrs b we haven't the slightest right to blame her yes lopukhov was not wrong when he despaired about Virochka's escape. End of part two, chapter thirteen. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part two, chapter fourteen of A Vital Question, or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain 
Recording by Expatria in Bangor, Maine. Part two, chapter fourteen. Now Vierotchka has been sitting long, long on the appointed bench, and how often did her heart beat quickly, quickly, when she saw an army cap coming around the corner. Ah, there he is, my friend. She jumped up and ran to meet him. Maybe he would have regained his courage by the time he had reached the bench, but he was taken unawares, and his face was seen sooner than he anticipated, and so he was caught with a gloomy expression. Failure? A failure, my friend. But it seemed to be so certain. How did it come to be a failure? What was the reason, my dear? Let us go home, my friend. I will go with you. We'll talk it over. I will tell you in a few words why it failed. But now let me think. I cannot collect my thoughts yet we must think up some other plan let us not despair we shall find something these last words gave him little hope but not much tell me right away i can't endure to wait you say think up some other plan then it means that our former plans are impracticable can't i be a governess how poor i am how unhappy i am why deceive you tis true you cannot i wanted to tell you so but patience my dear patience be brave keep up good heart whoever keeps up good heart succeeds ach my dear i keep up good heart but how hard it is they walked for a few moments in silence what is it why yes she is carrying something in her hand under her cloak my dear you are carrying something here let me take it no no it's not necessary it isn't heavy it's nothing again they go in silence they go a long way and to think i did not go to sleep till two o'clock out of joy my friend and when i went to sleep what a dream i had it seemed to me as though i were set free from a stifling cellar as though i were paralyzed and then cured and ran out into the field and so many young girls ran out with me who like myself were set free from stifling cellars were cured of paralysis and we were so happy so happy to run about in the open field the dream has not been realized and i did so think that i should not have to go home again my dear let me carry your bundle for you since now i know what it is again they walk in silence long they walk in perfect silence my dear you see as that lady and i talked the matter over we came to this conclusion you cannot leave home without marya alexievna's consent tis impossible no no take my arm i am afraid you are ill no it's nothing only it's stifling under this veil she drew back the veil now it's all right i feel better how pale she is no my dear don't think about what i said i did not express myself well we'll arrange everything all right how can we arrange things my love you say this only so as to console me nothing can be done he has nothing to say again they walk in silence how pale how pale she is my dear there is one way what way my pet i will tell you my dear but only when you get a little calmer you will have to decide about it deliberately tell me now i cannot get calm until i know no now you are too much excited my dear now you could not decide an important question in a little while soon here's the front door good-bye my dear as soon as i see that you would give a deliberate answer i'll tell you when will that be day after tomorrow, when i give the next lesson too long i will call on purpose tomorrow. no sooner than that this evening no i will not let you go come in with me now you say i am not calm you say i cannot decide very well take dinner with us you will see that i shall be calm after dinner mamenka takes a nap and we can talk but how can i come in if we come in together your mamenka's suspicions will be awakened again suspicions what do i care no my dear and for this very reason it would be better for you to come in we may have been seen for i walked with my veil up you are right. End of part two, chapter fourteen, recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part two, chapter fifteen of A Vital Question, or What is to be done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five, and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two 
first love and legal marriage chapter fifteen marya alexyevna was greatly surprised to see her daughter and lopukhov coming in together she forthwith proceeded to subject them to the keenest inspection i called to tell you marya alexyevna that i have an engagement for day after to-morrow evening and so i am going to give the lesson to-morrow instead permit me to sit down i am very tired and unwell i should like to rest why what's the matter dmitri sergeitch indeed you look very bad is it a love scrape or did they meet by chance if it were a love affair he'd have been gay or can they have fallen in love and quarrelled because she would not give in to his wishes then of course he'd have been angry only if they'd quarrelled he wouldn't have escorted her and then again she went straight to her room she didn't look at him and there was no signs of a quarrel no evidently they must have met by chance but the deuce knows em gotta watch him with both eyes there is nothing special the matter with me marya alexyevna but vera pavlovna looked rather pale or at least i thought so what vierotchka she's often so well maybe it only seems so to me i must confess that my head swims it is so full of thoughts why what's the matter dmitri sergeitch you ain't had a fallen out with your sweetheart have you no marya alexyevna i am content with my sweetheart it's her parents that i have to quarrel with what do you mean batyushka dmitri sergeitch how is it possible to quarrel with her parents i didn't think that of you batyushka it can't be helped marya alexyevna it's such a family they expect a man to do god knows what things beyond his power that's a different thing dmitri sergeitch you can't satisfy everybody you've got to set limits that's a fact if such is the case that is if the quarrel's about money i can't blame you allow me to be rude marya alexyevna i am so tired that i feel the need of rest in pleasant and estimable society and such a society i find nowhere except in your house permit me to impose myself upon you for dinner to-day and permit me to give some orders to your matriona it seems to me that denker's wine cellar is not very far from here and his wine is not a god knows what kind but excellent marya alexyevna's face which at the first mention of dinner became black with rage put off its decided expression when he spoke of matriona and assumed a look of eagerness we will see golubchik will you contribute something towards the dinner denker of course he must have something good but the golubchik not looking into her face at all had already taken out his cigar-case torn off a piece of paper from a letter that had seen long service in it took out his pencil and proceeded to write if i may ask you marya alexyevna what kind of wine do you like to drink i batyushka dmitri sergeitch must tell you the truth i know very little about wines because i scarcely ever drink it ain't a woman's business it can be easily seen from your face at a glance that you don't drink however be it so marya alexyevna even young girls drink maraschino will you permit me to order it what kind of wine is that dmitri sergeitch simple you might almost say it wasn't wine at all but only syrup he took out a red note ten roubles there i guess that'll do he ran over his order at a glance at all events i'll make it five roubles more three weeks income a month's support but it can't be done in any other way it is necessary to give marya alexyevna a good bribe marya alexyevna's eyes filled with moisture and involuntarily the sweetest of smiles spread over her face have you a confectioner near at hand i wonder if we could find a walnut pirogue ready-made according to my taste that's the very best kind of pie marya alexyevna but if we can't find any we'll have to put up with the best we can get he went into the kitchen and sent matriona to make the purchases let's have a regular picnic to-day marya alexyevna i want to drink away my quarrel with those parents why shouldn't we have a picnic marya alexyevna i get along first-rate with my sweetheart shan't we live well shan't we live happily marya alexyevna yes indeed batyushka dmitri sergeitch that's the reason i see that you are so flush with your money which i never expected of you because you are a man of solid understanding evidently you must have had a little advance from your bride's dowry ain't that so no marya alexyevna but as long as i have money in my pocket we may as well picnic what do you mean by the little advance on the dowry you have to do business in a straightforward way else suspicions will be aroused besides it's not high-toned marya alexyevna 
it ain't high tone dmitri sergeitch that's a fact it ain't high tone according to my idee one must be high toned in everything you are right marya alexyevna the half or three quarters of an hour remaining before dinner time passed in the most amiable conversation of this sort touching on all sorts of noble sentiments dmitri sergeitch among other things declared in a transport of confidence that his marriage would soon take place and how is it about vira pavlovna's marriage marya alexyevna is not able to answer because she is not bringing any pressure upon her daughter of course not but in his opinion vira pavlovna will soon make up her mind to marry to be sure she had not told him anything but he had eyes of his own you and i marya alexyevna are old sparrows you know and we can't be caught with chaff though my years aren't so very many still i'm an old sparrow a tough roll isn't that so marya alexyevna yes that's so batyushka a tough roll a tough roll in a word this pleasant confidential conversation with marya alexyevna had so enlivened dmitri sergeitch that he forgot all about his melancholy he was livelier than marya alexyevna had ever seen him before what a cute rogue he is a clever rascal he must have got out of his sweetheart more than one thousand and probably her folks found out he was stuff in his pockets and when they went for him i reckon he told him no batyushka and matushka i am ready as a son to respect you but i haven't got any cash for you what a cute rascal to be sure it's pleasant to talk with such a man especially when finding out that matryona has got back you make an excuse to go to your bedroom for a clean handkerchief and peek into the kitchen and find that she's bought more than twelve roubles worth of wine we'll only use a third of it at dinner and a pirog which must have cost a rouble and a half new as far as a pirog goes you might say twas money thrown away yet i reckon some of that'll be left over it'll be a good thing to treat my cronies with instead of jam oh no it's no loss it's a gain End of part two chapter fifteen Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part 2, Chapter 16 of A Vital Question, or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, 1852 to 1935, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter sixteen but vierotchka was sitting in her room did i do well to make him come in mamenka looked so sharply and what an awkward position i have put him in how can he stay to dinner Boje moi what will become of poor me he says there's one way no my love there's no way at all yes there is one way the window when it becomes absolutely unendurable i will throw myself out how foolish i am when it becomes unendurable how is it now and when you throw yourself out of the window how quick quick you fly not as though you were falling but as though you really had wings that must be very delightful only afterwards you must strike against the sidewalk ach how terribly it must hurt no i don't believe you'd have time to feel it but only it must be very hard but it would be over in a twinkling and then before you struck how soft the air is like a feather cushion it takes you up so gently so tenderly no it must be good yes but what then everybody would be gazing one skull broken face torn in blood in mud no if clean sand could only be scattered over the spot but down there the sand is all filthy no if it were white and clean it would be good one's face would not be torn it would be clean and not disgust people and in paris young girls stifle themselves with coal gas that's a good idea a very good idea but it is not good to jump out of the window the other's a good way though how loud they are talking out there what are they talking about no i can't catch what they are saying i would leave him a note explaining everything this is what i told him the other day this is my birthday how forward i was how could i have been so but then i was foolish and didn't understand yes how sensible the poor girls are in paris well can't i be just as sensible how strange it will be they'll come into the room they won't see anything only there'll be a smell of gas a greenish tint to the air they'll be frightened 
What does this mean? Where is Vierotchka? Mamenka will scold Papenka. What are you standing there for? Open the window. They open the window and see me sitting at my bureau, my head resting on it and my face in my hands. Vierotchka, are you suffocated? I make no reply. Vierotchka, why don't you speak? Ach, she is suffocated. They'll begin to scream, to weep. Ach, how strange it will be for them to weep and for mamenka to begin to tell how she loved me yes but he will be grieved well i'll leave him a note yes i'll think about it think about it and do like the poor girls in paris if i make up my mind i shall do it i'm not afraid and what is there to be afraid of it must be so good but i will wait till he has told me what the plan is that he proposes but no there can't be any he only said so to console me why do people try to offer consolation there's no sense in it at all can there be any consolation when there's no help he is sensible and yet he does it just the same what did he say so for there's no sense in it but what's he talking about he seems to feel happy how merry his voice sounds has he really thought of some plan no there can't be any way whatever but if he had not thought of something would he be so happy what can he have thought of End of part two, section sixteen. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part two, chapter seventeen of A Vital Question or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five, and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter seventeen yurochka come to dinner shouted marya alexeyevna in fact pavel konstantinovitch had returned the pirog was already long ago it was not the pirog from the confectioners but one that matryona had made out of the stuffed beef that they had the day before Maria Alexeyevna, do you ever take a glass of vodka before dinner? It's very healthful, especially this kind, made out of bitter oranges. I tell you this as a medical man. Please try it. Yes, yes, you must try it, without fail. I, as a doctor, prescribe it for you. Suppose I'll have to hearken a doctor, so I'll try half a glass of it. No, Maria Alexeyevna, half a glass won't do you any good. And how about yourself, Dmitri Sergeyevich? i'm growing old marya alexeyevna i've become steady i swore off well it does kinder warm one through that's where the good comes in marya alexeyevna it gives you new warmth how gay he is is there really something in prospect and how on earth did he manage to become so friendly with her and he does not even look at me ah how shrewd he is they sat down to table now here we must drink a health to pavel konstantinovitch let us drink it with this ah it's just the same thing as beer not any stronger than beer try it marya alexeyevna if as you say it's beer why there's no reason not to drink beer heavens what a lot of bottles ah how silly i am that's the way she got to be so friendly what a cunning rascal he is he himself don't drink he only touches his ale with his lips but what excellent ale it tastes better nor kvass and it's strong it's got a very good strength when i get her married off to mishka i'll give up vodka and drink nothing but ale nu no, this fellow never loses his head in drink if he'd only give in to it the villain but then it's for my advantage i reckon if he wanted to drink tea he'd drink enough you'd ought to drink some yourself dmitri sergeyitch eh hey, in my day we used to drink a good deal marya alexeyevna i drank enough to last a long time when i had no luck and no money i used to get drunk but now i have enough to do and enough money i don't need wine i feel gay enough without it and so the entire dinner passed off they bring on the confectioner's pirog my dear matryona stepanovna what goes well with this i'll bring it right in dmitri sergeyitch and matryona hurries back with a bottle of champagne Vera pavlovna you and i have not taken anything yet now let us drink to the health of my bride and your bridegroom what does he mean does he really mean that thinks vierotchka may god grant your bride and vierotchka's bridegroom all happiness says marya alexeyevna 
and to us old folks may he grant to see yurochka's wedding right soon never you fear you won't have long to wait marya alexyevna isn't that so vira pavlovna da does he really mean what he says thinks vierotchka certainly vira pavlovna of course she means to marry him just say yes yes says vierotchka that's right vira pavlovna why should you keep your mamenka waiting and doubting yes and that settles it and now we must drink another toast to vira pavlovna's approaching wedding drink it vira pavlovna don't be afraid it will be all right let us clink glasses to your approaching nuptials they clink glasses god grant it god grant it thank you vierotchka you make happy vierotchka in my old age says marya alexyevna wiping away her tears the english ale and the maraschino had brought her into a sentimental state of mind die bog die bog echoed pavel konstantinovitch how pleased we are with you dmitri sergeyevich says marya alexyevna after dinner was over yes indeed we are pleased you have been our guest and yet you have treated us well we can well say that you have given us a holiday's entertainment her eyes had a far pleasanter expression than the impudent one that they generally wore not everything results as cleverly as it is cleverly planned lopukhov had not dared to hope for such a result when he bought the wine he only intended to give marya alexyevna a bribe so that he might not lose her good will by having invited himself to stay to dinner would she have drunk so much before a stranger even though they had common sympathies unless she trusted him but is there any one whom she would trust and in fact she herself had not intended to yield so soon to the temptation she meant to postpone her main share in the enjoyment of the good things till after tea but every human being has his weakness she could have withstood the vodka and other familiar drink but ale and other attractions of the sort led her astray through inexperience the dinner passed off in very formal and baronial style and therefore marya alexyevna ordered matryona to set on the samovar as is customary after baronial dinners but only she herself and lopukhov availed themselves of this luxury Yurochka declared that she didn't want any tea and she went right to her room pavel konstantinovitch like an ignorant boor went off to take his nap as he always did after dinner dmitri sergeyevich drank deliberately and when he had finished one cup he asked for another here marya alexyevna began to feel a bit queer she excused herself by saying that she had not been well since early morning the guest begged her not to stand on ceremony and she left him to himself he drank a second cup and a third and took a nap in his chair must have dozed some time like our golden one as matryona expressed and the golden one was already snoring it must have been her snoring that wakened dmitri sergeyitch after matryona went into the kitchen for good and all taking with her the samovar and the cups end of part two chapter seventeen recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter eighteen of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter eighteen forgive me vira pavlovna said lopukhov coming into her room how gently he speaks and his voice trembles but at dinner he spoke loud and he did not call her my dear but vira pavlovna forgive me for having been impertinent you know what i said yes a husband and wife cannot be separated then you are free he took her hand and kissed it my dearest you saw that i wept when you came in it was out of joy lopukhov kissed her hand many times he kissed her hand here my dearest you are freeing me from the cellar how clever and kind you are how did you happen to think about it it was when we first danced together that i thought about it my dearest i thought then that you were kind you are giving me liberty my dearest now i am ready to suffer now i know that i am leaving the cellar now it will not be so suffocating for me now i know that i am already leaving it but how shall i leave it my dearest this is the way vierotchka it is now the end of april at the beginning of july my work at the medical school will be over 
I must graduate so that we can have the means to live, and then you shall leave your cellar. Endure it only three months or even less. You shall get out. I shall have the position of surgeon. The salary is not over large, but no matter. I shall have some practice, as much as will be necessary, and we shall get along. Ach, my dearest, we shall need but very little. But I do not want it to be so. I do not want to live at your expense. You see, I am earning something now by giving lessons, but I shall lose them then, for Mamenka will tell everybody that I am an abomination. But I shall find other pupils. I shall begin to live. Now isn't that the right way? Don't you see that I mustn't live at your expense? Who gave you that idea, my dearest friend, Vierotchka? Ah, and now he is asking me who gave me that idea. Why weren't you yourself always saying this very thing? And in your books, fully half of them say so. In the books? Did I say so? When was it, Vierotchka? Ah, when was it indeed? And who told me that money lay at the root of all things? Who told me that, Dmitri Sergeyevich? Well, what of that? and you think that i am such a foolish young girl that i cannot draw a conclusion from premises to use the words of your books well what conclusions my dearest friend vierotchka you are talking god knows what nonsense ah smarty he wants to be a despot he wants me to become his slave no indeed this cannot be dmitri sergeyevich do you understand then you tell me and i shall understand money lies at the root of all things you say dmitri sergeyevich whoever has the money has the might and the right say your books consequently so long as a woman lives at her husband's expense she will be dependent upon him isn't that so dmitri sergeyevich you suppose that i did not understand it that i was going to be your slave no dmitri sergeyevich i am not going to allow you to be a despot over me you want to be a benevolent kind despot but i will not allow it but i do not want it to be so dmitri sergeyevich now my milenki how else can we live you will cut off people's hands and legs you will make them drink miserable mixtures and i will give piano lessons and how else should we live that's right that's right let every one preserve his independence from everybody with all his might no matter how he loves him how he trusts him whether you will carry out what you propose or not i do not know but it makes very little difference whoever makes up his mind to do a thing of this sort has already built his fort he already feels that he can get along by himself that he can refuse the help of others if necessary and this feeling is almost enough of itself what queer people we are vierotchka you say i do not want to live at your expense and i am praising you for it who else says such things vierotchka no matter if we are queer my milenki what do we care we shall live according to our own style it is better for us how else should we live darling Vera pavlovna i have proposed to you my ideas about one side of our life you have condescended to overthrow them altogether with your plan you have called me a tyrant and a slaveholder now be kind enough to think yourself how the other parts of our relations shall be arranged i count it idle to give you the benefit of my thoughts lest they should be destroyed by you in the same way my friend vierotchka tell me yourself how we ought to live in all probability there will be nothing left for me to say but this my dear how very wise your ideas are what is that you mean to give me a compliment you want to be very polite but i know too well how people flatter so as to reign under a mask of humility i beg of you to speak more simply hereafter my dear you are praising me to death i am ashamed my dear don't praise me lest i become too proud very good Vera pavlovna i will begin to say rough things to you if you like that better there is so little femininity in your nature vira pavlovna that most likely you have nothing but men's thoughts ach my dearest what does that word femininity mean i understand that a woman speaks in a contralto voice a man in a baritone but what of that is it worth while to bother about our contralto voices is it worth while to ask us about such things why do people keep telling us that it is our duty to remain feminine isn't it a piece of nonsense dear it is nonsense Vierotchka, and a very great piece of triviality so then my dear i shall not bother myself about femininity now listen dmitri sergeyevich i am going to express in absolutely masculine fashion the way that i think we ought to live we shall be friends only i wish to be your principal friend ah i have never told you how i dislike this dear kirsanov of yours 
You must not, Vi^rotchka ; he is a very fine man." " But I hate him ; I shall forbid your seeing him." " That is a fine beginning ! She is so afraid of my despot ism that she wants to make a doll of her husband ; and how can I help seeing him when we live together ?"" You are always sitting together like lovers." " Of course, at breakfast and at dinner. When one's hands are always occupied, it is hard to use them like lovers' hands." " And you are always inseparable." " Most likely. He is in his room and I in mine ; that means almost inseparable." " And if that is so, why shouldn't you stop seeing him altogether?" " Well, we are friends ; sometimes we want to talk, and we talk ; and so far we haven't been burdensome to each other." " You are always sitting together, hugging and disputing. I hate him." " What makes you think so, Vi^rotchka? We have never quarrelled. We live almost separately ; we are friends, to be sure ; but what of that?" " Akh! my dearest, how I deceived you ! How cleverly I deceived you ! You did not want to tell me how we should live together, and yet you have told me everything. How I deceived you ! Listen ! This is the way we should live according to your idea. In the first place, we shall have two rooms, yours and mine, and then a third room where we shall drink tea, take dinner, receive guests who come to call on both of us ; and not on you alone, and not on me alone. In the second place, I must not dare to enter your room lest I bother you. You see, Kirsdnof does not dare to interrupt you, and so you do not quarrel with him, and it will be the same with mine. That is the second. Now there is a third. Ah, my dearest, I forgot to ask you about it. Does Kirsdnof interfere with your affairs or you with his? Have you a right to ask each other about anything? Eh, hey, now I see why you mentioned Kirsdnof. I shall not tell you. No, but I dislike him for all this. And you need not tell me, for it's not necessary. I myself know. You have no right to ask each other about anything. And so, in the third place, I shall have no right to ask you about anything, my dear. If it is necessary for you to tell me about any of your affairs, you will tell me yourself, and vice versa. Here are three rules. What more is there? Yerochka, your second rule demands explanations. We shall see each other at tea or dinner in our neutral room. Now imagine such an occasion as this. We have drunk our tea in the morning, I am sitting in my room, and do not dare to show my nose in yours. Consequently, I cannot see you till dinner time. Isn't that so? Of course. Excellent. An acquaintance of mine comes and says that at two o'clock another acquaintance will call on me, but it happens my business calls me away at one. May I ask you to tell that acquaintance who is coming at two the proper answer? May I ask you whether you intend to remain at home? Of course you may. Whether I will undertake it is another question. If I refuse, you have no right to claim it of me. You have no right to even ask why I refuse. But to ask whether I will consent to do you that little service, you shall have that right. Excellent. But at breakfast I did not know that he was coming, and I shall not dare to enter your room. How then can I ask the question? Oh, Boge, how simple he is, a little child. Just listen to him. How he misunderstands me. This is the way you must do, Dmitri Sergeyitch. You shall enter the neutral room and say, Vera Pavlovna. I shall answer from my room. What do you want, Dmitri Sergeyitch? You will reply, I am going out. In my absence, Mr. A will call. Of course, you will give me your friend's name. I have some news to tell him. May I ask you, Vi^ra Pavlovna, to tell him that? If I answer no, our conversation is at an end. But if I say yes, I shall come out into the neutral room, and you shall tell me what you want me to tell your friend. Now, my dear little child, you know, don't you, how it will be necessary to act? Yes, my dear Vi^rotchka. Jesting aside, it is much better to live in the way that you propose. Only who in the world puts such ideas into your head? i know them and i remember where i have read of such things but such books never come into your hands in the books which i let you have there were no such ideas did you hear them from whom i was almost the first person whom you ever met from among respectable people ah my dear is it so very hard to think out such things i have seen family life i am not speaking about my family my family is so peculiar but i have friends and i have been in their homes Bouge moi what disagreeable scenes between husbands and wives you cannot imagine them my dear nu no, i have no trouble in imagining them vierotchka do you know how it seems to me my dear 
People ought not to live the way they do, always together, always together. They ought not to see each other except on business, or when they come together to rest, or have a good time. I am always looking and thinking, why is everybody so polite to strangers? Why do all people try to appear better than they are in their own families? And in fact, before strangers they are better. Why is it? Why do they treat their own people worse than they do strangers, though they love them more? Do you know, my dear, that there is one favor that I want to ask of you, to treat me as you have always treated me? This has not hindered you from loving me. After all, you and I have been nearer to each other than all the rest. How have you always acted towards me? Have you ever answered rudely? Have you ever spoken unkindly? Never. People ask how it is possible to be rude to a woman or a girl who is a stranger. How is it possible to speak harshly to her? So far, so good, my dear. Now I am your bride. I am going to be your wife. But you must always treat me as they say it is right to treat a stranger. This, my dear, seems to be better than all else for preserving harmony, for preserving love. So, my dear. I don't know what to think of you, Vierotchka. This is not the first time that you have surprised me. My dear, you want to flatter me to death. No, my friend, it is not as difficult to understand as it may seem to you. Such thoughts are not peculiar to me alone, my dear. They are held by a good many girls and young women, even such simpletons as I am. Only it is impossible for them to tell their bridegrooms or their husbands what they think. They know that if they did, it would be said that they were immoral. I fell in love with you, my dear, because you don't think so. Do you know when I began to love you? It was when we talked together the first time, my birthday, when you said that women were poor and to be pitied. It was then that I fell in love with you. And when did I fall in love with you? That very same day? Do you suppose it was on that very same day when I told you that? How strange you are, dearest. You said that I couldn't guess, but if I should guess, you would begin to praise me again. But try to guess for all that. Well, of course it was when I asked whether it was not possible to arrange things so that all people could live comfortably. I must kiss your hand again in payment for that, Virochka. That'll do, my dear. I do not like the habit of kissing women's hands. Why not, Virochka? Ah, my dear, you yourself know why. What is the good of asking me? Don't ask such questions, my milenki. Yes, my friend, that is true. One should not ask such questions. It is wrong. I'll ask you only when I do not really know what you mean, and you meant that nobody's hand should be kissed. Yerochka laughed heartily. Now I forgive you, because I have succeeded in laughing at you. You see, you wanted to examine me, and you yourself did not know the principal reason why it is not well. Nobody's hands should be kissed, that's true. But that was not what I was talking about, not the general rule, but only about the impropriety of a man kissing a woman's hand. This, my dear, ought to be very offensive to a woman. It shows that she is not looked upon as an equal. Women think that a man cannot lower self-respect before a woman, that she is already so much lower than he is, that no matter how much he lowers himself before her, still he does not come down to her level, but is far higher than she is. But you do not think this way, my dear. Why then should you kiss my hand? But listen to what I think, my Milenki, as though we had never been bridegroom and bride. Yes, that is true, Vierotchka. It looks very little like it. But what are we then? God knows what we are, my Milenki, or rather it's this way, as though we had been married long, long ago. That's so, my dear, it is true. We are old friends, nothing has changed. Only one thing has changed, my Milenki, that now I know that I am coming out from the cellar to enjoy freedom. End of part two, chapter 18. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part 2, Chapter 19 of A Vital Question, or What is to be Done, by Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, 1852-1935, to 1935, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part two, First Love and Legal Marriage, Chapter 19. Thus they talked, rather a strange conversation for the first one after their engagement, and they pressed each other's hands, and Lopukhov went home by himself, 
and Vierotchka locked the door after him because Matriona remained sitting longer than usual in the dining room, hoping that her golden one would snore for a long time to come, and in fact her golden one did snore for a long time to come. When Lopukhov reached home about seven o'clock, he tried to apply himself to work, but he could not collect his thoughts. His mind was occupied not with his work, but he was constantly occupied with the same visions that came to him during the lone walk from the Semyonovsky bridge to the Vuiborgsky ward, naturally with visions of love, certainly with such visions, but yet not entirely with love and not entirely with visions. The life of a man without means has its prosaic interests, and it was about them that Lopukhov was also thinking. That is to be taken for granted. He is a materialist, and therefore he thinks only about his interests, and in point of fact he was all the time thinking about his own interests. Instead of lofty, poetical, and plastic imaginations, such love imaginations as are proper for a coarse materialist occupied his time. A sacrifice. It will be almost impossible to get this out of her head, and this is bad. When you think that you are specially indebted to a person, your relations to this person are apt to be somewhat strained, and she may find this out friends may explain to her what a career was before me and even if friends do not explain this to her she will find it out for herself she will say my dear here you have given up for my sake the career which you anticipated well i don't mean money for neither my friends nor she herself will think that i care about that well it's a good thing that she will not say to herself he remained for my sake in poverty when otherwise he might have been rich this she will not think but she may learn that i long for scientific fame and that i might have won it but she will find something to worry about ah what a sacrifice he made for my sake and i never thought of making a sacrifice i was never so foolish as to make sacrifices and i hope i never shall be i have done what was for my best good i am not a man to offer sacrifices and there are no such men in existence it is a false term a sacrifice is equivalent to such nonsense as top boots with soft-boiled eggs one acts in the way that's most agreeable now just go ahead and preach this it is accepted in theory but when the hard fact comes before a person he is humiliated you he says are my benefactor and already the blade has shown itself you he says have rescued me from the cellar how kind you are to me why should i have bothered to set you free if i myself had not liked to do it is it i who set you free think you do you think that i should take all this trouble unless it had afforded me myself some satisfaction maybe i have set myself free of course i have i myself want to live want to love do you understand i am doing everything for myself now how can i manage so as not to arouse this pernicious feeling of gratefulness which would be so trying to her well we'll manage it somehow she is sensible and will understand that it is mere bagatelle of course i did not intend to act this way i intended to act otherwise i thought that if she succeeded in leaving her family we would postpone the thing about two years in the meantime i should have succeeded in getting a professorship my finances would by that time have been satisfactory but it has proved to be impossible well what loss has it been to me did i have myself in view when it seemed to me that my money matters must be in order beforehand what does a man need a man does not need anything if he has boots if he is not out at elbows if he has she or cabbage soup if he has a warm room what more does he want and all this i have consequently what loss shall i have but for a young and pretty woman that is not enough she must have pleasures she must succeed in society and for this there will not be money enough of course she will not think that she is deprived of these things she is a sensible virtuous girl she will say to herself these things are trifles it's all nonsense and i despise them and she will despise them but does it help when a person does not know what he is deprived of or is even assured that he is not in need of anything it is an illusion a fancy nature is deadened by reason circumstances pride and is silent and does not speak aloud about itself to the understanding and yet while it is silent it works and undermines life a young woman especially a pretty young woman must not live in that way it is not agreeable to be dressed worse than others and to be prevented from shining by being scrimped and means i am sorry for you my poor little girl 
I thought that something better would be arranged for you. But what do I care? It is my game. It is a question whether she would consent to marry me two years hence, and now she does. Dmitri, come and drink your tea. I am coming. Lopukhov went into Kirsdnof's room, and on the way he had time to think. And how true it is that I am always on the first floor. I began with self and ended with self. And why did I begin by calling it a sacrifice? What nonsense! as though i gave up my scientific reputation as though i gave up my professorship is it not all the same i shall work in the same way i shall get a professorship just the same and likewise i shall serve the cause of medicine it is pleasant to a man who is a theorist to observe how egotism plays with his ideas when he comes to put them into practice i intend to forewarn the reader about all things and therefore i shall tell him not to suppose that this monologue spoken by lopukhov contains a mysterious hint on the part of the author as to some important motif in the further development of the relations between lopukhov and vira pavlovna vira pavlovna's life will not be undermined by being deprived of the means of shining in society and of dressing expensively and her relations to lopukhov will not be demoralized by a pernicious feeling of gratefulness i am not one of those artists in whose every word is hidden some kind of a spring i am only relating what people have done and thought if any kind of an action conversation monologue is necessary for the characterizing of a person or a situation i relate it even though it may respond with no results in the further development of my story now alexander you must not complain because i am behind you in our work i shall be ahead of you why are you through with that young woman's affair i am is she going to be a governess at the b s no she is not going to be a governess it has been arranged otherwise she will now be able for a while to live a tolerable life in her own family well that's good it is pretty tough to be a governess and now brother i am done with the optic nerve and i am going to take up the next pair and how far have you got along i shall have to finish the work at and here came a series of anatomical and physiological terms end of part two chapter nineteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter twenty of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter twenty it is now the twenty eighth of april he said that he should be through by the first of july let us say the tenth but that is not the first well we can take the tenth or so as to get nearer i'll suppose it's the fifteenth no i'll take the tenth after all now how many days are left to-day should not be counted there are only five hours of it left there are two days more in april may thirty one and two makes thirty three june thirty and thirty three makes sixty three in july ten days altogether it makes seventy three is that much only seventy three days and then freedom i shall get out of this cellar ah how happy i am my milenki how cleverly he thought it all out how happy i am this was on sunday evening on monday came a lesson given instead of tuesday my dear my beloved how glad i am to be with you if only for a minute do you know how many days there are left for me to be in this cellar when will you be done will you be done by the tenth of july yes Vierotchka. then i shall have to sit in this cellar only seventy-two days and this evening one day i have marked off already see i have made a little calendar just as boarding-school girls and boys do and i cross off the days how delightful it is to cross them off my dear little virotchka my dear indeed you have not long to worry along here two months and a half will quickly pass and you will be free ah how delightful it will be only just at present my dearest don't always talk with me and don't look at me and we must not play on the piano every time you come either and i shall not come out of my room every time that you come here no i shall not have enough strength of mind for that i shall come out always if only for one minute and i shall look at you so coldly not fondly at all 
and now i am going right away to my room good-bye my dear when thursday three days how long but then there will be only sixty-eight days left count less about the seventh you will be able to get away from here the seventh then it is now only sixty-eight days how happy you have made me good-bye my dear thursday my dearest there are only sixty-six days to stay here yes vierotchka the time flies fast fast no my dear ah how long the days seem sometimes it seemed to me as though a whole month had dragged along while these three days were passing good-bye my dearest we must not talk long aren't we shrewd yes good-bye ah only sixty-six remain for me to sit in the cellar hm hm it is not so noticeable of course when one is at work time flies and then i am not in a cellar hm hm da saturday ah my dearest only sixty-four days are left ah how gloomy it is here these two days have seemed longer than those three days ah how gloomy how miserable it is here if you only realized it my dear good-bye my dear my sweetheart till tuesday and these three days will seem longer than the last five good-bye my dear mm. ah da her eyes look badly she does not like to weep this is not well mm. da tuesday ah my dearest i gave up counting the days they don't pass they don't pass at all Yerochka, my little friend i have a favour to ask of you we must have a nice little talk together you are anxiously longing for freedom well give yourself a little freedom we must have a talk together yes we must moi milenki we must then i will ask you how this suits you what time will it be most convenient for you to-morrow it does not make the least difference what time only tell me be again on that bench of the konogvardiski boulevard will you i will be there moi milenki without fail at eleven o'clock is that right very well thank you little friend good-bye my dearest ah how glad i am that you have thought about it how was it that i myself foolish little thing that i am did not think about it good-bye we will talk at all events i shall breathe the fresh air good-bye milenki at eleven o'clock without fail friday vierotchka where are you going i mamenka vierotchka blushed to the nevsky prospect mamenka then i am going with you vierotchka i have an errand at the gostinui dvor what did you put on such a dress as that for vierotchka when you say you are going to the nevsky you ought to put on a better one when you are going to the nevsky folks will see you i like this dress just wait one second mamenka i want to get just one thing out of my room they start they go they reach the gostinui dvor they were going along the block that runs parallel with sadovaya street they are not far from the nevsky corner and here is ruzanov's shop mamenka i have two words to tell you what is the matter with you vierotchka good-bye mamenka i don't know whether we shall meet again soon if you don't get angry it'll be to-morrow what is it vierotchka i cannot understand it somehow good-bye mamenka i am going to my husband dmitri sergeitch and i were married three days ago drive to karavanaya street is Vostchik. a quarter lady all right only be quick about it he will call upon you this evening mamenka and don't get angry with me mamenka these words hardly reached marya alexievna's ears don't drive to karavanaya street i only said so as to get away from that lady as quickly as i could go to the left down nevsky i must go much further than karavanaya street to the vasilievsky island the fifth block behind the middle prospect drive fast i will give you a good fee ah lady you are pleased to fool me you'll have to give me half a rouble if you drive fast end of part two chapter twenty recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter twenty one of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter twenty one the wedding had been managed in simple and yet far from common fashion 
Two days after the conversation which resulted in their engagement, Vierotchka was delighted at her approaching freedom. On the third day, the cellar, as she called it, seemed twice as intolerable as before. On the fourth day, she wept, which was contrary to her liking, but she did not weep much. On the fifth day, she wept more. On the sixth day, she did not weep at all, but she could not sleep from sorrow. Lopukhov looked on, then he spoke the monologue beginning, hm, hm. He looked a second time and spoke the monologue, hm, hm, da, hm. At the first monologue, he had a dim suggestion of an idea, but he was not sure what it was. At the second monologue, he saw plainly in his mind what he imagined at the first. It does not do to offer a person freedom and then leave him in prison. After that, he thought steadily for two hours, an hour and a half on his way from Semyonovsky Bridge to Vyborgsky, and half an hour on his sofa. The first quarter of an hour he thought without wrinkling his forehead. The remaining hour and three quarters he wrinkled his forehead. At the end of the two hours he struck his forehead, and using worse words than Gogol's postmaster Talyatin, the calf, looked at his watch and saying, Ten o'clock, yes, there is time yet, left the room. During the first quarter of an hour, when his brow was smooth, this was what he thought. It's all nonsense why should i graduate i shall not be ruined if i don't get a diploma and it is not necessary by lessons and translations i shall not make less i shall make even more than if i had become a doctor bagatelles consequently there was no need of wrinkling his brow to tell the truth the task did not appear to be of a head-splitting nature partly because that from the first lesson he had anticipated something in the nature of his present resolution he now perceived this and if any one had reminded him of his arguments that began with the theme sacrifice and ended with the thought of fine dresses one might have proved to him that something in the nature of these circumstances was anticipated from that very time because otherwise there would be no sense in the words to renounce my scientific career at that time it seemed to him that he was not going to renounce it but instinct was already saying renounce it there will be no postponement and if any one had proved to lopukhov as to a practical thinker that there was no ground then for his renunciation he would have triumphed as a theoretical man and would have said now here is a new example for you of how egotism rules our thoughts for i ought to have seen but i did not see for i was trying to look in another direction and rules our actions for why did i make the girl stay in her cellar a week longer when the matter ought to have been foreseen and provided for long ago but he remembered nothing of that kind and it did not occur to him because he had to wrinkle his forehead and while wrinkling it to think for an hour and three quarters on the question who will marry us and there was only one answer all the time there is no one to marry us but suddenly in place of the answer no one to marry us the name of mertsalov came into his head then it was that he struck himself on the forehead and swore with good reason how is it possible that i did not think of mertsalov at the very beginning and to a certain degree he was wrong in his wonder he was not accustomed to think of mertsalov as of a man who marries in the medical school there are a good many people of all kinds there are among them some seminarists these men have acquaintances in the theological seminary and through them lopukhov had also made acquaintances there one of the students whom he knew at the theological seminary not an intimate but a friend had graduated a year ago and had become a priest and was living in a certain building with endless corridors on the vasilyevsky island to him lopukhov went and as it was an extra occasion and a late hour he took an izfochik mertsalov was sitting alone in his room and was reading some new book possibly by louis the fourteenth or someone else of the same dynasty such and such is the state of things alexey petrovitch i know that it is a very serious risk for you to undertake it is right enough if we get reconciled with the parents but suppose they begin a lawsuit there may be some trouble for you and there probably will be but lopukhov could not find in his mind anything to attach to his butt for how in the world can you persuade a man to put his neck for your sake into a noose mertsalov was also in a quandary and tried hard to find a butt which would authorize him to run such a risk and he had no better success in getting beyond the butt how can we arrange this matter i should certainly like to what you are doing now i did a year ago and i gave up my liberty just as you are going to do i have some scruples but i must help you out of it 
Yet when one has a wife, it is rather dangerous to go ahead without precaution. How are you? Good evening, Alosia. All my people send their best regards to you. How are you, Lopukhov? We haven't seen you for a long time. What is this that you are speaking here about a wife? Oh, yes, the wives are always to blame. This was said by a young married woman of about seventeen who had just come in from a visit to her parents. She was a pretty and lively blondinka. Mertsalov told his wife about the state of things. The young woman's eyes flashed. Alyosha, they will not eat you up. There is a risk, Natasha. A very large risk, said Lopukhov in corroboration. Well, what can be done? You must run the risk, Alyosha, I beg of you. If you will not blame me, Natasha, for not taking you into account in running into this danger, then that settles it. When do you want to get married, Dmitri Sergeyevich? In point of fact, all hindrances were set aside. On Monday morning, Lopukhov said to Kirsdnof, Do you know, Alexander, that I am going to make you a present of my half of our work? Take my papers and preparations. I give it all up. I am going to leave the medical school. This is my last request. I am going to be married. Lopukhov told him the whole story in a few words. If you were stupid or I were stupid, I should tell you, Dmitri, that this is the way that insane men act. But now I shall not say any such thing. All the objections that I could raise you must have thought over more than I have done. And even if you have not thought them over, it does not make any difference. Whether you are acting foolishly or wisely, I do not know. But at least I shall not attempt to act so foolishly as to dissuade you when I know that your mind is made up. Can I be of any service or not? I want to find an apartment somewhere in an inexpensive neighborhood, three rooms, and I must make application to get my medical school papers right away, tomorrow if possible, so you will look us up a house. On Tuesday, Lopukhov got his papers, went to Mertsalov, and said that the wedding would be on the next day. At what time would be most convenient for you, Alexey Petrovitch? It makes no difference to Alexey Petrovitch, as he stays at home all day. I think, though, that I shall have time to send Kirsdnof to let you know. On Wednesday, at eleven o'clock, Lopukhov went to the boulevard, and after waiting for some time for Virochka, began to get worried. But here she is, all out of breath. Virochka, my dear, has anything happened to you? No, Milenki, nothing. I was late only because I overslept. That means, what time did you go to bed? Milenki, I didn't want to tell you. At seven o'clock, Milenki. But I was thinking all night long. No, it was earlier. It was six. I want to ask you about something, my dear Virochka. We must get married soon, mustn't we, so that we may both be comfortable? Yes, Milenki, we must. We must very soon. Then in four days, in three? Ah! If it could be so, Milenki, then you would be a smart boy. In three days I will surely find a house. We'll buy everything for housekeeping, and then will it be possible for us to live in it together? It will, my Golubchik, it certainly will. But it will be necessary to get married first. Ah! I forgot, Milenki, that it was necessary to get married first. Well, we can get married today. That was the very thing that I wanted to ask you about. Let us go right away and get married. And how have you managed everything? What a bright boy you are, Milenki. I will tell you everything on our way. Let us go. Here they are. They have passed through the long corridors into the church. They have found the sexton. They have sent for Mertsalov. Mertsalov lived in the house where the endless corridors were. Now, Virochka, I have to ask of you still another favor. You know that they make young couples kiss each other in church. Yes, my Milenki, only how ridiculous it is. Well, lest it should be too ridiculous then, let us kiss each other now. Very well, let us kiss each other. But could it not be done without it? Yes, but it is impossible to get along without it in church, so let us prepare ourselves. They kissed each other. Milenki, it is well that we have had time to prepare ourselves. Here comes the sexton. Now it will not seem so ridiculous in church. But it was not the sexton who came. The sexton did not come till after the diacon. It was Kirsdnof who had been waiting for them at Mertsalov's. Virochka, this is Alexander Matveitch Kirsdnof, whom you do not like, and whom you have forbidden me to meet. Vera Pavlovna, what is the reason that you want to separate our tender hearts? For the very reason that they are tender, said Virochka, giving Kirsdnof her hand and still smiling. Then she fell into thought. But shall I be able to love him as well as you do? You love him very dearly, don't you? I? I love no one but myself, Vera Pavlovna. And you don't love him? 
we have lived together and we have never quarreled isn't that enough and hasn't he loved you either i never observed anything of the sort however let us ask him have you ever loved me dmitri i never particularly despised you well if that is the case alexander matvitch i shall not forbid your meeting and i myself will love you now that is much better vira pavlovna and now i too am ready said alexey petrovitch coming in let us go into the church alexey petrovitch was gay and full of jests but when the ceremony began his voice trembled suppose it should result in a lawsuit natasha you must go back to your father your husband does not support you and it is a wretched life to have a husband alive and to live on your father's bread however after several words he again regained complete control of himself when the service was half over natalia andreyevna or natasha as alexey petrovitch called his wife invited the young people to come to her house after the ceremony she had prepared a little breakfast they came in they laughed they even danced two quadrilles with two couples they also waltzed alexey petrovitch who could not dance played the violin for them an hour and a half flew by quickly and unnoticed it was a gay wedding i think that they must be waiting dinner for me at home said vierotchka it is about time now my milenki i shall be able to live three or four days in my cellar without being melancholy and possibly even more why should i worry now there is nothing for me to fear now no don't go home with me i am going all alone by myself so as not to be seen by anybody it's all right they will not eat me up don't worry gentlemen said alexey petrovitch as he escorted lopukhov and kirsanov to the door who had remained for a few minutes so as to give yerochka a chance to get out of sight i am very glad now that natasha encouraged me on the following day after a four days hunt a good house was found at the farther end of the fifth block on the vasilievsky island having all in all one hundred and sixty roubles in reserve lopukhov concluded with his friend that it would be impossible for him and vierotchka to think as yet of attempting to keep house or to have their own furniture and dishes and therefore they rented three rooms together with furniture dishes and board from an old man who quietly spent his days with a little stock of buttons ribbons pins and other things at the fence on the middle prospect between the first and second blocks while his evenings were passed in quiet conversation with this old woman who for her part spent her days in mending hundreds and thousands of old things of every sort brought to her in bundles from the pushing market the servants also belonged to the landlord in other words they were the landlord and landlady themselves all this cost them thirty roubles a month at that period ten years ago eighteen fifty three the times were not so hard in petersburg judged by the petersburg standard with such an arrangement their means would last for three or even four months ten roubles a month is enough for tea isn't it and in four months lopukhov hoped to find pupils some kind of literary work or even some kind of occupation in a mercantile office he did not care what on the very day when the house was found and indeed the house was a very good one they looked out for that and therefore they found what they wanted lopukhov while he was giving his lesson on thursday as usual said to vierotchka to-morrow you can come to me my dear here is the address i shall not say anything more now lest they may notice something my milenki you have saved me now how to leave the house shall they confess what they have done Yerochka thought seriously about doing so but her mother might lay violent hands on her and might even lock her up Yerochka concluded to leave a letter in her room when marya alexievna heard that her daughter was going to the nevsky prospect and said that she was going too Yerochka went back to her room and took the letter it seemed to her that it was better more honourable if she herself told her mother to her face for on the street her mother would not attempt to beat her and it would only be necessary to stand at a distance from her while speaking to take an izvozchik as soon as possible and then drive off before she had time to catch her by the sleeve in such a manner the effective scene came about at ruzanov's door end of part two chapter twenty one recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter twenty two of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole 
eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter twenty two but we have had only one half of this scene for about a moment no rather less marya alexievna who had suspected nothing of the kind stood thunderstruck endeavouring to understand and absolutely failing to understand what her daughter had said what it meant and how it came about but it was only for a moment or even less she came to herself with a start she uttered some objurgation or other but her daughter was already far down the nevsky marya alexievna dashed several steps in her direction must take an izvoshchik she turned to the sidewalk izvoshchik where do you want to go lady where did she want to go she heard her daughter say to karavanaya street but her daughter turned to the left down the nevsky where did she want to go i want to overtake her yonder that beast to catch some one speak sense where do you want to go how can i go without any direction and you hain't give me any idea marya alexeyevna entirely lost control of herself and she began to berate the izvoshchik you are drunk baruina that's all there is of it said the izvoshchik and left her marya alexeyevna ran after him still scolding and she shouted at the other izvoshchiks and she dashed in all directions for some time and she gesticulated with her hands and then she went back under the colonnade and she kicked and she acted like a madwoman and around her were gathered half a dozen rude fellows who had been peddling various articles around the columns of the gostinui dvor the fellows were laughing at her and they exchanged among themselves words of more or less unfavourable character and they praised her ironically and they offered her their advice to be calm ay da bariuna how early you managed to get full lively bariuna bariuna ah bariuna buy half a dozen lemons of me they are good to take when you're tipsy i'll let thee have them cheap bariuna ah bariuna don't listen to him a lemon won't do you the least good but go and take a nap bariuna ah bariuna you're a good hand at scolding let's get up a scolding match and see who'll beat marya alexeyevna not knowing at all what she was about boxed the ears of one of the nearest of her interlocutors a fellow of seventeen who not without grace was stretching out his tongue at her his hat flew off and his hair was right at hand marya alexeyevna got her fingers into it this act roused the rest of her interlocutors into a state of indescribable enthusiasm ay bariuna give it to him others shouted fyedka give it back to her in small change but the majority of the interlocutors were on marya alexeyevna's side how can fyedka stand up to her give it to him bariuna knock fyedka down he deserves it the rascal a good many spectators had now collected besides the interlocutors both izvas cheeks and the clerks of the shops and the passers-by marya alexeyevna as though coming to her senses and with a final mechanical motion pushing away fyedka's head started across the street the enthusiastic praises of her interlocutors accompanied her she saw that she was on the way home after she had passed the doors of the school of pages she took an izvas cheek and reached home in safety finding fyodor at the door she gave him a beating she rushed to the cupboard she pounded matryona who came out to see what made the noise again she rushed to the cupboard she dashed to vierotchka's room then she rushed back again to the cupboard once more she dashed to vierotchka's room and remained there a long time then she made a tour of all the rooms scolding but finding no one on whom to lay her hands fyodor had run to the rear stairs matryona who was looking through the crack of yurochka's room frightened out of her wits ran back when she saw that marya alexeyevna was getting up she lost her head and could not find her way to the kitchen but found herself instead under marya alexeyevna's bed where she remained in safety until she was called out under a flag of truce whether it was a long or short period that she was scolding and shouting as she walked through the empty rooms marya alexeyevna could never tell but it must have been long because when pavel konstantinovitch came from his office he also had a dose both materially and ideally from marya alexeyevna but as everything must come to an end marya alexeyevna cried out matryona let us have dinner matryona saw that the storm was ended she crept out from under the bed and got dinner 
at dinner marya alexeyevna did not scold at all but she only growled without any intentions of attacking but only for her own satisfaction and afterwards she did not take a nap but sat down alone and did not speak but was growling then she stopped growling and became absolutely silent finally she cried out matryona wake the barin and tell him to come to me matryona who while expecting orders did not dare to go into the dining-room or anywhere else fulfilled the command pavel konstantinovitch appeared go to the khozyaka and tell her that our daughter has married that devil because you wished her to tell her it was against my wife's will tell her that you did so so as to please her ladyship because you saw that it was not her ladyship's wish tell her my wife was alone to blame and i only carried out your ladyship's will tell her i myself brought them together do you understand or not i understand you marya alexeyevna you are very wise in your plan well then go along with you even if she is eating her dinner don't mind call her right out bring her from the dinner-table so long as she does not know the real truth the assurance of pavel konstantinovitch's words was so impressive that the khozyaka would have believed him even if he had not possessed the gift of a persuasive tongue but the impressiveness of this gift was so great that the khozyaka would have forgiven pavel konstantinovitch even if there had not been substantial proofs that he had constantly acted against his wife and purposely brought vierotchka and lopukhov together in order to block the ignoble marriage of mikhail ivanovitch but how did they get married pavel konstantinovitch was not stingy in giving her a dowry he had given lopukhov five thousand roubles in cash and he had given the marriage and all its costs at his own expense through him the young people had exchanged little notes they had met at the house of his colleague the nachalnik filantyov a married man your ladyship although i am a man of little account the maiden honour of my daughter your ladyship is dear to me they met in my presence and although we have not money enough to justify giving a boy of the age of ours a tutor yet i hired one for an excuse your ladyship etc etc his wife's unreliability pavel konstantinovitch depicted in the darkest colours how then could she help being convinced and forgiving pavel konstantinovitch and the main thing what a great and unexpected piece of happiness joy softens the heart the khozyaka began her speech of forgiveness with a very long explanation of the thoughts and actions of marya alexeyevna and at first asked pavel konstantinovitch to send his wife away but he implored her and she herself acknowledged that it was rather for show than because she meant it finally it was decided that pavel konstantinovitch should retain his place as manager that they should give up their rooms facing the street and take another suite in the back of the building on condition that his wife should not dare to show her face in those places on the first dvor where the khozyaka's eyes might fall and that she should be obliged to go out of doors when she went at all by a staircase that lay far from the khozyaka's windows from the twenty roubles a month that had been added to his salary fifteen roubles should be taken back and five roubles would be left to him for a compensation for the manager's energy in the khozyaka's interests and towards the expenses of his daughter's wedding end of part two chapter twenty two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter twenty three of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two first love and legal marriage chapter twenty three marya alexeyevna had a number of schemes in mind as to the way to act towards lopukhov when he should come in the evening the most revengeful was to hide two dvorniks in the kitchen who at a given signal should throw themselves on lopukhov and beat him to death the most pathetic was solemnly to pronounce with her own lips aided by pavel konstantinovitch a parental curse on their disobedient daughter and on him their murderer with an explanation that the curse was valid even the earth as is well known does not receive the dust of those who are cursed by their parents but this belonged to the same category of imaginations as the khozyaka had in regard to separating pavel konstantinovitch from his wife 
for such schemes like any other poetry have no practical application properly speaking except to relieve the heart by furnishing a framework for endless thoughts in solitude and for other explanations when by and by she should come to speak about it as for example he or she might have done this or that and he or she intended to do so but owing to his or her kindness he or she felt grieved to do so the plan of beating lopukhov and cursing her daughter were the ideal part of marya alexyevna's thoughts and feelings but the actual part of her mind and soul took a direction not so lofty but more practical and this difference is attributable to the inherent weakness of every human being when marya alexyevna came to her senses at the gates of the school of pages she comprehended that her daughter had really disappeared was married and had left her for good and all and this fact came before her imagination in the form of the following mental exclamation she has robbed me and all the way home she kept exclaiming mentally and sometimes even audibly she has robbed me and therefore while she was detained for several minutes by the process of communicating her grievance to fyodor and matryona through human weakness every human being is carried away by the expression of feeling to such an extent that he often forgets in the excitement of the spirit the interests of the moment marya alexyevna ran into vierotchka's room peeked into the drawers of her bureau into her wardrobe she cast a hasty glance over everything no apparently everything is untouched and then she began to confirm this reassuring impression by a careful examination the result was that really all her dresses and things remained there with the exception of a pair of simple gold earrings and an old white mousseline dress and an old cloak which Virochka wore when she went away as regarded the practical direction in which marya alexyevna's acts would take she expected that Virochka would give lopukhov an inventory of her things which he would ask for and she firmly decided that she should give her nothing from among her possessions of gold and the like that she would give her four of the simplest of her dresses and some of the thinnest and oldest of her underwear to give her nothing was impossible since her noble generosity would not allow it and marya alexyevna had always been very strict in her observance of noble generosity another question of actual life was her relations to the kozyaika we have already seen that marya alexyevna successfully solved the answer to it now there is a third question what can be done with the hussy and the rascal that is with her daughter and her unexpected son-in-law curse them that is not hard but it is useless except as a dessert after something substantial only how is this substantial something possible to lodge a complaint to bring about a lawsuit to have them arrested at first when her feelings were all stirred up marya alexyevna looked upon this solution of the question from an ideal standpoint and ideally it seemed to her very delightful but in proportion as her blood grew calmer after the weariness of the storm the matter began to appear in a different light nobody knew better than marya alexyevna that lawsuits are conducted through the agency of money and money alone and such cases as charmed her by their ideal beauty are conducted through the agency of large very large sums of money and they are dragged out unendingly and after wasting a great deal of money they often come to nothing in the end what is to be done at the final upshot it seemed that there were only two courses to take to quarrel with lopukhov to her heart's content and to retain virotchka's things when he demanded them and as a means of doing that to threaten him with a lawsuit but she certainly must quarrel to her full sweetness but she did not succeed in quarrelling lopukhov came and began by saying virotchka and i ask you marya alexyevna and pavel konstantinovitch to forgive us for taking this step without your consent on hearing this marya alexyevna cried i shall curse her the good for nothing but instead of saying the whole world good for nothing marya alexyevna had only time to say good for n because lopukhov interrupted her in a loud voice i shall not listen to your abuse i came to speak about business you are angry and you cannot speak calmly and so i will talk only with pavel konstantinovitch and marya alexyevna you send fyodor and matryona to call us when you get calmed down while saying this he started to lead pavel konstantinovitch from the parlour into his bedroom and he spoke so loud that there was no chance of outcrying him and therefore she was obliged to stop off short 
he took pavel konstantinovitch to the parlour door here he stopped turned around and said and now marya alexyevna i am going to talk with you but only about business and it must be calmly she was about to lift her voice a second time but he interrupted her again nu if you can't speak calmly then we shall leave you now what makes you go out you fool she shouted well he is leading me out and if pavel konstantinovitch did not choose to speak calmly then i would leave it would not make any difference to me but why should you pavel konstantinovitch allow yourself to be called such names marya alexyevna does not understand business she really thinks that she can do anything that she pleases with us but you are a chinovnik you are a man of experience you of course understand propriety you tell her that she cannot do anything with virotchka now and still less with me the rascal must know that nothing can be done to him thought marya alexyevna and she said to lopukhov that being her mother she was excited at first but now she could speak coolly lopukhov returned with pavel konstantinovitch they sat down lopukhov asked her to listen until he should finish what he had to say and to postpone what she had to reply and then he began to speak lifting his voice powerfully whenever she attempted to interrupt him and then he finished his speech in safety it was to this effect that it was impossible to untie them and therefore the case of storeshnikov was beyond recall as you know yourself consequently it will be idle for you to take the trouble however do as you please if you have extra money i even advise you to try it and then again there is hardly any reason for being vexed because virotchka never wanted to marry storeshnikov consequently this case was always beyond realization as you yourself have seen marya alexyevna and young girls must certainly marry and as a general thing they are lost to their parents it would be necessary to give a dowry and then a wedding itself would cost a good deal of money but the main thing is the dowry consequently marya alexyevna you and your husband ought to be thankful to your daughter for marrying without causing you any expense he spoke in this style and he spoke with such detail that it took him a good half hour when he finished marya alexyevna saw that there was no use in bulldozing such a rogue and therefore she began to speak about her feelings how she was particularly grieved that virotchka should have married without asking her parents consent because it was very painful for a mother's heart now when a thing touches a mother's feelings and grievances then naturally the conversation takes a turn as though it were impossible not to speak about them this propriety demands now they have satisfied propriety they have spoken about this interesting fact marya alexyevna has said that as a loving mother she was grieved lopukhov has said that she as a loving mother had no need of being grieved and having fulfilled the measure of propriety by a discourse of suitable length about feelings they took up another point also demanded by propriety to wit that she had always wished her daughter to be happy this was said on one side and on the other side the reply was made that this was a thing that could never be doubted when the conversation had been prolonged to a suitable length on this point also they began to take leave of each other also with explanations of such a length as is demanded by propriety among gentlefolk and the result of it all proved that lopukhov understanding the sorrow of a mother's heart did not ask marya alexyevna's consent for her daughter to come to see her because maybe it would be hard for a mother's heart but when marya alexyevna should have heard that virotchka was living happily which of course was marya alexyevna's sole desire then her maternal heart would be entirely calmed consequently then she would be able to see her daughter without being grieved thus they came to this wise conclusion and separated peacefully well he's a keen one said marya alexyevna to herself as she escorted her son-in-law to the door that night she dreamed a dream of this nature she was sitting at the window and saw on the street an elegant carriage passing along the street and the carriage stopped and from the carriage stepped a handsomely dressed lady and a man and they came into her room and the lady said look mamasha how well my husband dresses me and this lady was virotchka and marya alexyevna seemed to see that the stuff of which the dress was made was of the very best and virotchka said the material alone cost five hundred silver roubles and that is a trifle for us mamasha and i have a whole dozen of dresses like this and this mamasha cost more here look at my fingers marya alexyevna looked at virotchka's fingers and on her fingers were rings with large diamonds 
this ring mamasha is worth two thousand roubles and this one here mamasha costs more four thousand roubles and look at my breast mamasha this brooch costs still more it is worth ten thousand roubles and then the gentleman spoke and the gentleman was dmitri sergeitch all these are mere trifles for us dear mamenka maria alexievna but the thing of the most importance is here in my pocket look dear mamenka at my pocket-book how fat it is there are nothing but hundred rouble notes in it and i am going to make you a present mamasha of this pocket-book because it is a trifle to us but this other pocket-book is still fatter dear mamenka i do not give it to you because it has no paper money but only bonds and mercantile notes and every bond and note is worth more than the whole pocket-book which i just gave you dear mamenka maria alexievna you have succeeded dear son dmitri sergeitch in making my daughter and all our family happy but where in the world my dear son did you get so much wealth i dear mamasha became a monopolist and while she was awaking from her dream marya alexeyevna thinks to herself indeed it would be a good thing if he became a monopolist end of part two chapter twenty three recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chapter twenty four of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatria in bangor maine part two chapter twenty four a word of praise from marya alexievna you have ceased to be a person of any importance in vierotchka's life marya alexievna and now that we are going to part from you the author of this narrative begs you not to complain that you are dismissed from the stage with an epilogue which is somewhat unfavourable to you do not think that we will treat you without due respect you were fooled but that does not in the least lessen our respect for your good sense marya alexievna your mistake does not testify against you you were thrown in contact with people such as had never before crossed your path and therefore it was no crime that you were mistaken in them when you judged them by your former experience all your former life brought you to the conclusion that people were divided into two classes fools and rascals whoever is not a fool must be a rascal you used to think and he who is not a rascal can only be a fool this view was very true marya alexeyevna until within a very short time marya alexeyevna you have met with people marya alexeyevna who spoke very glibly and you saw that all these people without a single exception were either foxy throwing dust in the eyes of others or full-grown stupids not knowing life and not having the wit to accommodate themselves to circumstances and therefore marya alexeyevna you considered them as evincing stupidity and fair game for deceit and you were right marya alexeyevna your opinion of men was already entirely formed when you met the first woman who was neither stupid nor villainous it was excusable that you got confused and did not know what to think of her or how to treat her your views of people were already entirely formed when you met the first noble-minded man who was not a simple pitiable child who knew life as thoroughly as you did whose judgments of it were not less correct than your own who could transact business with no less skill than you it was excusable that you were mistaken in him and looked upon him as a scoundrel like yourself these mistakes marya alexeyevna do not lessen my regard for you as a clever and active woman you brought your husband up from nothingness you have gained for yourself a competency against your declining years these are good things and they were hard for you to accomplish your method was bad but your environment gave you no other method your methods belong to your environment and not to you personally and hence it is not to your dishonour but it is a credit to your intellect and strength of character are you satisfied marya alexeyevna with this acknowledgment of your good qualities of course you must be satisfied with this because you never thought of claiming to be lovely or gentle in a moment of involuntary frankness you yourself confess that you were a bad and dishonourable woman and you did not look upon your wickedness and dishonesty as disgraceful to you because you proved that your environment would not allow you to be otherwise consequently you will not care 
because in addition to the praise of your intellect and strength of character no praise has been bestowed upon you for your good qualities you yourself don't claim to have them and you do not look upon them as worth having but rather you regard them as characteristic of stupidity consequently you will not ask further praise than what i have just given you but i can say one thing more in your favour of all the people whom i do not like and with whom i do not like to have business i would rather deal with you than all the rest of course you are unmerciful wherever it affects your advantage but if you have no advantage in doing anybody harm you will not do it out of stupid little spitefulness you consider that it is not worth while to lose time labour and money without return of course you would have been glad to roast your daughter and her husband over a slow fire but you were able to curb your revengeful inclination and to reason the matter over coolly and you understood that you had no chance of success in roasting them and this is a great thing marya alexyevna to be able to recognize an impossibility when you once recognized it you gave up your idea of beginning a lawsuit since the lawsuit would not punish the people who stirred up your anger you calculated that those little unpleasantnesses which a lawsuit would cause them would bring you yourself into more bother and expense and therefore you did not begin the lawsuit if it is impossible to conquer an enemy if in causing him a trifling loss you are causing yourself a greater then you had better not begin the battle you understood this and you had the common sense and courage to yield to an impossibility without unnecessarily causing harm to yourself or anybody else this too was a great thing marya alexyevna yes marya alexyevna one can get along with you you do not indulge in wrath for the sake of wrath to your own detriment and this is a very rare and very important quality marya alexyevna millions of people are more injurious to themselves and others than you are marya alexyevna even though they may not have that detestable side that you have you are better than the majority of those who are simply bad because you are not without reason and are not stupid i should have been glad to sponge you off from the face of the earth but i have a certain regard for you you do harm in no way now you are spending your time in mean business because your environment is so constituted but put you into other circumstances and you would take delight in being harmless in being even useful because you do not want to say harm without being paid for it and it were profitable to you you could do whatever you wanted consequently you would act honourably and nobly if it were advisable you are capable of doing so marya alexyevna and you are not to blame because this capability is latent that instead of doing so you are acting in a contrary way but you possess it and this cannot be said of all wretches are capable of doing anything you are only a bad woman but you are not hopelessly a wretched woman you are higher than many even if judged by the moral standard are you satisfied marya alexyevna what should i be satisfied for batyushka my circumstances are bad aren't they that is all right marya alexyevna end of part two first love and legal marriage recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter one of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter one three months have passed since virotchka was rescued from the cellar the lopukhov's affairs have prospered he has had a fair number of pupils he obtained work of a certain publisher to translate a textbook on geography vera pavlovna also found two pupils not of the highest grade but still not to be despised together they have an income of eighty roubles a month but such an income scarcely allows any one to live luxuriously but they ran no risk of running into poverty their means have gradually increased and they have calculated that in four months or even sooner they can set up their own establishment and this was afterwards realized the system of their lives was arranged of course not absolutely in accordance with virotchka's half-jesting half-serious plan 
proposed on the day of their fantastic engagement but nevertheless it was very much like it the old man and woman at whose house they lived gossiped together about the strange way in which the young couple lived as though they were not young people at all not even like husband and wife like nobody else in the world well now petrovna it seems to me just as queer as it does to you you could not tell for the life of you whether she wasn't his sister and he her brother you think that's a good comparison do you between brother and sister there ain't any ceremony at all but look at them he gets up puts on his clothes and sits down and waits till the samovar is brought then he makes tea and calls her and she too comes out all dressed what kind of a brother and sister is that you had better say this being as there's poor folks who through their poverty have to live two families in one apartment and you might compare them to such and how is it petrovna that a husband can't go into his wife's room when she ain't dressed she don't let him in what does that look like you ought to see how they part at night she says good night milenki then they separate each to sit in their own rooms they read books and he sometimes writes just you listen i'll tell you what happened once she went to bed and was reading a book then i heard through the partition it happened i was wide awake that night i hear her a getting up and what do you think i was listening she was standing before her looking-glass a combing of her hair well she seemed to be getting ready to go out to see some company i was listening out she went then i too goes out into the entry gets up in a chair and peeks through the transom into his room i was listening as she went to the door can i come in milenki and he says in a minute vierotchka he too was in bed he put on his pants and his coat now thinks i he'll be tying up his cravat but he don't put on his cravat he fixes itself a little and says now you can come in vierotchka says she i don't understand something in this book please explain it to me he tells her well milenki forgive me for bothering of you and says he oh it's nothing vierotchka i was only lying down you haven't disturbed me and so she went out and so she went out and so she went out and want there nothing more no nothing more but ain't so queer she went out so as twas cause she went and dressed herself when she went in to see him he says just wait then he dressed hisself and then he says come in you better tell me this what kind of actions is them must be this way petrovna it's a kind of sect i reckon cause you know there's a good many kind of sects it looks like it see here i guess your idea is right here is another conversation danilovitch i axed her about them actions of theirn says i don't get mad at my question but what's your religious views of course says she it's the russian and your old man his is russian too she said says i don't you belong don't you belong to any sect says she no i don't belong to any what makes you think so because says i because lady i don't know whether to call you miss or missus do you live with your old man she laughed oh yes says she of course i do she laughed did she yes she did of course i live with him says she then says i what makes you act as you do you never see him without his clothes on as though you want his wife and says she it's because i don't want him to see me in dishabilly oh no they don't belong to any sect at all then says i what makes you do so so as to keep love in the house and get rid of quarrels says she well now petrovna that looks as though she spoke the truth of course she always wants to look decent and then she goes on and says says she if i don't want other folks to see me in dishabilly then why should my husband whom i love more see me before i have washed my face it wouldn't do to show myself before him in any such way well so does that look as though she spoke the truth petrovna what makes men fall in love with other men's wives it's because they see them nicely dressed while they see their own wives how did you call it oh yes in dishabilly it's said so in holy writ in solomon's proverbs and he was the wisest of the czars end of part three chapter one recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter two of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter two 
The affairs of the Lopukhovs prospered. Vi^ra Pavlovna was always happy. But one time, this was some five months after the wedding, Dmitri Sergeitch, returning from one of his lessons, found his wife in a peculiar state of mind. Her eyes were shining with pride and happiness. This caused Dmitri Sergeitch to remember that for several days past he had seen her in some signs of mental exaltation, joyful thoughts, and tender pride. My dear, you seem to be so happy. Why don't you give us the benefit of it? I think I am, my dear, but you just wait a little while. I will tell you when I am sure that I am right. You must wait for several days, and it is going to be a great joy to me, and you too will be glad, I am sure, and Kirsanov and Mertsalov will be pleased with it. But what in the world is it? Ah, you have forgotten our agreement, haven't you, not to ask questions. I will tell you when I am sure of it. Another week passed by. My Milenki, I am going to tell you my joy. Only you must give me your advice, because you know all about it. You know that I have been wanting for a long, long time to do something great, and I have made up my mind that we must start a sewing union. Isn't that a good idea? Now, my dear, we made an agreement that I should not kiss your hand, but that was a general rule. It did not include such an occasion as this. Give me your hand, Vera Pavlovna. By and by, my Milenki, when I have succeeded in doing it. When you have succeeded, then I shall not be the only one to kiss it. Kirsanov and Alexey Petrovitch all will want to kiss it. But now I am alone, and the intention is worthy of it violence i shall scream scream then milenki i shall be ashamed and tell you nothing as though it were anything of such great importance here is where its importance lies we all make plans but we don't accomplish anything but you began to think long after the rest of us and sooner than all of us have resolved to put your ideas to the test yerochka bent her head on her husband's breast and hid her face my dear you have praised me to death her husband kissed her head what a clever little head my milenki stop it is impossible to tell you anything do you know what kind of a man you are i will stop tell me my tender-hearted girl don't you dare to address me so well you hard-hearted one ach what kind of a man are you all the time interrupting me just listen sit down quietly here it seems to me is the main thing that at the very beginning when you select a few to make the selection very carefully you must have really honorable good people not narrow-minded not fickle but steady and at the same time gentle so that there should not be any idle quarrels among them and that they should be able to select others of the same kind isn't that so yes dear now i have three such girls ah how long i had to hunt now here my dearest for the last three months i have been going round among the shops trying to make acquaintances and i have succeeded such nice girls i have got thoroughly acquainted with them and then moreover they must be thoroughly up in their art the business must stand on its own merits everything must have a solid foundation of mercantile calculations ach of course it must what more is left why do you need my advice then in regard to the details my milenki tell me the details of course you must have thought yourself about everything and you will be able to accommodate yourself to circumstances you know that the most important thing here is principle character and knowledge details come of themselves from the conditions peculiar to every circumstance i know but after all when you give your approval i shall be more assured they talked for a long time lopukhov found nothing to correct in his wife's plan but as far as she was concerned the plan developed and became more and more clear as she talked it over with him on the next day lopukhov took to the office of the police news an advertisement vira pavlovna lopukova would take orders for sewing ladies garments linens etc at moderate prices etc on that very morning vira pavlovna went to see julie she does not know my married name tell her mademoiselle rozalskaya my child you are without a veil you come to me openly and tell your name to the servant now this is sheer folly you are ruining yourself my child yes but i am married now and i can go wherever i please and do what i want to but your husband he may find it out he will be here in an hour then the questions began as to how she got married julie was delighted she hugged her she kissed her she wept when she became calmer vira pavlovna told her the purpose of her visit you know that old friends are not thought of except when their help is needed i have a great favor to ask of you 
i am going to establish a sewing shop give me your orders and recommend me to your acquaintances i myself sew nicely and i have good apprentices you know one of them and in fact julie knew one of them to be a good seamstress here are specimens of my work this garment i made myself you see how nicely it fits julie examined very carefully the fit of the garment she looked at the embroidery of the shawl at the little cuffs and she was satisfied my child you might be very successful you have both skill and taste but to succeed you must have a great shop on the nevsky yes i shall establish one there in good time now i take orders at home having finished talking about business they began to talk again about vierotchka's marriage and that storeshnik drank terribly for a couple of weeks and then he made up with adele and i am very glad for adele's sake he is a kind fellow i am only sorry that adele has not a better reputation as it came up naturally julie began to talk about the adventures of adele and others now mademoiselle rozalskaya is a married lady and julie does not think it necessary to hold her tongue at first she spoke reasonably then she was drawn away drawn away and began with delight to depict their dissipated existence and she went on and on vera pavlovna was embarrassed but julie did not heed it vera pavlovna recovered her self-possession and listened with that cruel interest with which you examine the features of a lovely face disfigured by disease but lopukov came in julie in an instant was changed into a stately woman of the world full of the sternest dignity however she did not keep up that role very long after she had congratulated lopukov on his wife such a beauty she again got excited now we must celebrate your wedding she ordered a breakfast off-hand she offered champagne vierotchka had to drink half a glass in honour of her wedding half a glass in honour of her union and half a glass in honour of julie herself her head began to turn she and julie shout laugh and get excited julie pinches vierotchka she jumps she runs away vierotchka after her they run all over the apartment jumping over the chairs lopukov sits and laughs it ended with julie making up her mind to exhibit her strength i am going to lift you up with one hand you can't do it they began to wrestle they both fell on the sofa and neither felt like getting up and so they lay there laughing until they fell asleep for the first time in many years lopukov did not know what to do should he waken them it is a pity you may spoil a pleasant meeting by making a bad ending he carefully got up went across the room to see if he could find a book he found a book chronique d'oe de boeuf in comparison with which Obla is virtue itself he sat down on a sofa at the other end of the room began to read and in a quarter of an hour he himself fell asleep through tediousness in two hours pauline wakened julie it was dinner-time they sat down alone without serge who had gone to some great dinner julie and vierotchka again got hilarious and then again they grew serious when they bade each other farewell they became entirely serious and julie thought of asking she had never had a chance to do so before why vierotchka meant to establish a sewing shop if she wanted to make money then it would be much easier if she would become an actress or a singer she has such a strong voice this matter caused them to sit down again vierotchka began to describe her plan and julie again became enthusiastic and she poured out blessings and among other things she declared that she julie le tellier was an abandoned woman and she wept but she knew what virtue was and again she wept and again she kissed her and again she broke out into blessings four days later julie came to vira pavlovna and gave her a good many orders for herself she gave her the addresses of a number of her friends from whom she might also receive orders she brought serge along with her telling him that it could not be avoided lopukov called on me and now you must return it julie behaved with exemplary seriousness and kept it up without the least failure although she stayed at the lopukovs a long time she saw that there were no thick walls but thin partitions and that her remarks might be overheard she did not get excited but she fell rather into a bucolic frame of mind looking with delight at all the particulars of the poor estate of the lopukovs and finding that that was the way to live that men ought not to live otherwise that only in moderate circumstances is true happiness possible and she even announced to serge that she would go with him to live in switzerland where they would have a little house amid the fields and mountains on the shore of a lake 
loving each other, fishing, taking care of their garden. Serge declared that he was perfectly ready, but he wanted to wait and see what she would say at the end of three or four hours. The thunder of the elegant carriage and the prancing of Julie's wonderful horses made a startling impression on the inhabitants of the fifth block, between the middle and the little prospects, where nothing of the sort had been seen, at least since the time of Peter the Great, if not longer. Many eyes were looking as the wonderful phenomenon stopped at the locked gates of a one-storied frame building with its seven windows, and when from the wonderful carriage stepped the still more wonderful phenomenon of an elegant lady with a brilliant officer whose important position could not be doubted. The grief was general when in a moment the gates were opened and the carriage rolled into the dvor. Curiosity was deprived of the hope of seeing the graceful officer and still more graceful lady a second time when they took their departure when danilovitch returned home from his peddling petrovna had a talk with him danilovitch well our tenants must be from among some very important folks a general and a general came to see them the generalsha was dressed so elegant that i can't begin to tell you and the general had two stars how petrovna came to see the stars on serge who had never had any decorations and would not have worn them if he had had them while out on service with julie is a wonderful circumstance but that she actually saw them that she was not mistaken and did not exaggerate for this i will not take her word but i will myself be responsible for her she did actually see them it is we who know that he did not have them but he had such an appearance that from petrovna's standpoint it was impossible not to see two stars on him and so she saw them i am not joking when i tell you that she really saw them in what livery the lackey wore danilovitch real english stuff five roubles and arshin such a solemn man he was and so important but just as perlite as could be he gave me a civil answer he allowed me to feel of his sleeve elegant cloth they seemed to have so much money that they feed it out to their chickens and they sat in their tenants rooms danilovitch and talked with them cosily for more than two hours just as i talk with you and them tenants did not even bow to them and they were joking with them and the tenant was sitting with the general both of them sitting comfortably on the chair and they were smoking and our tenant smoked right in the general's face and he sat comfortably before him what else his cigarette went out and then he lighted it at the general's and with what grace the general kissed our lady's little hand why i can't begin to tell you what can we make out of this danilovitch everything is from god is the way i reason it i reckon that whether it's acquaintance or relation it's all from god so it is danilovitch there's no doubt about it but this is what i think that either our tenant or his wife are either a brother or sister of either the general or the generalsha and to tell you the truth i think that she must be the general's sister what makes you think so petrovna it don't seem natural if it was so then they'd have money that's a fact danilovitch it must be this way either the mother or the father had a natural child because they don't favor each other really there ain't no resemblance tall that may be petrovna perhaps there was a natural child such things do happen petrovna for four whole days enjoyed great importance in her little store this little store for three whole days drew a part of the public from the store on the other side of the street petrovna for the sake of enlightening the public during those days even neglected her work to a certain extent and slaked the thirst of those who were thirsting for knowledge the result of all this was that within a week pavel konstantinovitch came to see his daughter and son-in-law marya alexievna had been anxious to gather some information about the lives led by her daughter and the villain it was not done systematically or constantly and for the most part it arose from a scientific instinct of curiosity one of her little gossiping acquaintances who lived on the vasilyevsky island was entrusted with the task of finding out about vera pavlovna whenever she happened to pass by where she lived and the gossip brought her reports as often as once a month or even oftener according to circumstances the lopukovs live in harmony they have no quarrels there's only one thing there are a good many young folks call on them and all the young men are good friends and modest they do not live luxuriously but apparently they have money they not only do not sell but they buy she has made herself two silk dresses they have bought two sofas an oblong table a half dozen chairs they got them at a bargain for forty roubles but the furniture is good and it would ordinarily cost a hundred roubles 
they have notified the landlord to look for new tenants we are going to leave in about a month for our new quarters and to you that is the landlord we are very grateful for your kindness to us new say the landlord of course says he and we for yours Marya alexievna was consoled by these reports though she was a very rough and a very wicked woman though she had tormented her daughter and was ready to kill her to ruin her for her own interests and though she cursed her because through her she had failed in her plan of getting rich all this is true but does it follow from this that she felt no love for her daughter it does not follow at all when the matter was ended when her daughter tore herself away from her power for ever what could she do whatever falls from the wagon is lost for all that she is her daughter and now when there was no chance whatsoever for vira pavlovna to serve marya alexievna's interests the mother sincerely wished her daughter good and then again it does not follow that she would wish things to be god knows how that it made no difference with her she certainly had not subjected her to any system of espionage the steps taken for watching her daughter were only adopted because she you must confess was morally obliged to watch her well and in exactly the same way as regards the wishes for her good she had to do it because she was her daughter why shouldn't she be reconciled all the more when the villainous son-in-law is according to all appearances a man of solid character maybe he will be of service in time thus marya alexievna little by little approached the thought of renewing her relations with her daughter it might have to wait half a year or even a year to accomplish it but there was no need of being in a hurry time is patient but the news about the general and the generalsha at once pushed the story forward fully all the remainder of the last half way the villain has really proved to be a rogue an ex-student without rank with only a few roubles he has made friends with a young and therefore a very important and rich general and the two wives have become acquainted such a man will get ahead or even maybe viera made friends with the generalsha and introduced her husband to the general it is all the same at all events viera will get on and so soon after getting the news of the famous visit the father was sent to announce to the daughter that her mother had forgiven her and would be glad to see her vera pavlovna went with pavel konstantinovitch and her husband and they spent the early part of the evening there the meeting was cold and constrained they spoke much about fyodor because it was not a dangerous subject he had gone to the gymnasium they persuaded marya alexievna to put him into the gymnasium boarding school dmitri sergeitch would visit him there and during his holidays vera pavlovna would take him home with her somehow or other they managed to spend the time until tea was ready and then they made haste to leave but lopukhov said that they expected callers for half a year vera pavlovna had breathed pure air her lungs had entirely forgotten the bad atmosphere of wily words vile thoughts low schemes all for the sake of lucre and her cellar made a horrible impression upon her filth misery vulgarity of every sort everything came up before her eyes with the keenness of a novelty how did i ever have the strength to live in such miserable bonds how could i ever breathe in that cellar and i not only lived and breathed there but even grew strong and well it is wonderful it is incomprehensible how could i grow up there into a love for goodness it is incomprehensible it is beyond belief thought vira pavlovna as she returned home and she felt herself rescued from suffocation in a little while after they got home the guests whom they expected came their regular cronies alexey petrovitch and natalia andreyevna and kirsanov and the evening passed as it usually did how doubly happy seemed her new life to vira pavlovna with its pure thoughts in the society of wholesome people as was customary they had a jolly conversation with many anecdotes and at the same time they talked seriously about everything in the world on the historical events of the time the civil war in kansas the forerunner of the great war between the north and the south which is now going on the forerunner of still greater events not in america alone occupied the minds of this circle now everybody talks about politics but then only a few felt any interest in this subject and in this small number were lopukhov kirsanov and their friends and they talked about the arguments of that day as to the chemical foundations of agriculture according to the theory of Liebig, and about the laws of historical progress without which never a conversation in society like this could go on 
and about the great importance of distinguishing between real desires which search and seek and find satisfaction for themselves and fantastic wishes which cannot be realized and which cannot find any satisfaction like the fantastic thirst in time of fever for which for the one as well as for the other there is one satisfaction to cure the organism by whose diseased state they are engendered through the disfiguring of actual wishes and finally about the importance of this radical differentiation which was brought out at that time by the anthropological philosophy and about everything of this sort and not of this sort but allied the ladies at time listened to these scientific discussions which were spoken as though there were no scientific terms and took a share asking questions sometimes but more often not waiting for the answers and they have even thrown cold water on lopukhov and alexey petrovitch when they get too much interested in the great importance of recent mineral improvements but alexey petrovitch and lopukhov discussed their scientific questions and were not disturbed kirsdnof was a bad helpmeet he was more even entirely on the side of the ladies and they all three played sang laughed till late into the night and then becoming tired they finally separated even the immovable enthusiasts for serious conversation end of part three chapter two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter three of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter three vira pavlovna's second dream and here vira pavlovna falls asleep and vira pavlovna dreams a dream a field and across the field goes a man namely her milenki together with alexey petrovitch and her milenki says you are interested in knowing why some dirt brings forth wheat so white and pure and delicate while other dirt does not bring it forth at all you will soon see the difference yourself look at the root of this beautiful ear of wheat around the root is dirt but this dirt is just pulled up you might even call it clean you smell a moist odour disagreeable but not foul and not putrid you know that in the philosophical language which you and i use this clean dirt is called actual dirt it is dirt to be sure but look at it attentively and you will see that all the elements of which it is composed are healthy in themselves when they are gathered together they make dirt but let the atoms change in some degree their relative coordination and something else will take its place and all that takes its place will be healthy because the fundamental elements are healthy whence comes the healthy element of this dirt just notice the situation of this little field you see that there is a ditch here for the water to run and therefore there can be no rottenness here yes motion is reality says alexey petrovitch because motion is life and reality and life are one and the same thing but the main element of life is labor and therefore the main element of reality is labor and the truest sign of reality is activity so you see alexey petrovitch when the sun begins to warm this dirt and the warmth begins to transfer its elements into a more complicated chemical correlation into the correlation of higher forms the wheat ear which grows out of this dirt through the warmth of the sun will be a healthy wheat ear yes it is because it is the soil of actual life alexey petrovitch now let us go to the next field let us also here pull up a plant and examine its root it is also dirty but just notice the nature of this dirt it is not hard to see that this dirt is rotten this is fantastic dirt to use the scientific terminology says alexey petrovitch it's so the elements of this dirt are in an unhealthy state it is natural that no matter how they are transposed the things not resembling dirt derived from this dirt will be unhealthy and rotten yes it is because the very elements are unhealthy says alexey petrovitch it will not be hard for us to find the cause of this unhealthiness 
that is of this fantastic rottenness says alexey petrovitch yes the rottenness of these elements if you will notice the situation of this field you see the water has no ditch and there it becomes stagnant and rotten yes absence of motion is absence of labour says alexey petrovitch because labour is shown in anthropological analysis to be the radical form of motion and which gives foundation and material for all other forms recreation rest amusement gaiety all these without the preliminary labour have no reality and without motion there is no life that is there is no reality therefore this dirt is fantastic in other words rotten till within a short time ago men did not know how to restore health to such fields but now means has been found that is drainage the superfluous water runs off in canals and enough remains and it is kept in motion and the field becomes practicable but as long as this means is not applied the dirt remains fantastic that is to say rotten and it cannot produce any good crops whereas as is very natural from the good dirt they get good crops because it is healthy dirt and this is what we wanted to prove quod erat demonstrandum as they say in latin as they spoke in latin the words meaning which was to be proven vira pavlovna did not catch the words and you alexey petrovitch have a desire to amuse yourself with hog latin and syllogism says her milenki that is her husband vira pavlovna here seemed to join them and say now do stop talking about your analyses identities and anthropologisms please talk about something gentlemen so that i may take part in your conversation or rather let us play yes let us play said alexey petrovitch let us play confession come on come on it'll be very gay said vira pavlovna you suggested the game now you must show us how to do it with pleasure my sister says alexey petrovitch but how old are you my dear sister eighteen i shall soon be nineteen but you are not yet therefore let us suppose that you are eighteen and we will all confess what we did till we were eighteen because we must have an equality of conditions i will confess for myself and my wife my father was a diacon in a governmental town and then he took up the business of bookbinding and my mother took seminarists to board from morning till night my father and mother were always worrying and talking about how to live father used to drink but only at times when intolerable want stared him in the face that was real grief or when his income was pretty good he used to give my mother all he had and say well matushka now thank god you will not suffer want for two months to come but i have left half a rouble in my pocket and i shall take a drink for very joy that was a real joy my mother used to get vexed very often sometimes she used to beat me but only when she had a pain in the small of the back as she herself used to say from lifting the boiler and kettles from washing all the clothes of five of us besides five seminarists and from washing the floors dirtied by our twenty feet which did not wear galoshes and from taking care of the cow it is a real strain upon the nerves to bear too much labour without rest and for all that the ends did not used to meet as she expressed it that is she was short of money for getting boots for some one of us brothers or shoes for the sisters then she used to beat us she used to pet us too when we stupid little children that we were expressed the desire to help her in her work or whenever we did anything clever or whenever she took a very rare moment of rest and her back did not ache as she used to say all that was a real joy ach don't tell us anything more about your real sorrows and joys says vira pavlovna if that is the case perhaps you would like to hear natasha's confession i do not want to hear it she too had the same kind of real sorrows and joys i am sure of it that's absolutely true but maybe you will be interested in hearing my confession says serge who suddenly appeared to be with them we will see says vira pavlovna my father and mother though they were rich yet they always worried and talked about money rich people too are not free from such kinds of worriment you don't know how to play confession serge said alexey petrovitch politely please tell me why they worried about money matters what expenses worried them what necessities put them into embarrassment yes i understand why you ask that said serge but let us drop this subject let us turn to the other view of their thoughts they too took care of their children 
but they always had enough to give their children didn't they asked alexey petrovitch of course but they had to look out that don't play confessions serge said alexey petrovitch we know your whole story care about superfluities thoughts about things not necessary have been the soil in which you grew up that is a fantastic soil just look at yourself you are naturally not at all a stupid man but a very good man maybe not worse and not more stupid than we are but what are you good for what is the use of your living i am good for escorting julie everywhere that she wants me to go i help julie to spend all the money she wants to spend replies serge from this we see says alexey petrovitch that a fantastic and unhealthy soil ah how tired i am of your realism and fantasticism i don't know what they mean by such terms and still they keep on using them says vira pavlovna wouldn't you like to talk with me asked marya alexyevna who also appeared suddenly you gentlemen get away from here for i want to talk with my daughter all disappear vierotchka finds herself alone with marya alexyevna marya alexyevna's face assumes a laughing expression vira pavlovna you are an educated woman you are so virtuous and high toned says marya alexyevna and her voice trembles with anger you are so kind how can i then who am rough and a drunkard talk with you vira pavlovna you have a bad and beastly mother but allow me to ask lady why your mother took all the bother she did for you it was about victuals this according to your idea is a genuine care peculiar to humanity isn't that so you have had scoldings you have seen bad deeds and meanness but allow me to ask what they were meant for was it for nothing was it all nonsense no lady no matter how things go in your family it was not an empty fantastic life you see vira pavlovna i have learned to speak as you do in scientific language but it may grieve you and shame you vira pavlovna that your mother is a bad and ill-tempered woman would you like vira pavlovna for me to become a good and honest woman i am an enchantress vira pavlovna i can bewitch things i can fulfil your wish just look vira pavlovna your wish is already being fulfilled i who am vixenish vanish look at this kind mother and her daughter a room on the door sill snores a drunken unshaven miserable man who it is cannot be told his face is half covered with his hand and the rest is discoloured and bruised a bed on the bed a woman yes it is marya alexyevna but how kind but how pale she is how feeble though she is only forty-five years old how exhausted by the bedside is a young girl of eighteen it is i myself yerochka but how ragged i seem what does this mean my complexion is so yellow and my features are so rough and what a miserable chamber scarcely any furniture yerochka my dear my angel says marya alexyevna just lie down and take a rest my treasure why do you watch with me i can attend to myself this is the third night that you have not slept never mind i am not tired says vierotchka i am not any better vierotchka how will you get along without me your father's pittance is as small as it can be and he himself is a poor support to you you are a pretty girl there are many bad people in this world there will be no one to watch over you i tremble for you vierotchka weeps my dear don't be grieved i am telling you this not to blame you but to warn you what made you leave home on friday the day before i fell sick vierotchka weeps he will deceive you vierotchka give him up no mamenka two months pass how is it that two months pass in one minute an army officer is sitting on the table before the officer is a bottle on the officer's knee is she vierotchka again two months more have passed in one minute a lady is sitting before the lady she vierotchka is standing can you iron dear i can to what class do you belong are you a serf or free my father was a chinovnik so you belong to the nobility my dear then i can't take you what kind of a servant would you make go away my dear i can't take you vierotchka is on the street mademoiselle oh mademoiselle says some young drunken fellow accosting her where are you going let me escort you Yeroshka runs to the neva well my dear have you seen all these things that my magic art has conjured up how do you like being with your kind mother asks the real marya alexyevna 
again appearing am i not a good enchantress hain't i hit it off well why don't you speak you have a tongue in your mouth hain't you i'll squeeze a word out of you it's so hard to make you speak have you been shopping yes says virotchka and she trembles have you seen have you heard what's going on yes do they live well them learned folks do they read books and think as you do about your new plan for folks getting along better do they tell me virotchka says nothing but she trembles eh there ain't nothing to be got out of you do they live well hear my question virotchka says nothing but she is in a cold sweat one can't get a word out of you do they live well i ask you are they good i ask you would you like to be like them you don't speak you turn away your fizz just listen virotchka to what i am going to say you are educated you are educated on money that i stole you are thinking about the good but if i had not been bad you would not have even known what good is do you understand you owe all to me you are my daughter do you understand i am your mother Yurochka weeps and trembles and is in a cold sweat mamenka what do you want of me i cannot love you do i ask you to love me i should like at least to respect you but i cannot do that either do i need your respect what do you want then mamenka why have you come to me and why do you speak so harshly to me what do you want of me be grateful you selfish girl do not love do not respect me i am a vixen why should you love me i am bad why should you respect me but you understand vierka that if i were not what i am you would not be what you are you are good because i am bad you are sweet-tempered because i am a vixen understand that vierka and be grateful leave me marya alexievna i want to speak with my sister marya alexievna vanishes the bride of her bridegrooms the sister of her sisters takes virotchka by the hand virotchka i always wanted to be kind to you because i am kind and i am just as the person is with whom i speak but now you are melancholy so you see i too am melancholy look do i make a good appearance being melancholy you look better than any one else in the world kiss me virotchka we both of us are sad and yet your mother spoke the truth i do not like your mother but i need her help can't you get along without her by and by i shall be able to get along without her when people will not need to be ill-tempered but now it is impossible you see kind people cannot get to their feet alone it is the ill-tempered who alone are strong they are keen but you see virotchka that there are different degrees of ill-temper some of them want everything in the world to go to the bad others who are just as ill-tempered want things to improve because it would be better for their interests you see it was necessary for your mother's plans to have you educated she took your money which you got by giving lessons because she wanted her daughter to capture a rich son-in-law for her and for that same reason she wanted you to be educated you see she had bad thoughts and yet they brought forth good for mankind haven't you been benefited but many bad people act otherwise if your mother had been anna petrovna would you have studied so as to become educated would you have learned what was good and loved it no you would not have been allowed to learn about the good you would have been made a doll isn't it so such a mother must have a doll in her daughter because she herself is a doll and she is always playing dolls with dolls but your mother was a bad woman yet she was a character it was necessary for her that you should not be a doll don't you see how the wicked vary others are hindering me because i want men to be men and not dolls they want men to be dolls and other bad people are helping me they do not consciously help me but they give ample chance for men to be men they gather the means for men to be men and this is all that i want yes virotchka now i cannot get along without such bad people since they work against the other kind of bad my bad people are bad but under their cruel hands the good is growing yes virotchka be grateful to your mother do not love her she is bad but you owe everything to her know that without her you would not have been and will it always be so or will it change no virotchka it will not always be so it will change by and by when the kind becomes strong i shall not need the ill-tempered and this will be soon virotchka then the bad will see that it is impossible for them to be bad and those ill-tempered who had any character will become kind 
They were ill-tempered only because it was contrary to their interest to be kind, because they know that goodness is better than badness. They will begin to love it when it will be possible for them to love it without injuring their interests and what will become of the bad who were dolls i feel sorry for them too they will play with other kinds of dolls only they will be harmless dolls but they will have children different from what they themselves are because i will make all men to be men and i shall teach their children not to be dolls but men ach how good that will be yes even now it is good because this good is in preparation at least those who helping to bring it about are already enjoying it when you vierotchka help your cook to get your dinner ready it may be suffocating in the kitchen but it is good for you what do you care for the gas and suffocating odors all enjoy sitting at dinner but more than all he who helps get it ready it tastes doubly sweet to him and you like to eat good things vierotchka don't you it is true says vierotchka and she smiles because she was caught in liking sweetmeats and in liking to prepare them in the kitchen then why are you melancholy you are not melancholy any more how kind you are and happy vierotchka i am always happy vierotchka even when i am melancholy yet i am happy is not that true yes but when i am melancholy you also come as though you were melancholy and you always drive away the blues i am happy with you very happy do you remember the little song donc vivant i do let us sing it all right vierotchka vierotchka have i waked you up however breakfast is ready i was frightened i heard you groaning i came in and you were singing in your sleep no my milenki you didn't wake me i should have waked myself but what a strange dream i had milenki i will tell you at tea leave me i want to get dressed and how did you dare to come into my room without permission dmitri sergeitch you forget yourself were you frightened about me my milenki come here and i will kiss you for it she kissed him now leave me leave me i want to get dressed oh let me stay i'll act as your dressing-maid nu no, i don't object only how shameful it is end of part three chapter three recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter four a of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter four a vera pavlovna's sewing union was established the foundations were very simple at first so simple indeed that it is not worth while to speak of them Vera pavlovna did not make any rules at all for her first three seamstresses except that she would pay them a trifle more than the regular seamstresses were getting at the shops there was nothing particularly strange about the business the seamstresses saw that Vera pavlovna was not a woman of mere words not fickle and therefore without any hesitation they accepted her offer to work with her there was no reason for hesitation in the fact that a woman of moderate means wanted to establish a sewing shop these three girls found three or four more they selected them with the same care with which vira pavlovna proposed to them and in these conditions of choice there was nothing worthy of suspicion that is there was nothing out of the ordinary run about it a young and modest woman wishes the working girls in her establishment to be girls of straightforward character kind considerate inclined to stay in one place is there anything strange about that she does not want any quarrels that's all and therefore it's clever of her and nothing more vira pavlovna made acquaintance with these chosen girls she became very well acquainted with them before she agreed to accept them that was natural it shows that she is a woman of sound common sense and that's all there is nothing to deliberate about there is nothing to distrust thus they worked a month receiving in due time the wages which had been agreed upon vira pavlovna was constantly at the shop and they learned to look upon her as an economical careful and reasonable woman with unusual consideration for them and thus she won their full confidence there was nothing extraordinary about that either nor was anything noticeable except that the mistress was a good mistress 
in whose hands the business would succeed. She knows how to manage. But at the end of a month, Vera Pavlovna came into the shop one day with some kind of an account book. She asked her seamstresses to stop work and listen to what she had to say. She began to speak in very simple language, things which were comprehensible, very comprehensible, but which her seamstresses had never heard before, either from her or from anybody else. Now that we know each other well, she began, I can say of you that you are good workers and good girls, and you will not say that I am a fool. Consequently, I can speak with you frankly about my ideas. If you should find anything strange in them, you will think carefully about them, and not insist that my ideas are foolish because you know that i am not a foolish woman this is the plan that i propose good people say that it is possible to establish sewing shops where seamstresses might work to much greater profit to themselves than in those shops that we know about and so i wanted to make an experiment judging by the first month it appears that it can be done you have been receiving your wages regularly and now i want to tell you how much over and above your wages and all other expenses remain in my hands as clear profit yera pavlovna read over to them the debit and credit account for the month in the expense account were reckoned besides the wages paid all other expenses the rent of the shop light even down to vira pavlovna's charges for an izvachik which she hired in the interest of the shop and cost about a rouble you see she continued there remains in my hands so much money now what am i going to do with it i have established this sewing shop with the express purpose of letting the profits go to the very seamstresses by whose work it was earned therefore i am going to divide it among you this first time all of you will get an equal share each one of you her own by and by we can see whether we cannot manage it better or whether there isn't some other way that will not be still more profitable for you she divided the money for some time the seamstresses could not believe their senses so great was their surprise then they began to pour out their thanks vira pavlovna gave them sufficient time to express their gratitude for the division of the money so that she might not hurt their feelings by refusing to listen for that would have looked like indifference to their opinions and inclinations then she continued now i must explain to you the hardest question of all it will be sure to arise and i do not know as i shall be able to make it plain to you yet i must speak about it why didn't i keep the money and what was my design in establishing the shop if i did not intend to profit from the advantage arising from it i live with my husband as you know and have a sufficiency we are not rich but we have all that we need if i am in need of anything all i have to do would be to ask my husband for it and i should not even have to ask him for he would see that i was in want of more money and i should have it he does not spend his time now in doing those things which bring him in most money but in those things which he likes best and as we love each other dearly it pleases him most of all to do those things which i like and it is the same with me therefore if i should be short of money he would undertake some business which would be more profitable than his present occupation and he is able to find such a business because he is a clever and an able man but you have some idea of him and the fact that he does not do so is proof positive that the money which we both have is enough for us both this is because i have no great hankering after money for you know that different people have different desires and not all care for money some hanker after balls some after fine dresses or cards and all such people are ready to ruin themselves for the sake of their passion and a good many do ruin themselves and no one is surprised that their passion is dearer to them than money and my hobby happens to be this thing which i am trying to arrange with you and i not only do not ruin myself for the sake of my hobby but i do not even spend any money on it and i am only too glad to give up some of my time to it and do not take any of the profit for myself well now according to my idea there is nothing strange about this for who expects to make any money out of his pet hobby everybody else even goes to expense for the sake of gratifying it but i do not do that i do not put any money out consequently the advantage lies on my side compared with others for i ride my hobby and get pleasure out of it without any loss to myself whereas others have to spend money for their pleasures and why is it that i have this hobby this is the reason 
Kind and clever people have written many books about the way men should get along in this world, how all should have the chance to enjoy life, and our principal way, they say, consists in starting shops according to a new system. And so I want to see for myself whether we shall be able to start such a system as is needed. It is just the same as when one man wants to build a fine house, another to plant a splendid garden or orangery so as to get pleasure out of them so do i want to start a fine sewing shop so that i may have pleasure in it of course it would have been satisfactory enough if i were to divide the profits among you every month as i have just done but clever people say that there is still a better way of doing it so that there should be more profits and the profits themselves should be used to much better advantage they say that this can be very easily done now we shall see i shall tell you by degrees what can be done according to the ideas of clever people and if you yourselves will take notice as you look on and anything which promises well suggests itself to you we can try to do it little by little according to circumstances but i must confess to you that without your aid i cannot take this new step nothing new shall be tried without your approval clever men say that only what people themselves want to do turns out well and i think so too consequently you need not fear any new departures for everything will go on in the old way unless you yourselves want to make a change without your own wish nothing can be done and now this is my last order as mistress of the shop without your advice you see that accounts must be kept and care must be taken that there are no unnecessary expenses last month i managed the business myself but henceforth i do not want to take charge of it select two of your number to act in concert with me i will not do anything without them it is your money and not mine therefore you must look after it as yet the thing is an experiment it has not yet been shown who among you is most capable of managing it so for the time being those who are selected must serve for only a short term and in a week you will find out whether it will be necessary to select others or leave the former in their places long discussions were awakened by these unusual words but vira pavlovna had already gained their confidence and she spoke so simply not going too far in advance and conjuring up any extraordinary prospects which after a moment's enthusiasm would fade away into distrust that the girls did not look upon her as a lunatic and that was all that was required that she should not be regarded as a lunatic the experiment progressed slowly of course it progressed slowly here is a short history of the shop for the first three years during which it played the principal part in the life of vira pavlovna herself the girls who at first made up the personnel of the new shop were carefully selected they were good seamstresses they were directly interested in the success of the scheme therefore it was natural that the work went on successfully the shop never lost any of its customers who once entrusted it with orders there was some envy manifested on the part of several shops and factories but it did not produce the least effect except to oblige vera pavlovna to take out a license to display a sign so that there may not be any chicanery soon more orders began to come in than the girls who at first made up the union were able to fill and thus they were obliged gradually to increase their numbers at the end of a year and a half there were twenty girls in the union and after that still more one of the first results of giving a decisive voice to the entire shop in the management of its business was a decision which might have been expected in the very first month of their regime the girls decided that it would not do for vira pavlovna to work without pay when they announced this decision to her she said that they were right they wanted to give her the third part of the profits she laid it aside for some time before she ventured to explain to them that it was diametrically opposed to the fundamental idea of their scheme for some time they could not understand this then afterwards they came to the conclusion that vira pavlovna refused a special share of the profits not from self-conceit but from the nature of the experiment itself by this time the shop had expanded to such dimensions that vira pavlovna by herself was not able to attend to all the cutting and so she had to get an assistant they gave vira pavlovna the same wages as the other cutter the money which she had been laying aside was now by her request taken back into the common fund with the exception of what was due her for her work as cutter the balance was employed in the establishment of a bank 
for about a year vi6ra pavlovna spent the larger part of each day at the shop and really worked as hard as any one else according to the schedule of hours when she saw the possibility of spending less time in the shop than a whole day her wages were reduced in proportion how should the profits be divided vi6ra pavlovna wanted to bring it about that the profits should be divided equally among them all they consented to this only towards the middle of the third year before that time they tried several different schemes at first they divided the profits proportionally according to the wages earned by each then they came to the conclusion that if a girl missed work for a few days on account of illness or any other important reason it would not be fair to reduce her share of the division money which properly speaking had not been gained during those few days but by the general course of the work and the general state of the shop then they went a step further and agreed that the cutters and other girls who received extra wages by delivering orders and other duties were already sufficiently paid by their extra wages and that therefore it would be unfair for them to get proportionally more than the others also in their share of the profits the ordinary seamstresses who had no extra duties were so modest that they did not ask for any charge although they saw the injustice of the other arrangement which was due to their own vote the others who had this extra compensation felt the awkwardness of availing themselves of the extra division and when they once came into the spirit of the scheme they entirely refused it it is necessary however to remark that this temporary modesty the patience of the ones and the refusal of the others was not a remarkable step taking into the consideration the constant improvement in the affairs of both sides the most difficult task of all was to develop the idea that the ordinary seamstresses were all entitled to an equal share in the profits notwithstanding the fact that some of them were earning more wages than others that seamstresses who were working more successfully than others were already sufficiently compensated for the success of their work by getting better wages the last change in the way of dividing the profits was accomplished in the middle of the third year after the shop girls understood that the receiving of the profits was not the reward for the art of one or two of their number but the result of the general character of the shop the result of its arrangement its aim and this aim meant equality so far as was possible in the profits for all participating in the work without regard to their personal peculiarities that upon this character of the union depended the participation of the workers in the profits but the character of the union its spirit its arrangement consisted in the participation of all and for this participation of all every member was a necessary factor the silent acquiescence of the most hesitating and of the least gifted is no less beneficial for the preservation and development of the scheme no less profitable for all of them and for the success of the whole enterprise than the active zeal of the most lively and gifted i omit a good many details because i am not describing the workshop but i simply enter into it with sufficient fullness to illustrate vi'ra pavlovna's activity if i mention some details it is only because i wanted to show how vi'ra pavlovna acted how she conducted the business step by step patiently and tirelessly and how firmly she kept up to her rule not to show her hand as mistress but to explain to advise to plan to offer her assistance to bring to a successful issue the decision of her cooperatives end of part three chapter four a recording by expatriate in bangor maine